Chapter 13 Ethan Is it ready, Delmare? Delmare sat on the floor of an abandoned classroom off the fourth wing of the university. She stirred a cauldron slowly, focusing with intent concentration. Stefan leaned against the wall behind her, while Emma and I stood overhead. Sunlight from dawn was breaking through the windows. It was incredibly early, as shown by the shadows on all our faces. Almost, Delmare said. She took a ladle and poured a small amount of the brew into a jar. I hope we got this one right. I hoped so, too. This was our only shot. There were no backup plans. Gabby and Elijah's trials of competency were today, and if they didn't fail, they'd be coronated by May. We were here to make sure that didn't happen. We had two separate plans, one for Gabby and one for Elijah, but both needed to work if we were going to stop them. Emma frowned as she watched Delmare stir the pot. Are you sure this potion is going to work? Delmare knitted her eyebrows together. I'm no alchemist like Kiara, but I'm sure this one is right. I resisted giving a scoff. The potion of extreme confusion Delmare was brewing took nearly a month to brew. Delmare had screwed up the potion twice and had to start over. She had to get it correct this time. Delmare shook the glass in her hand. Okay, so who wants to try? I'll do it, Stefan said. He took the potion from Delmare and drank it. He made a face before he said, I don't feel any different. My heart fell until Emma asked him a question. Stefan, what's the capital of Malovia? Stefan looked at her blankly. His jaw dropped open as he mused until he blurted out, Uh, Paris? Emma and Delmare had wide grins, while I gave a sigh of relief. It looked like the potion worked. How do you feel? Delmare asked. Her tone was concerned. I was sure she worried about poisoning him. Stefan smacked at his head. I mean, I don't feel any different, but if you ask me a question, I don't know the answer. Or where I am, honestly. What faction are you in? I asked. Stefan glanced at me, then to the floor. Um, Alicorn? This was perfect. Gabby would have no idea what she was talking about when the circle questioned her. She'd look insane. Delmare filled up the jar with the rest of the potion, then screwed on the lid. She shook the concoction and said, How are we going to get this down the bitch's throat? Gabby has a protein shake every morning before practice, Emma said. I'm sure it tastes just as nasty as that potion. I can slip it in at the rink. Stefan blinked twice. He staggered around before he stared at Delmare. Uh, I know who you guys are and where I am, but everything else just seems a blur. Delmare gave an amused smile. She stood up and took Stefan by the arm. I'd better get this lug back to his dorm, she said. You guys got it handled? As much as we can, I said. Hopefully this works. Emma and I hurried off. There wasn't much time to waste. As Prince... I was allowed to sit on the competency meetings, and I wanted to be there to watch Elijah mess up. We ran into two familiar figures in the hallway, Theo and Odette. I was shocked to see them. After all, as far as I knew, Odette was still angry with Emma. But she didn't seem so angry now. Odette played with her hands and said, We promised to help you guys, she started. We just need to know what to do. You don't have to, Odette, Emma said kindly. Her tone was gentle and genuine. She was really concerned about Odette's health. Look, Em, I know you've been worried about me lately, and I'm sorry I've been so mean, Odette said, but thank you for standing up for me the other day. Emma looked momentarily surprised. I just don't want you to get hurt. I'll be okay, Odette gave a grimace. Theo's eyes were hollow behind her, but Emma's expression blossomed with a bit of hope. Maybe there was a light at the end of the tunnel for Odette. We swore an oath we would help you get Elijah and Gabby off the throne, Theo said. What do you need us to do? Emma and I glanced at each other. She spoke first. There are some members of the circle who influence others, mostly with fear. If they weren't there, the other lords and ladies might have a chance of speaking their minds. She was thinking what I was thinking. Elijah's parents sat on the council, 
and they'd do anything to cover for their son or intimidate the other lords and ladies to be sure they voted in favor of his coronation. It'd be better if they weren't there at all. Can you make sure Lords Lodia and Lady Corva don't make it to the trials? I asked. How? Odette asked. Theo rubbed his chin. I know an annoying illusion spell for houses. It locks any door you try to leave through. No one can get in or out. It's easy to break, but only if you know what door the spell was cast on in the first place, and the Zlodia mansion has hundreds. It'll take them all day to figure out which door was the one that was cursed. If Odette and I can keep it going long enough, they'll never make it to the meeting. You'd have our fullest gratitude, I told him. Then we better hurry, Odette squeaked. Theo changed into an alicorn, and Odette climbed onto his back. They galloped off. Emma tucked the potion jar into her coat. I have to get going. Don't want to leave any loose ends. Stay safe, Ona Wilke. I leaned in to kiss her. A thrill went through me as she put a hand up to stroke my hair, and she gave a wink as she darted away. She'd told me she loved me. Ever since, I'd felt like the most powerful man on earth. I could do anything with Emma by my side with her love urging me onward. As endearing as it was, it was also a problem. She was that much closer to finding out about the Phantom. I couldn't think about that now. My full attention needed to be on the task. I headed to the royal palace to get ready for the trials. As I fastened my blue hussar's jacket with the confines of my room, I felt a lump forming in my throat, and my fingers fiddled with the golden buttons. This was it. We had to succeed, and get the circle to refuse Elijah the throne. It was a long shot. I didn't know anyone who'd ever failed the trials of competency. But there was no other choice. They had to. Otherwise, I'd have to result to more violent methods. And that wasn't something I was willing to do. Not yet. I passed time by pacing around my room and throwing glances out the window to see if I could spot Emma. I caught a glimpse of her red mane just as I'd worn a hole in the floor for my worry. Emma met me in the palace gardens around eight o'clock, in the same place we'd discovered the windfarers. As my mate, she had full run of the royal grounds, but the guards usually scowled at her whenever she slipped in. They still considered her a cheat from the contest. I scouted the area to make sure we were alone before we came together to talk. Done, Emma said breathlessly. She drank it without thinking twice. Perfect. Did you notice any change? Emma shook her head. No, but I'm sure it'll take effect soon. Good. I brushed off my suit. How was practice? I was terrible. Too nervous, Emma scowled. I hope I wasn't too obvious. She sighed. I wish I could come with you. All you can do now is pray on a Wilke. I clapped her on the shoulder. I hope the gods are on our side. Emma paled. But Droga is on theirs. The dark god can't defeat us. Not unless we choose to accept our fate, I told her. And we aren't going down without a fight. Trumpets sounded behind me, signaling the arrival of Gabby and Elijah. I squeezed Emma's hands. I have to go. Stay vigilant. Emma nodded. She backed away to return to campus as I strode toward the palace. The competency trials were to take place in the royal throne room amongst the congregation of the circle. I entered the massive space. A long red rug ran along a marble floor to steps that went upward to host two large wooden thrones, backs carved with the designs of fays and shifters. Banners hung from the ceilings, portraying the faction symbols of previous kings. My footsteps echoed as sunlight shone through the stained glass windows lining the gargantuan walls. Gabby and Elijah stood at the head of the room, near the thrones, while several circle members sat in chairs that were aligned in an arc around them. I headed toward the chair on the end, away from the circle. Elijah sneered the moment he saw me. What are you doing here? he seethed. You shouldn't have been allowed in. Prince Ethan has the right to be here, despite his crimes in the contest, Lord Lucian said fairly. His royal blood gives him the benefit. Elijah wrinkled his nose, but didn't say anything more. With pleasure, I saw that Lord Zlodia and Lady Corva hadn't made it. Steward Solomon looked around uneasily. Where are Lord Zlodia and Lady Corva? 
It is past the time to begin. We cannot start without them, Lady Iris said, but not many shared her sentiment. I noticed many members of the circle relaxed as they heard the two were missing, while others even let out sighs of relief. So Zlodia and Corva did have a strong hand on this council. Very unfortunate. Lady Magdalena sniffed. She despised when her time was wasted. I have other things to do. The university requires my presence. We simply can't wait all day. We will give it time, Stuart Solomon said, but we will not wait forever. Time passed. The circle conversed while Lady Magdalena stewed and complained that it was rude to be late. I anxiously counted the seconds, hoping Odette and Theo were holding Lady Corva and Lord Zlodia off. Elijah visibly sweated from his place at the front, but Gabby remained cool. She sent an icy stare at me, which I returned dispassionately. We waited for half an hour, but they never showed. Steward Solomon waved his hand. Lock the doors. We can't wait for them any longer. The guards moved, and Elijah paled. It was nice to see he didn't think he could do this without his parents. Gabby, I noticed, didn't appear phased at all. Steward Solomon turned to me. As is tradition, there is an amulet that has been passed down from king to king throughout the centuries, beginning with the trials of competency. King Lycus had such a thing in his possession, and, as is his right, it now belongs to Elijah. Do you have the amulet on you, Prince Ethan? I swallowed down a bitter twinge of hatred and nodded. I got up from my seat and took from my pocket a silver amulet that circled a blue sapphire. It matched the one in Emma's sword and hung from a thick chain. Elijah's eyes glittered greedily when he saw it. Little did he know it was a fake. The real amulet was tucked away in a drawer, somewhere upstairs in my room. My father had been wearing it the day he died, and no way was I giving it up. I'd spent the entire semester sneaking to the forge to create a replica. It'd taken a heavy chunk out of my royal savings to find a near-identical sapphire, but I'd done it and set the stone in place. It was a blasphemous crime to do such a thing, but I prayed the gods forgave me for it. The most crucial thing about the amulet was the enchantment I'd put on it. It wasn't exactly a truth spell, as Elijah wouldn't be forced to spill everything, but more or less an enchantment of honesty. The illusion wouldn't last forever, but it'd hold up until the end of the trials. The object would make Elijah state his true intentions to the circle. His dastardly, sick plans would be exposed, and the circle would think him a maniacal dictator. They'd refuse to give him the crown, and the monarchy would be safe. I'd heard him spouting his awful ideas to everyone at lunch for weeks now. Once the circle became aware of such things, they'd deny him the throne. He couldn't lie his way out of this one and butter up the circle to slip him through. I handed Elijah the amulet, and he hung it around his neck. As I sat down again, Elijah took Gabby's hand in his, and the smile they gave each other made my insides quiver. These two made even love seem wrong. Elijah's Lodia, we'll start with you, Stuart Solomon began. He removed his glasses and leaned forward. You risked your life to enter the king's contest. But the circle doesn't allow anyone to sit on the throne. We establish rulers. Why should the Arcania follow you into a new future? Why did you put your life on the line in order to become king? Elijah drew himself up. The Arcania have always based their society on strength, Elijah said. Fay used to determine who deserved to survive by sorting out those who were valuable to our society and left behind those who were not. Whatever do you mean by that? Lady Iris asked. She cocked an eyebrow and leaned forward. Elijah cleared his throat. My lady, if I may, we used to be a strong country, but we aren't anymore. We've allowed our family values to erode and sensitivity to become the rule of law rather than righteousness. Malovia has transformed into a country that cares more about people's feelings than doing what is right. 
Emotions do not negate the truth. It is time the people saw that. And what is the truth? Lord Morgaine rumbled. His tone was curious as he observed Elijah. Elijah smiled. That the Fae are the supreme heads of the supernatural world, and we deserve to rule over it. I expected shocked gasps to run throughout the circle, but there were none. There were a few thoughtful humphs, and saw a couple nods. Horror began slithering over my skin, curling around my guts to squeeze me tight. The amulet was working. Elijah was telling nothing but the truth, but though his words should have shocked the circle, they weren't. He was gaining favor. Lady Magdalena, thank the gods for her, scoffed. How ridiculous! Are we seriously considering these asinine ideas? Let him speak, Lord Radcliffe said. Unlike his wife, Lady Iris, he seemed intrigued by the words Elijah spoke. Why shouldn't we be the head supernatural race? Elijah asked. We can create whatever we want, with illusions that can become whatever we come up with. If we've been given this magic by the gods, this kind of favor, wouldn't it be a sin not to use it? You can't use some divine interpretation to spur us onward toward another conflict, Lady Magdalena said. Millions of fae died during the great supernatural war. Our nation was forever changed. Are you willing to risk such a thing again? To restore our name? Absolutely. The other supernatural races humiliated us when we lost the great supernatural war. We haven't earned back our honor since, and it is time we did so. Give me twenty years as king, and the Fae shall rule the world, Elijah said. And how do you plan to fund this war? Lady Iris crossed her arms. Wars take money, and the royal treasury is not open for pillaging. We have all the funds available. We merely have to allocate, Elijah insisted. Malovia spends millions every year on our social programs, our sick, our elderly... These are all people who do not contribute to our society. If we cut these programs, limited health care, and abolished our nation's retirement fund for seniors, we'd have more than enough to build our army back up to the strength it once was. We will be so formidable, the other supernatural races won't dare to stand up against us. Not to mention, we'll finally be able to eliminate those bastard witches and warlocks in the West." A few notes of approval rang throughout the circle. The thought of wiping out the Miriamic coven, our greatest rivals, was a tantalizing treat for the circle to savor. But in exchange for what? Killing off anyone over sixty? Anyone who couldn't physically work or anyone who needed help? He was talking about taking away health care for people like Emma, for the gods' sake. You're suggesting we leave all these people to rot? Lady Magdalena burst, echoing my thoughts. How can we respect our elders if we leave them to die after they can no longer work? How can we call ourselves civilized people if we don't tend to those who need us the most? Their sacrifice would be worth it, for the good of Malovia. Those unable to contribute to our society should be glad to sacrifice their lives in the name of our country. Grandparents should be willing to die in order to bring greatness to our name, to provide a better life for our children, Elijah rebuked. Anyone who refuses to give up their life in service to Malovia is not a true Malovian and doesn't deserve our mercy. This cause is greater than any one, Fay. Hear, hear, Lord Morgaine cried. I nearly threw up, but was able to keep the bile in my throat. The Fay survive on community, young master. No shifter or sorceress is an island, Lord Lucian said lowly. I was glad he'd spoken up. He'd been silent most of this time, but now was making a stand. And that's our greatest flaw. People should fend for themselves, Elijah argued. Those who are willing to work hard will become successful and see riches. Those who don't will get what they deserve. Being poor and underprivileged is a sign of laziness, and we can't have their kind weighing down the fay any longer. They were the reason we lost the war in the first place. More like the rich are those who are privileged enough to be born into their station and keep the poor under their boots, 
I growled. Elijah sneered, and Steward Solomon said, Prince Ethan, though you are allowed to sit in on this meeting, you are not permitted to make commentary or ask any questions. Another word, and you will be thrown out. Lord Tremaine was stroking his beard. He was one of the few who still appeared on the fence. That is all very well, but what about the home front? Things can't be allowed to decay here. I agree, Elijah replied. Industry should thrive. I suggest lowering the taxes on corporations so funds can trickle downward, and the middle class of Malovia can carry the honor of funding our great nation. Of course, high-ranking government officials would also receive large yearly bonuses and favorable retirement funds in thanks for their service. This would include lords and ladies of the circle. Lord Tremaine's eyes sparked. He was one of the council members who had several big businesses packed around the city. He didn't care how many died, so long as he got a tax break and was paid off by Elijah every year. Lady Magdalena rubbed her eyes tiredly. Your dismal ideas are truly archaic. There is nothing archaic about it, my lady, Elijah said coolly. This was the way the Fae once were, and we've wandered away from our roots. Only our best and brightest should receive the opportunity to be educated and be employed. There is only so much to go around, and shouldn't the spoils of success go to people who deserve them, who've earned them? The law of nature demands we reward those who are strong enough to survive. Excuse me, young master, but this kind of thinking led to the destruction of the unseelie fay years ago. It wiped out an entire culture, Lord Lucian said. I could hear the thin note of anger buried beneath his words. His hands shook. And isn't the world much better now that they aren't around? Elijah said. The circle murmured in agreement. Steward Solomon raised his hands, and the circle fell silent. I think we've heard quite enough from you, young master, he said. You are clearly of sound mind and competent enough to rule the country. My mouth fell open in shock. Was he fucking kidding me? Elijah was nuts. He just spewed his sick ideology for all to hear, except instead of being rejected, he was being hailed as some kind of hero. I was hoping Stuart Solomon would see through Elijah's bullshit, but he was too apathetic. The large retirement fund Elijah promised was enough to keep him quiet. I despised him for it. Stuart Solomon, passive fool that he was, called the vote. Everyone, save for Lady Magdalena, Lady Iris, and Lord Lucian voted in favor of Elijah. My stomach fell into a bottomless pit. Lords Lodi and Lady Corva didn't even need to be here to pressure the circle into voting his son in. They were doing it all on their own. Well, I think it's safe to say the council finds you fit to rule, Steward Solomon said with a nod to Elijah. Now we will question your mate. The council turned to Gabby. My insides churned with fear. The confusion potion was our only chance. The council had to approve both of them to put Elijah on the throne. If Gabby failed, Elijah wouldn't pass. Miss C.R., if you please, can you elaborate on your mate's ideas? Solomon asked. I leaned forward on the edge of my seat. This has to work. Gabby shook her hair behind her shoulder. As is a sorceress's duty... I stand by my mate. However, I would like to add some concepts of my own. Gabby had answered the question precisely. No confusion showed on her face or in her words. What the hell? The potion wasn't working on her. No, that couldn't be right. The potion had worked on Stefan. We knew it was viable. So why wasn't it working its magic on Gabby? Can you elaborate? Lady Iris asked. Gabby smiled. I wish to bring Malovia into a new world by taking down our border wall and letting our monsters roam free. This was the first time the circle seemed shocked by anything either of them had said. Lord Tremaine gaped as he said, 
Dear girl, why would you want to do a thing like that? Gabby took a deep breath. Why shouldn't we? We live in fear of humans, but is there a real need? Yes, they outnumber us. But though they have technology, we have magic. If Elijah is able to unite the supernatural races under one banner, we can come together and unveil ourselves to the humans. Aren't we tired of hiding? Aren't we tired of running from the inevitable? Faye used to have dealings with humans for centuries, until the other supernatural races prevented us from having any contact with them. If we let our monsters roam free, the humans will be terrified of us. Then they will get in line and learn their place. Humans are a lower life form. Their purpose in life, as deemed by the gods, is to serve us. The potion wasn't working, but her position was an unpopular one. Revealing ourselves to the humans was risky, even for the bravest among us. Lord Radcliffe's voice was nervous as he said, This is quite a radical idea. Are you sure this is the point you want to make your case on? I have to, Lord Tremaine. I have to make a stand for the good of my country and the good of the world, Gabby crooned with all the virtuous pleading of a martyr. All life is connected in a web, and each of us is responsible for every strand. Humans are destroying the earth and driving it to extinction. Before too long, there won't be anything left. It is the job of the supernatural community to protect the earth and use our magic to defend it. If we continue to let the humans ravage without consequences, there will be nothing remaining for our descendants. Humans must learn there are penalties for their actions, and if they're going to, we must police them. They won't understand unless a higher power comes in to teach them, and Lord Tremaine, the gods have deemed that higher power is us. Gabby's case was tough to argue. I got that humans were destroying everything, and agreed we had to do something about it, but enslaving them all wasn't the way to handle the situation. But that didn't appear to be the view of the council. Lord Morgane grunted with approval. Now this sounds like a cause I can get behind. Please tell us more. Slow, impending dread grew over me as Gabby answered the questions with clarity, speaking her case by insisting that humans were expendable and Fay, our own, had to come first. Lady Magdalena objected several times, and Lord Lucian spoke up, but they were ignored. Lady Iris, who had all but given up hope, sat there quietly and watched Gabby rant with a stony expression. Gabby's eyes grew dark and malevolent as she voiced all the ways Faye deserved to be lording over the humans. Elijah watched her proudly, but honestly, I considered him an idiot standing next to her. There was stuff she was planning she hadn't even told him. I was sure of it. The vote was called. Gabby was approved by the council, and Elijah and Gabby passed their trials of competency. Misery welled over my spirit and drowned out its light. We had tried to stop them. And yet, we'd horribly failed. And now, Malovia wasn't the only country at risk from their madness. It was the entire world. Emma, Delmare, Stefan, Theo, and Odette were waiting for me in the abandoned classroom. Their faces fell when they saw my darkened expression. Emma's mouth dropped open, and the look in her eyes was enough to break my heart. They passed, I announced. The circle voted them in. They'll be crowned before the semester is out. Odette gasped. She flung herself onto Theo, and he held her. Emma stared at the ground. Delmare observed me in disbelief. But, but you enchanted the amulet, Stefan said. Eli had to tell the truth about what he was planning. He did speak his mind, and the circle loved every word he had to say. I summarized the meeting and spoke as much as I remembered from Elijah and Gabby's speeches. The expressions of my friends grew more horrified with every sentence. Emma was close to hyperventilating. I knew she was worried about losing her health care, but didn't want to talk about it in front of the others, as they didn't know she was sick yet. I heard her voice in my head as she said, I'm fucked without my medicine. I need it to survive. If Eli takes it away, I'll die. I sent a telepathic message back to her. You're going to be fine, Emma. I'm still Prince Regent. I'll take care of you no matter what happens. 
If I had to, I'd pay outright for her medicine. My treasury funds and vast inheritance wasn't going anywhere. My bastard cousin couldn't touch those. But what about all the other disabled people in Malovia? The ones who aren't lucky enough to be mated to a prince? Emma replied. I couldn't reply, because the answer would be they'd have to die. Dude, they can't just kill off all the old people, Stefan objected. Or enslave the humans. He can't do that. No way he can do that, right? Odette questioned. He can do anything he wants, I sighed. So long as he's king and the circle obliges his orders, which it looks like they will. My amulet plan was a ridiculous idea. I'd been foolish enough to assume the circle had good hearts and wanted what was best for the people of Malovia and not themselves. What a stupid bastard I was. But the potion, Delmare stammered. She was in disbelief as she turned to Emma. Are you sure she drank the potion? Emma nodded. I didn't take my gaze off it once I snuck it into her bottle. She drank the whole thing. I watched her with my own eyes. Delmare's eyes watered, and her hands shook. Damn it! She threw a glass potion vial. It shattered against the floor, and she put her head in her hands as she turned away from us. Irina, Stefan said gently. The tone was so heartfelt it bothered me. I knew it wouldn't work, Delmare said. I'm a shit sorceress. Hey, that tiny sip knocked me on my ass, babe, and I'm a lot bigger than Gabby is, Stefan said as he rubbed her back. It should have thrown her for a loop. But it didn't, Delmare snapped. It did nothing. She didn't turn into Stefan, but she didn't shy away from his touch either. Stefan's concerned gaze remained on her. It wasn't your fault, Delmare. Gabby is obviously messing with things she shouldn't be. I raged as I paced around the room. I threw my hands up in an obvious bout of frustration. She did incredible things in the King's Contest. She performs advanced magic in class. She can put an illusion on hundreds of people. Hell, she levitated a tree last semester. No, it wasn't the potion. She's pulling power from a source that's not her own. That's why she was able to overpower the effects of the potion. Delmare's eyes cleared and Stefan stood straight. Emma raised an eyebrow. Do you think she might have an unseelie necklace, like I used in the contest? She couldn't use it unless she has unseelie blood, though, Odette said. She just might, Theo said. Just how much do we know about her, anyway? I bet she's got night court blood in her. I don't know what she is or what she's using to get so powerful, Emma said. My knuckles crackled as my hands became fists and I added, Neither do I. But we need to find out. Chapter 14 Emma While Ethan was at the competency trials, I'd gone to the cathedral and prayed to the goddess Milana to stop Gabby and Elijah from being successful. For whatever reason, my prayers had been ignored. Gabby and Elijah had freaking passed and their coronation was being planned at this very moment. Did the gods want them on the throne? Why? Was their bloodthirst and desire for battle so great they wanted the Arcania to slaughter and enslave all the other races? I knew the gods liked honor and glory, but was starting another brutal war worth it? I didn't understand. Milana felt so far away from me, and I didn't know how to please her or earn her favor. I was supposed to be her champion, but I felt like I was doing a terrible job. On March 20th, I met Kiara at 10 a.m. for our Protection Against Dark Magic course. The classroom was circular, with stone floors and walls, the desks set up in an oval beneath tiny windows. Professor Mara taught this class. Her glittering blue robe sparkled like starlight as I took a seat next to Kiara. How are you doing? Kiara asked. I shrugged. Okay, I guess. Ethan's been down all week. And it'd been a hell of a time pulling him out of it. I was quickly learning when Ethan was in a bad mood, it was best to give him space. And no one quite got under his skin like Elijah. Kiara frowned. I'm sorry I couldn't help you guys. I wish I could. It's fine. I stopped myself from being resentful. We needed Kiara, but it was too late. 
Gabby and Elijah had passed their trials, which meant they'd be king and queen by the time the semester was over. Unless the Phantom did something crazy to stop them, which was exactly what I was worried about. Pay attention, everyone, Professor Mara said. Today we will be learning the difference between white magic and dark magic. She strode in front of a rolling chalkboard. As she did so, drawings began to emerge, the shapes of wands and crystals. As we all know, illusion magic is intention, Mara said. The emotion with which you cast a spell means everything. And while Seely magic is typically cast using the best of intentions, Unseely magic is not. Now, though most Seely Fae struggle with casting dark magic at all, each of us are still capable of harnessing the magic of our extinct cousins, to a point. Professor Mara wrapped her knuckles on the board. If a Seely Fae tries to perform advanced dark magic, they will die. This is because dark magic is not a quality that our bodies naturally possess, unlike Unseely Fae. White magic harms none, while black magic is done for evil or selfish intent. Kiara frowned, but she didn't speak up. Professor Mara continued her lecture. Now, the witches and warlocks of the Miriamic Coven in the West primarily harness black magic for their powers and obtain their magic from demonic sources. That's not true, Kiara whispered under her breath, but only loud enough for me to hear her. Around us, other people were nodding introspectively. Witches use wands or crystals for purposes of storing their magic. Arcania have no desire for these kinds of items, as we consider them objects of demonic lore, Professor Mara said. Mara rattled on and on. With each word, Kiara seemed to get only more pissed. I knew her. She wouldn't speak up. She was too shy. But I wasn't like that, and I was tired of watching her squirm, so I raised my hand for her. Is it possible that unseely magic can be used for, I don't know, good? Several gasps rang throughout the classroom. Professor Mara lifted an eyebrow and said, Now why would you ask a question like that, Miss Sosna? I don't know, I replied. I was just wondering. Mara's gaze rattled me. Fey magic was once seen as neither good nor bad, but that is no longer the case. Unseely magic is dangerous, especially to a Seely Fey. Any result it might bring about is irrelevant. When class was dismissed, Kiara gathered her things and stomped out of the classroom. I hurried to catch up with her and almost lost my books. I had to struggle to grab them as they nearly tumbled out of my arms. One of them did. I had to bend down and get it off the floor before scuttling after Kiara. It was the black-bound book I'd bought at her sister's shop last year, the one with the beautiful drawings written in a language I couldn't understand. I still hadn't deciphered any of it, but I carried it with me most of the time because I thought it was pretty to look at between boring class hours when I had nothing to do. You seem peeved, I said as we left the classroom. Is something bothering you? It's because Professor Mara's lecture is wrong, Kiara said firmly. Unseely magic is dangerous to Seely Fey, and yes, it can have consequences, but if used wisely, it can be a tool for good, and she knows nothing about the Miriamic Coven. They caught their magic from a demon long ago, but that doesn't mean they harness only demonic powers now. Kiara took the crystal out that she wore underneath her shirt and grasped it tight. Tools of magic aren't inherently evil or good. The meaning you apply to them makes them what they are. That's the basics of fey magic. I can't believe she's so discriminatory. I shrugged. Well, prejudice is high amongst the Arcania. Are you surprised she didn't do any research? Kiara huffed. No, I guess it's not uncommon. Her tone was depressing. You seem to be taking this very personally. Kiara bit her lip. You know that my mother was kicked out of Arcanian society because she fell in love with a human. Yeah. Wasn't anything I cared about, but I knew to most idiots around here, the idea of a fey loving a human was scandalous, even if we had interbred with them centuries ago. Well, that's not the only reason, if I'm being honest. Kiara sighed. My mother was playing around with dark magic. Nothing that would harm her, but stuff forbidden by the Seelie besides. They argued it wasn't our way. 
My mom was a big advocate for unsilly magic, said we needed to stick to our fey roots, but the people in Dolinska ran her out of town. Kiara looked down. Siona and I share the same views, but we can't speak them out loud. Even though Siona runs a contraband shop, where you can find things most Arcania would disapprove of, her customers wouldn't go so far as thinking unseely magic's okay for personal use. If that's true, why did you make it such a big deal that I used the dark necklace in the king's contest? I asked. I didn't care that you used dark magic, only that you cheated, Kiara explained. I don't think unseely magic is a bad thing. In my eyes, shadow magic can be a tool used for good. But what's the real difference between unseely magic and seely magic besides one is considered good and the other evil? I asked. Seely magic comes from your own power, your own source, which is our connection to Edenmire, Kiara clarified. Unseely magic can be drawn from any object or being that's not your own, like through rituals or by using crystals and horns. Seely magic is internal, while unseely magic is external. It has to take energy from something else. It's not technically your magic, but you can cast it for your own purposes. Isn't that inherently evil? I asked. Not if you use it the right way. If you drew enough power from a living creature and killed it for your own material gain, that would be considered evil. But if you're using a tool like a wound that has its own energy, it's just dark magic, Kiara said. People say that casting unseely magic opens you up to demonic possession, but that's just not true. Yes, you can pull magic from demonic sources, and it's incredibly dangerous, but there are so many other things you can use instead. She grabbed her crystal again. I'd like to experiment with unseely magic, but there's so little knowledge about it out there, I'm not sure how. I reached out to take her hand. Well, if it helps, I agree with you. And I'd like to experiment with unseely magic too. It's part of my blood, and I want to learn more about my heritage. Kiara smiled. Thanks, Emma. At least you're not adult like the rest of the Fae. Her eyes shifted downward as we came to a deserted area of the school. What's that you got? She stopped, and I showed her the black book. It's the book I got from Enchanted Whispers last year. I carry it around because... Kiara let out a huge gasp. She took the book out of my arms and started thumbing through the pages. I startled. What? I didn't know what this was before, but I do now, Kiara said in a hurry. I've been writing my essay for protection against black magic on unseelie items, and this is one of them. My heartbeat picked up. Really? Yes, Kiara gushed. It's an unseelie grimoire. A what? I asked, confused. Fairies used to keep grimoires, their books of spells and invocations. They're usually filled with all kinds of neat tricks and tips, Kiara said. It was a very private and personal thing for a fae to have. My heart glowed with respect for whoever had authored this grimoire. It must have meant a lot to them. For some reason, I felt an unspeakable connection with the writer of this book I couldn't explain. Okay, then why isn't it written in Malovian? I asked. Because Malovian is a silly tongue. This book is written in the unsilly language. Kiara burst excitedly. Can we get any books on the unsilly language at the library? We might be able to translate. Kiara frowned. No, they've all been banned from the library. Well, so much for that. I'd lost hope I'd ever figure this thing out until Kiara tapped her chin. Siona has a book on unsilly translations. I'm guessing it's contraband, I asked. It's not something you should get caught with. Come on, let's go. Kiara and I hustled off campus. Spring was beginning to venture into Malovia now, and most of the snow had melted, leaving fresh grass to bloom beside the cobblestones, which were full of puddles from recent rain. We hurried to Enchanted Whispers and gave the password to the stone griffin guarding the door. It moved aside. As usual, the shop was bustling with customers. I smelled the fresh brew of coffee beans mixed with the pages of books wafting throughout the shop. Siona waved to us. Hey, sis, she called Kiara. What brings you by? Kiara tucked a curl behind her ear. Do you still have that book on the unseelie language? Siona tilted her head. I just might. She handed a customer a coffee, then slid out from behind the counter. She browsed the shelves until she pulled out a small purple book that was thick with pages. 
I believe this is what you were looking for, but I only have one copy. For you, it's half off. Thank you, Siona, I said. I paid her cash, then Chiara and I got two caramel lattes before we slid into two chairs by the window. I put both books on the table, while Chiara got out a notebook and quill. Where should we begin? Chiara asked. I wasn't sure. I flipped through the grimoire, trying to get a feel for what I should translate first. Common sense said to start with the first page, but I didn't want to do that. It didn't feel right. I turned the pages until I came upon the picture of an apple tree branch, wrapped with some kind of ribbon. The blossoms on the apple tree were drawn so beautifully, and I felt bewitched by the artwork. Let's start here. Kiara and I got to work. It took an hour to translate the page, letter by letter. Sometimes we got things wrong and had to restart. But eventually, we got it. I sat back in awe and took in the book with wonder. A spell to ward off hexes, I read. To destroy any curses against you cast by fay or otherwise, take the branch of an apple tree and wrap a ribbon from your clothing or hair upon it, chanting the words, The negative energy sent to me by another is bound to this branch. No dark power can harm me. The branch and the host tree will therefore absorb the curse, leaving you unscarred. Carry it with you for ultimate effect. Spell lasts until the branch turns black. My heart beat frantically. My first unseely spell. I couldn't believe it. Do you want to try it out? Kiara asked. Why not? I said. Kiara and I waved goodbye to Siona, then hurried out the door. We walked the streets of Dolinska, looking for an apple tree, until we found one lingering near the square. The tree had shred a few branches from the storm the night before. Kiara and I picked up two small ones. I took a ribbon from my hair, while Kiara plucked one of the black strands out of her head. We wrapped it around our apple branches before I said, Ready? Kiara nodded, and we chanted together, The negative energy sent to me by another is bound to this branch. No dark power can harm me. Nothing happened. Do you think it worked? I asked. I don't know, Kiara said slowly. I guess the only real way to find out is to hex each other, right? I'm not going to curse you, I said in revulsion. Me either, Kiara pocketed the branch. I guess we just have to wait and see. In the meantime, we can work together on deciphering the rest of that book. My heart pounded in anticipation at her words. It was going to take me a long time to learn and translate the grimoire, but it would be so worth it. Emma! We turned as Delmare came racing toward the two of us. Her black hair was in a mess. She panted by my side as she slid to a stop and said, I need your help. I've been invited to have dinner with Stefan's parents tonight. Kiara wiggled her eyebrows. Oh, meeting the family. That's a big step. It's not like that. Ugh, I don't want to go. Down there threw her hands up in frustration. So don't, I shrugged. Tell Stefan no. It's not his invitation, it's his parents. I can't refuse an invitation from a dragon fay highborn. What would that look like? Delmare said. She had a fair point. You didn't do those kinds of things with Fay. They found it incredibly rude. So what do you want me to do about it? I asked. Make it a double date. I'm allowed to bring guests. Come with me and bring Ethan, she pleaded. He knows Stefan's family. It won't be as awkward. The offer was intriguing. I was interested to see how the highborn Fay outside of the royal family lived and I couldn't let Delmere down in her time of need. I'll be there. What time? Five o'clock sharp, she said, shoulders sagging in relief. You're a lifesaver, Em. Bring condoms, Kiara teased. Delmere smacked her with her book bag. I thought it wasn't that big of a deal, but Delmere seemed truly relieved. I bet after Stefan had more or less met her crappy mom, Delmere felt inferior. Meeting his parents had to be terrifying for her. I texted Ethan to let him know, then we joined up at the main gates around four. I hadn't been sure what to wear. A dinner party with high-born face seemed important, so I'd chosen a long-sleeved blue dress that had a skirt that fell to the ground, with a wool coat over top. I'd made sure to curl my hair and put on a bit of makeup as well. I feared overdoing it, but at the same time, I didn't wish to offend Stefan's family by showing up looking inappropriate. 
I chose well because Ethan was dressed in a dark navy suit with a matching tie. His face lit up as I drew near, letting his eyes roam up and down my figure. You look ravishing, Miss Sosna. Thank you. I gave him a small curtsy. Because really, why not? And Ethan smiled. He liked that. Where do Stefan's parents live? I asked. In the mountains, in the dragon village, he said. The Slasky family mansion is at the very top. You'll have to ride on my back to get there. I didn't know there was a dragon village, I said in surprise. Each faction has their own small town, Ethan said. Most Arcania live in Dolinska, but others prefer the countryside and the quietness of their village. It's not far, merely a few miles. Ethan changed into a woven and knelt to the ground. I made a face as I lifted my dress and straddled his back. What is it? He asked. I'm worried about getting fur on my dress. I make sure to bathe my wolf form, Emma. Ethan's tone was brisk. Besides, as my marked, that's your job to comb out my coat. I can't do it myself. I loved the idea of running a brush through Ethan's long, silky fur, but I couldn't let him know that. Maybe if you're a good boy, I said, and I patted his shoulder. Ethan gave a bark. I laughed. Ethan bounded forward. I hung onto a scruff as we ran off campus and through the streets of Dolinska. When we got to the middle of town, he took a left turn and padded down a winding dirt path that led upward into the mountains. Most dragons fly to the village. It's difficult for sorceresses to get up there unless they have a shifter, Ethan said. Hold on tight. Ethan increased his strides, and the terrain beneath his paws became rocky and unsteady. We went vertical as Ethan jogged up the rocks. A few times, his grip slipped. I gasped, but Ethan caught his footing every time. I will never let you fall, Onawilka, Ethan said. Trust in me. I did. I trusted Ethan with all my heart. It was easy for me, like the feeling of jumping off a cliff and knowing he'd be there to catch me at the bottom. I didn't know what could destroy this deep bond we had between us. A bond I wished we could both acknowledge instead of pretending like it wasn't there. Destiny had brought us together and fate sealed our love. Would we ever admit it to each other? The surrounding landscape changed and the dirt became gravel underneath our feet. The mountains loomed overhead, monstrous and tall. Snow capped their tops, while cedars and other trees grew in spurts around small areas of land. I felt the air grow thinner and was glad I'd brought my inhaler just in case. Ethan rounded a large mountain and I gasped. In the middle of the mountain range was a small village. The houses themselves were built into the side of the mountains, carved out within the rock. The other remaining buildings in the center of the clearing were made of stone. Huge cauldrons bubbled with thick magma, the source of a dragon's inner fire. Shifters occasionally stopped by to drink magma from the cauldrons before spreading their leathery wings and taking off into the sky. Do dragons have to drink magma to sustain their breath? I asked as we passed the largest cauldron, which was more or less a fountain gushing lava in the center of the square. No, but it makes their breath stronger, Ethan said. The dragon sorceresses created a sort of funnel that reaches down to the mantle of the earth, so it'll bubble up into the cauldrons for the dragons to drink from. A dragon that drinks from the mantle can hold their fire breath for minutes instead of seconds. There's a rumor some dragons can even sustain a flame for hours, but I don't believe that. Dragons like to brag, you know. Dragons perched everywhere, on mountaintops and in large trees. Sorceresses stood in the center of town, creating illusions from the smoke that their dragons blew. I watched as smoke dragons flew, dancing with women made of cinders amongst the clouds. Blacksmiths worked in forges along the gravel road. Dragons were particularly skilled in making weaponry. One dragon heated his forge with his fire breath before he changed back into a man and began tempering a sword. The temperature was hot here from all the surrounding dragons breathing fire. I slipped off my coat and placed it over Ethan's back as my head swiveled this way to that. Welcome to the Dragon Village, Ethan said. People glanced at us and a few bowed as we walked by in respect to Ethan, but mostly we went ignored. We passed a fighting ring. Dragons wrestled with each other in their shifter forms, 
making granite shake down from the mountains above. There are a lot of jewelry stores here, I said, and banks. There seemed to be one on every corner. Well, the rumors are true. Dragons love hoarding gems and gold. It's not unusual for a dragon Arcania, or as they call themselves, dragons, to become a jeweler, banker, or accountant. The dragon faction maintains our treasury here in Melovia. Most business is done here in the dragon village. It's beautiful. There were carved stone statues of dragon heroes all throughout the village, decorated with gemstones and adorned with wildflowers. The dragons took great pride in how their village looked. It's all right for a dragon. Ethan gave a careless shrug. He didn't seem very impressed. By the glint in his eye, I could tell he was thinking of his own village. Will you take me to the woven village? I asked. I wanted to see where I'd come from. Sometime. Ethan said, though not now. The pack is very distrusting of outsiders. You are one of us, Emma, but since you have been shunned, you have yet to prove yourself to the pack. They will not welcome you currently, or I as your mate. I frowned. Will I ever be accepted by my own people? Yes, I will fight for it, Ethan said. Once it is safe, I will take you there and show you the pack's wonders. If I ever was welcomed by the Arcania again, being shunned really fucking sucked. We wound up the road to the highest part of the mountain range. My mouth dropped open when I looked skyward. A huge stone mansion had been carved out of the side of the biggest mountain. Marble columns stood in front of a great golden gate that had two large statues of dragons protecting the outside. Servants opened the gate for us. My neck craned upward as I observed the dragon statues, which had to be at least a hundred feet tall. Down the road was what looked like some sort of factory. Servants ran around it, carrying large wooden crates that they stacked onto the backs of dragons. The Slasky family owns one of the most popular alehouses in the world. Their award-winning ale is sold in nearly every country. Ethan explained as we approached the mansion. Stefan's family is certainly not hurting for money. No, they were not. As we came to the front door of the mansion, I dismounted and Ethan changed back into a man. The doors opened, seemingly of their own accord. I stepped inside. The opening room of the mansion was lit by a skylight cut into the mountain's rock. The floor underneath us was marble a depiction of a map of Malovia etched into the stone. A crystal chandelier hung above us, and two grand staircases wrapped around in a circle to the second floor above. Flaming torches lined with gold burned on the walls. Sculptures and gems were displayed in glass cases every few feet. Elaborate paintings draped the walls above velvet benches. It was like walking into a beautiful museum instead of a house. Two people were waiting for us in the middle of the room. They both had black hair and dark eyes. The man was tall and tan, with a broad nose and a clean ruby suit. He looked a lot like Stefan. The woman beside him had her hair curled in a fashionable way, with pointy heels and a sleek pencil skirt with a matching blazer. They gave kind smiles, though I felt intimidated. Ethan, it's wonderful to see you, the woman said. She reached out and gave him a kiss on the cheek, which he returned. We haven't seen you in ages. I've been busy, Mom, Ethan said, and I felt a spurt of surprise. I was so glad that Ethan knew these people, well enough to consider them parents. I knew he and Stefan grew up together, but I was surprised they were this warm with each other. The man gave a hearty laugh. Busy with your new mate, I see, he said as he took Ethan into a manly embrace clapping him on the back. We all know boys get distracted when they bond. Ethan slightly blushed, and the woman slapped her husband on the shoulder. Be polite, Jonathan. We have a guest. Ethan grinned broadly. Emma, I'd like to introduce you to Jonathan and Miroslava Slasky, two of the best Arcania I know. Welcome to our home, Miroslava said kindly, and she took my hands in hers. Is Ethan's mate... You have a place of honor here. We are glad to finally meet you. The pleasure is all mine, I responded in relief. I appreciated they didn't bring up my shunning. 
It felt good to be treated normal around here for once. I'd half been expecting a lecture when I arrived about what had happened at the contest. Stiffen and Irina are already in the dining room. Come. Miroslava led the way down a long hall. As we proceeded into the depths of the mountain, it got dark, lit only by the sconces lining the walls. The mansion was perfectly homey for a dragon who wanted to curl up inside their lair, but as a wolven, I would have preferred more windows for moonlight to slip through. This place was just too dark. We entered into a beautiful dining hall. A long wooden table surrounded by velvet chairs was at its center, while a harpist played in the corner. The table was before a large hearth, which blazed with a warm and robust fire. Light illusions hovered overhead, the orbs intermingling against the gorgeous painting that covered the ceiling like the Sistine Chapel. The portrait was a design of horses and stags in a field, while couples clung tightly to each other against the rising sun. Stefan and Delmer were sitting down. It was still weird to see him in a suit. He sat beside Delmer, who'd chosen a black ball gown for the night's dinner. She bounced in her seat, as if nervous. I didn't care what Delmer said. She'd dressed up to impress them. I took a seat next to her, and she gave me a grateful smile. Well, damn, it's about time you showed up. Stefan rubbed his stomach. I'm half starved. Oh, I'm sure, Ethan teased as he sat beside me. You look it. Stefan got up and put Ethan in a headlock. The two of them wrestled for a moment before Miroslava said, Boys manners. Stefan let Ethan go, though Ethan biffed him on the side of the head before he did. They almost went at it again, though a stern look from Miroslava made them stop. My sons can be a handful when they're together, Jonathan said with a sigh. They've always been rambunctious. Jonathan caught my inquisitive eye and said, King Lycus and I were very close. Ethan might not be of my blood, but I consider him my son, as I know Lycus considered Stefan his. I am very much the same, Miroslava said, though her lips pursed as she added, I wish Antonia felt as we do. Ethan frowned for a moment. Stefan let out a small laugh. The queen doesn't like me. Stefan wiggled his eyebrows. Thinks I'm too brash. The queen doesn't like anyone. I said before I could stop myself. I reddened, realizing I'd embarrassed myself. But Miroslava smiled and Jonathan broke into a hearty chuckle. I dare say she doesn't. She's a hard one to please, Ethan would agree. Ethan's mouth twitched. Unfortunately. Delmer was being quiet. She was observing the situation, as if feeling Stefan's parents out. Servants came by with plates of food, placing them in front of us. Shouldn't be surprised the main course was prime rib, seeing as how we were in a house full of dragons. Stefan and Ethan wolfed down their meals, though I was more cautious. I took careful bites, savoring the delicious meal. Delmer was barely eating. She almost looked green. I reached down to squeeze her hand under the table, and she squeezed it back. So, Irina, what are you studying in school? Miroslava asked kindly to make conversation. Delmer swallowed before responding in a small voice. I'm an art major. An art major? Jonathan boomed. Why, that's fantastic. I studied art at Arcania University. Really? Delmer's eyes widened in surprise, and I shared her sentiment. The creative arts weren't respected amongst Arcanian circles. Of course. I'm a curator at the Malovian Museum of Fine Art. Jonathan replied. We have many dealings with the British Museum in London. That's amazing, Delmer breathed. I've been to the museum and the collections inside are gorgeous. Jonathan swelled with pride. Stefan leaned in with a full mouth and said, That's because he's painted half of them, including all the ones in this house. You created all those paintings? Even the one on the ceiling? Delmer looked above us. Her voice was full of awe and respect. You must be a master painter. Don't flatter him too much, my dear, Miroslava said. You'll get a big head. A big head? Jonathan guffawed. My talents with a brush are nothing. Watch. Jonathan cast his arms upward, and the painting above us began to move. The illusion caused the portrait to come alive. Horses running across the ceiling while couples danced and deers frolicked. 
Wow, Delmere whispered. What an amazing illusion. It's a portrait of the great hunting fields, Jonathan boasted. Took me five years to complete. I stopped eating for a moment. Miroslava caught my introspective look and asked, What's on your mind? I paused, thinking this might be a juvenile question. Well, I've heard our afterlife is called both the Great Hunting Grounds and the Great Hunting Fields. I admitted. Which is it? Jonathan nodded solemnly. Ah, uh, yes, we heard you were an outsider. I frowned, but Jonathan hurried to say, Not a bad thing. We need Arcania with different perspectives around here. Things are getting a little bit stale. Not to mention prejudiced, Miroslava murmured under her breath, so low I barely heard it. Jonathan cleared his throat. To answer your question, it is both. The grounds are the encompassing heaven made for all Arcania, but the fields are regarded as the best place for the greatest warriors. Champions of gods, kings, war heroes, and such. Think of it as an upper district of honor amongst the dead. My heart started when he mentioned champions. As Milana's, would that be my final resting place someday? I was getting too wrapped up in my thoughts. Delmer saved me by asking, So, Mrs. Slasky, what do you do? I'm an immunologist, Miroslava said. I have a private practice in Dolinska. My ears perked up at that. An immunologist? Yes, Miroslava smiled and nodded. And I am taking on new patients. If you know anyone who needs a specialist, I'm the best in the country. That comment was too direct to be a coincidence. I began communicating telepathically with Ethan. Did you say something? I might have told her about your condition, Ethan admitted. I'm sorry, I wanted advice on it and figured she would know. I wasn't too bothered by it. At least Miroslava was a stranger and not someone I knew. Do you think I should see her? I had another doctor here in Malovia, but to be honest, he wasn't that great. I'd been looking for someone else to take over my primary care. I think so. She's not lying when she says she's the best. She could help you. Ethan offered. That was good enough for me. I think I know someone who'd like to stop by, I said. Then send them over. I'd be happy to take on their care, Miroslava said before she let the matter drop. I was happy she hadn't blurted out my secret in front of Stefan and Delmere. I wasn't ready to tell them yet. Jonathan changed the subject and said, How are you all doing in school? It's going well for me, Ethan said. I've been staying on top of things. Jonathan huffed. Glad you have. This one's been slacking. He said, jerking his thumb at Stefan. Stefan grinned. I plan to get through life on my stunningly good looks. Good looks don't last forever, save for your mother, Jonathan replied. Miroslava chuckled and said, You flatter me, John. If it wasn't for Irina, you'd be failing this semester. Jonathan barked at Stefan. It's a blessing she agreed to tutor you. It's no trouble, Delmer rushed to say. Stefan's smart. He picks things up quickly. More like instructing a rock, Jonathan commented. Stefan hissed with laughter. I always told my son to find a woman smarter than he is, Miroslava told me with a nod. Thank the gods he listened to something I had to say. Delmer blushed. Miroslava's eyebrows knitted together in concern. My dear, are you all right? You look a little flushed. Delmer got up from her seat. I just need some fresh air. Excuse me. Delmer picked up her skirts and ran out. Stefan frowned. It looked like he wanted to go after her until Ethan shook his head, telling him to stay put. I'll check on her, I added. I stood up from the table. The Slaskis started up a conversation about the current hockey season with Ethan as I followed Delmer out. I found Delmer on a balcony overlooking the mountain range. It was beautiful. The red sun came down and cloaked Melovia below in a lovely hue of orange. The cool mountain air brushed against my skin in a whisper. It felt refreshing after being in that stifling, stuffy cave. Delmer rubbed her arms. I put a hand on my hip and cocked it out. Okay, they like you. What's the issue? That's a problem. I'm not a highborn, 
she protested. I'd have thought they'd want Stefan to be with someone of their own station. But they don't care about your social class. That's a good thing, I insisted. They just want their son to be happy. They're too perfect. There's gotta be a catch. You're being too negative, I scowled. I know it's different from how you were brought up. That's an understatement. I'm a fish out of water, Delmare said. I pretty much grew up in poverty and Stefan owns a fucking palace. Our two kinds don't mix. I know you don't believe in that garbage. You're starting to sound like the circle. And I didn't like it. Not one bit. This wasn't the Delmare I knew to concede to classist bullshit. She protested and fought against things like this. Why was this situation any different? I've just taken care of myself all my life. I was a latchkey kid. I'm not used to being pampered, she argued. So why turn it down now? I asked. Stefan wants to take care of you. Let him. I don't want to be kept, Delmare said. I'm a woman, not a goddamn show horse. I sighed. She was being so dramatic. Hey, look at the bright side. If you marry him, you'll never have to cook again. Delmare's mouth opened in outrage before her expression became thoughtful. You know, that's actually a plus. I would say. We got hungry at midnight the other day and Delmare had tried to make us grilled cheeses in the dormitory kitchens. They were burnt black. I'd had a stomach ache all night because of a cheese sandwich. She definitely needed servants to do the cooking for her. Delmare chewed on her fingernails. I came here expecting to be judged, but that's not happening. I don't know what to think of it. You honestly couldn't have ended up in a better position, I said. His dad's a professional painter. He's an art curator, for the God's sake. He could help you with your career. You could learn from him personally. I don't want to be with Stefan because his dad has connections. I rolled my eyes. You wouldn't be God's mare. I want to make it my own way. Prove that I deserve to be an artist instead of relying on my boyfriend to get me places, she said. I smiled. You called him your boyfriend? Delmere face palmed. He's not, okay? Let's just get back to the party. Mare. I grabbed her arm. Just give him a chance. He wouldn't have brought you here if you weren't important to him. Why are you being so pushy? Her eyes narrowed. Because I know you. If I didn't think you had an interest in Stefan, I wouldn't be on your ass to make a decision about him. I frowned. But I know you're turning him down because of your own insecurities, not because you don't have feelings. I know you want to protect yourself, but you're being paranoid. You can be happy on your own, but I think you're lying about what you really want. Delmere bit her lip. I'll think about it. Come on, we don't want to be missed. By the time we returned, dessert had been served. Ice cream with chocolate fried bonbons. I died of happiness. You're all welcome to stay the night, Miroslava offered as dinner ended. We have plenty of room. Thank you for the offer, but Emma and I had best be on our way, Ethan said. I would, but Delmare has to finish a project early tomorrow for an exhibition, Stefan said. I should get her back. An exhibition? Jonathan asked in interest. Delmare blushed. My class is having an art show in one of the ballrooms at the university, she said. I have my own display. That's wonderful. I'd be very keen to see your art, Jonathan proclaimed. We'd love to come, dear, Miroslava said. Just let us know the day and we'll be there. Delmere tried to hide a grin and failed. Her own mother had never come to see any of her paintings. This was the family Delmere had always wanted. All she had to do was open up and let them in and they'd be hers. I just hope she didn't get in her own way. The next day was Odette and Theo's big recital. Ethan and I were going together to the ballet to support them. Though I didn't approve of Odette's methods to maintain her position as the lead role, 
I knew this was important to her, and she wanted to see me in the audience. I put on a red dress and did my hair before I slipped into a pair of high heels and a snazzy jacket. I looked good. Ethan was totally going to drool over me. I stepped out of my room and walked down the hallway with my head held high, feeling like a badass. That feeling was crushed when I felt someone's long fingers curl around my neck. I gasped as someone wrenched me to the side and slammed me against the wall. I grabbed at the hands that strangled me. She had me pinned, squeezing the life out of me as she looked on with malice in her gaze. Do you seriously think you can poison me and get away with it? Gabby hissed. Her fingers tightened, and I choked. I tried to kick her away, but I couldn't move. The bitch must have caught me with a binding spell when my back was turned. What a coward. She couldn't even make it a fair fight. Gabby's eyes glowed red as she snapped. Your little confusion potion wasn't going to work on me. I'm far too powerful. And why is that? I squeezed out. My illusion magic fought with all its might against Gabby's binding spell. Any moment now, it was going to break. Gabby's eyes narrowed. She let go of me and took a step back. I felt my knees, gasping for breath and clutching at my throat. Your pathetic attempt to get me off the throne didn't work. Eli and I passed our trials. You might as well give up. She knelt down so she was at my eye level. Her voice was full of contempt as she spoke. You're going to pay for that little stunt you just pulled. Gabby raised her hand. She cast a spell and the area around her hands became red. The spell rushed toward me and I gasped, expecting pain. But before it touched me, the spell stopped in midair, like an invisible shield prevented it from working. The curse burst into ash, fluttering to the carpet. Gabby's face was momentarily shocked, then she tried again. She cast the hex, but for the second time, it wouldn't harm me. I couldn't help but give a spiteful smile, you're not that accomplished of a sorceress. Shut up, Gabby smoldered. She grabbed me by the hair and wrenched me to my feet before she threw me against the wall again. I heard the rage in her voice as she whispered into my ear. Make no mistake, penance is coming for that stunt you pulled. One more slip up and the phantom's done for. This is your last warning. Gabby walked off. I was left quivering. I so wanted to kick her ass and knew I could do it, but if I tried, she'd expose Ethan. If she wasn't going to already, damn it, why hadn't I been more careful? Tears rose to my eyes at the thought of Gabby revealing Ethan and him being arrested for being a vigilante, but I forced them down. If Gabby was going to blab, she'd have done it. I was too useful to her. She'd make me pay in a different way, I was sure of it. The moment Gabby was gone, I fished in my purse. I took out the apple branch. It fizzled and turned black, curling inward upon itself. My breath caught. The spell had worked. It protected me from Gabby's hex. I pocketed the apple branch and reminded myself to make a new one as quickly as possible. Thank you, Grimoire. It saved me from getting knocked on my ass back there. I hurried into the bathroom. Bitch had ruined my hair. It took another 15 minutes to fix before I noticed the long bruise marks forming around my neck from Gabby's fingers. Ethan couldn't see that. He'd have a cow. I cast an illusion spell, and the bruises slowly faded, but I knew it wouldn't last forever. Hopefully, it holds up until the end of the night. I put myself together and met Ethan at the double gates. He'd already called a carriage and stood by it with a gleam in his eye. He was dressed in a black tux that fit the curves of his muscles and made him look incredibly hot. What was it about men in suits? They just looked so put together. Miss Sosna, you are a sight for sore eyes, he said as I took his arm. I blushed and said, you clean up good yourself. He helped me into the carriage. Emma and Ethan have a risque tryst in the carriage and put themselves together before they arrive at the ballet. As the carriage door opened, the driver eyed us with a smile. Ethan ducked his head, a little embarrassed, but I was far from mortified. I got a thrill out of people knowing I'd pleasured my man. 
The ballet was held in a beautiful auditorium, with Roman columns lining the large marble building on all sides. I took Ethan's arm, and we started the climb upward. The stairs were numerous, twenty or so. The surrounding area was packed with snobs in Arcania that had more money than the gods themselves. A few of them tilted their head to us as we walked by. There was a long red carpet lining the entrance to the theater. Faye with cameras turned our way. I was temporarily blinded by the flashing of lights and people calling out questions. Ethan didn't answer any of them and instead pulled me inside the theater. Paparazzi, Ethan explained with a scowl. They're filthy rats. I haven't seen them before. They were always around whenever Ethan went to Dolinska, but never so many. They can't photograph me on university grounds. It's against the law, Ethan said. So they photograph me everywhere else I go. This is a big event, a lot of important people, so they're all here. Your picture will be in the tabloids tomorrow, be sure. Good thing I'd done my makeup. Inside, the theater was beautiful. The ceilings were made of gold, crystal chandeliers hanging every few feet, and the rug underneath our feet was a rich ruby. Employees in tuxedos and white gloves handed out champagne to the guests as we walked in. I was offered, but I politely declined, as did Ethan. We obtained our tickets from the booth and strode into the vast auditorium. Each of the seats was huge and plush velvet. Balconies hung above the stage, which was the largest I'd ever seen. Painted on the ceilings and the balconies were elaborate depictions of the gods and what I could only fathom as the great hunting grounds around them, an ethereal land of trees and sunlight amongst the clouds, decorated with gold trim. Gods, this auditorium was wonderful. It had to be hundreds of years old. No wonder Odette revered her role as the lead. Performing in this gorgeous theater had to be a high honor. As Prince Regent, Ethan had snagged us coveted seats beside the orchestra pit. Delmare, Stefan, Alexi, and Chiara were already here. Stefan and Alexi were both wearing tuxes, Alexi's a little frayed. Chiara and Delmare cooled themselves with large fans. Chiara was wearing a big yellow ball gown, while Delmare had a black lace dress that was high-necked and long-sleeved. Where have you been? Chiara asked as we sat down. Show's about to start. We were otherwise preoccupied, Ethan said as we sat down. That means she gave you a BJ, Delmare deadpanned. Stefan snorted. We did no such thing, I replied, though my tone gave me away. Your lipstick is smudged, Delmare said. Alexi and Stefan laughed, while Ethan paled, mortified. I took a mirror out of my purse and fixed it. Well, at least it was a good reason, I said. Hopefully, the paparazzi hadn't caught that. The orchestra pit began playing, and red curtains lining the stage were pulled aside. Dancers flooded the stage. Theo was there, playing the part of Romeo as the show began. I'd never seen such an exquisite ballet. I'd been to many shows before with my mom, but the skill of these dancers was on a whole other level. Every step was so carefully placed, the dancers made it look as easy as walking. My heart skipped a beat as Odette came on stage, dressed as Juliet. She had a huge smile on her face, and her eyes gleamed happily, though I caught a hint of hesitation within them. She twirled and jumped with all the precise movements of an expert ballerina, each move poised and perfect. Watching Odette dance was like observing a cloud floating across the sky. She seemed so light and airy. I could tell this is what she aspired to do. Performing was her true love. As she dipped and spun, I caught jealous gazes from the other dancers as they fluttered across the stage. All of them were good, but Odette's dancing put her on a pedestal high above the rest. She was born to be on stage. The music changed, and the theme from Romeo and Juliet played dramatically through the theater by the beauty of the string quartet. My breath caught, and Ethan noticed. He leaned in and whispered, Something you like? I've always loved a time for us, I replied. It's one of my favorite songs. Ethan smiled and squeezed my hand. Well, maybe it can be our song. I liked that. I liked that a lot. And perhaps it fit. Ethan and I, the two star-crossed lovers, the prince and the peasant girl. We shouldn't be together. 
We were expected to stay apart due to the rules dictated by class and proper society, and yet, here we were. As Theo and Odette danced, I found myself swooning. You could literally feel the connection as they moved fluidly, playing the part of the forbidden lovers. They were practically the same person as Odette moved in Theo's arms, spinning and leaping as one. How could Odette not believe that Theo was her mate? It was obvious for the whole world to see as they worked together in unison on something they both adored. They loved to dance, and what was more, they loved to dance together. They had a deep soul connection that went beyond the realm of being partners. Why couldn't Odette recognize what was meant to be? Odette made it flawlessly through the first act. But as we came back from intermission, something changed. Her face was ashen, despite being plastered with stage makeup, and her pirouettes weren't as perfect as before. Odette's steps never faltered, but I watched her chest rise and fall rapidly as she tried to keep up with the music. Theo kept a smile plastered on for the audience, but by the crinkles at the edges of his eyes, I could tell he was worried. Odette went out for a solo dance and jumped so close to the edge of the stage she almost fell in the orchestra pit. The crowd gasped, but Odette played it off like she meant to do it and they clapped in response. Beads of sweat appeared on her forehead and they glistened in the stage lights. I don't think she'd eaten today. She seemed weak. The small span of her waist seemed blatant to me as I watched her twirl. Odette, please hold on. The defining moment came near the end of the second act. Theo pushed Odette into the air, performing an intricate lift. Odette held her position for a moment, appearing the perfect ballerina, before her eyes rolled back and her head went to the side. I grabbed Ethan's hand beside me. We stared on in shock as Odette slumped, falling to the floor. The audience made sounds of despair. I squeezed Ethan's hand again, but thankfully, Theo caught her. He fell onto his side, cradling Odette so she didn't hurt herself. He took the fall for her in a landing that resulted in a loud thud that echoed throughout the auditorium. Odette had fainted. Her eyes remained closed as Theo cradled her close, shaking her and trying to get her to wake up. The orchestra stopped playing, and the audience began to make noise. I didn't care about the ballet. I jumped up from my seat and ran around the orchestra, pulling myself on stage. The crowd gave scandalized cries of outrage as they saw me dash for Odette. The red curtains were closed, but I pushed past them and slid onto my knees next to Theo. Theo gently slapped Odette's face. My dear, you have to wake up, he whispered. He sounded near tears. Odette was slowly coming around. I pulled her onto my lap and Theo let me. Her eyes fluttered weakly as she awakened. Her body felt like nothing but bones upon my legs. We need to get you to the hospital, I said. I gave a helpless glance to Theo as company members began rushing on stage, one of them carrying a stretcher. She barely registered my words. I'm sorry, Emma, Odette whimpered, and a tear ran down her cheek. I tried. Chapter 15 Ethan The ballet had been more or less ruined after Odette's incident on stage. She was rushed to the hospital. Theo had been so distraught he hadn't been able to continue. Backups had been called, but they weren't as good as Theo and Odette, and it basically destroyed the show. Most people who bought tickets had asked for their money back. Odette hadn't left the hospital since. She came in weighing a measly 95 pounds. We hadn't gotten much word about her and hadn't been allowed to see her. Theo was the only one who'd been let in and out of her hospital room. He told us Odette was undergoing treatment for her eating disorder and wouldn't be out of rehabilitation for at least a few weeks. She'd also been kicked out of the ballet company, which pissed me off. Those bastards had been the ones pushing her not to eat, and she'd done as they'd asked. Any embarrassment that came from her fall on stage was their fault, not hers. It had to be a devastating blow to Odette. Emma was worried about her terribly. On the morning of March 28th, I left my dorm to meet up with Emma. It was a Saturday. We'd planned to go get breakfast in town together before busting out some homework in the rec room. I was hoping we'd get some free time to mess around again. 
I'd nearly died when Emma had worked her magic on me back in the carriage the night of the ballet. Her movements were enough to make a man beg for mercy. My heart fell, though, when I noticed her rosy cheeks and red nose. She coughed into her arm, and I heard mucus rattling in her throat. She was ill. Still, she smiled when she saw me, slinging her bag over her shoulder. About time you showed up. Are you all right? I asked. She sounded congested. I'm sick again. Emma blew into a tissue. Nothing unusual, just a head cold. Oh, Emma. This was the fourth time she'd been sick this semester, and we were barely halfway through. Are you sure you're well enough to go out? Emma shrugged. If I stayed in my dorm every time I felt like shit, I'd never leave. It's okay. The doctor already said I'm not contagious. That might be the case, but I didn't want her getting any sicker. I at least wished to alleviate some of her symptoms. We should stop by the alchemy lab, I suggested. Kiara might have something for that cold. She was usually there around this hour on Saturdays. That's a good idea. Let's go say hi. Emma and I walked together to the alchemy lab. It was a beautiful room with a glass ceiling, multiple plants, and herbs growing on the shelves along the walls, cupboards full of potion ingredients. It looked more like a greenhouse than a lab. When we got there, it was deserted, save for Kiara stirring a cauldron on top of her desk. And Gabby. She was rummaging through the alchemy cupboards and taking whatever she could find, shoving it into a velvet bag. When she saw us come in, she sneered and slammed the cupboards shut with a snap. She shoved past us with a smirk and didn't bother to close the door behind her. Kiara rolled her eyes. I'm so glad she left. She's been annoying me all morning. Did she talk to you? Emma asked in surprise. No, but she made a lot of noise while I'm trying to concentrate. Kiara turned a page in her textbook before adding some herbs to the cauldron's brew. What was she here for? Emma's tone was suspicious. Kiara shrugged. Not sure, but she took about a thousand things from the pantry and didn't log any of them. Professor Solane is going to have a fit when she sees her stores have been raided. Not that Gabby cares, I'm sure. She's been so gloaty since she passed her trials, Emma said in disgust. I honestly can't stand her. Forget about her, I said. Talking about Gabby was a sure way to ruin anyone's morning. Kiara, do you have anything to help with congestion? Emma's a bit stuffed up. Kiara rummaged through the alchemy cupboards. Hmm, I have something. Here. Kiara pressed a bag into Emma's hand. This is elderberry and bitter orange tea, along with some eucalyptus oil. Drink the tea and rub the oil onto your skin and you should feel better. Thanks, Kiara, Emma said. She put the tea and oil into her bag. She tilted her head as she watched Kiara stir the cauldron. What are you making? It's an anti-anxiety potion, Kiara said. I've been brewing it all morning. I thought it would help calm Alexi. That is seriously so sweet, Emma said. It's my own recipe, Kiara stated. I think it'll really help him. As if on cue, Alexei entered the alchemy lab. He wandered to us with a wave. Hey, guys, he said. What's going on? Just stopping by, Emma said. We can go if we're interrupting something. Kiara smiled nervously, and Alexei went beet red. No, uh, he stammered. You're not interrupting anything. Maybe that's the problem, I heard Kiara mumble under her breath. But I don't think Alexei heard her. She scooped the potion into a flask, then handed it to Alexei. Here, drink this. It's my own special make, a calming potion for griffins. Alexei took the vial and looked at it. It glittered gold in the light. I've never taken a potion before. Do you think it works? You'll never know unless you try, Kiara teased. Go on, give it a sip. Alexei shrugged. Hey, if you made it, I trust you. He raised the vial. To your health, my good lady. Alexei downed the potion. He stood there for a moment, taking in its effects. Well, does it work? Emma asked. Alexei went to answer, but the moment he opened his mouth, he gagged. His eyes widened, becoming bloodshot, while a small bit of foam worked its way out of the corner of his lips. Hives blistered all over his face. Alexei grabbed at his throat, 
then collapsed to his knees in shock. Alexei! Kiara ran forward. She tried to keep him upright, but he slumped to the ground. More froth came out of his mouth, and he began writhing on the floor. He's been poisoned! He needs an antidote! Emma cried. Her face was horrified as she observed Alexei's tremors. He can't be! I didn't use anything harmful! It's all garden herbs! Kiara burst. At her side, Alexei slowly turned blue. His throat was closing up, suffocating him. His eyes closed half shut, and his hand fell to his side, going still. We needed to act fast, otherwise he was going to die. I didn't believe Kiara had messed the potion up. She was too meticulous. I thought of the options. Fay were only allergic to three things, iron, St. John's wort, and yarrow. I picked up the vial and sniffed it. A bitter smell wafted to my nostrils, and it turned my stomach. Yarrow, I said quickly. I dumped the rest down the sink and tossed the bottle. It shattered on the other side of the room. At Alexei's side, Kiara worked frantically. She combined walnuts, figs, rue leaves, and salt into a wooden bowl. She ground them up, then wrenched a small vial of purple liquid out of her pocket. It smelled like acacia juice. She mixed it all together, throwing in saffron, ginger, and cinnamon. When it was done, she tilted Alexei's head back and forced the potion down his throat. Alexei calmed. His chest began to rise and fall, yet slowly. Some hives faded away from his face, but he was still unconscious. What did you make? Emma asked. Mithridate, Kiara said. It's an old magical cure for poisons. Come, we have to get him to the hospital wing. I transformed into a wolven, and the girl slung Alexei onto my back. We ran to the hospital wing, where the nurses took one look at Alexei and rushed him off to the emergency ward. Kiara tried to follow, but a nurse held her back. I'm sorry, but you can't go back there, she said. It's a restricted area. It was my potion he drank, Kiara pleaded. You might need my help. The nurse hesitated for a moment before ushering her back. The doors swung closed behind her, and Emma and I were left waiting in the cold hallway. Kiara wasn't dumb enough to mistakenly put yarrow in her potion, and there was none to be found in the alchemy lab anyways, because it was poisonous to students, which meant it had come from somewhere else. There had only been two people in the alchemy classroom this morning when we arrived, Kiara and Gabby. Emma was thinking the same thing I was. She wiped away tears as she faced me. Gabby was trying to hurt Kiara to get to me, she whispered, but Kiara had an anti-hex spell on her, so it saved her from the yarrow and hurt Alexei instead. What do you mean? My heart was still beating from the exhilaration. Even now, Alexei might not make it. Emma frowned. Gabby found out we put something in her drink, she said. She told me she was too powerful for a confusion potion to work, and she was going to get me back. Anger boiled inside my chest. I despised Gabby. There were no lines she wouldn't cross. She thought she owned this fucking school. Is there anything else she told you? I asked. Emma hesitated. No, she replied. Nothing. There was an underline of a lie in her words. Emma was holding back. Are you sure? I asked firmly. This time, Emma nodded. Yes, I've told you what I know. I didn't believe her, and I didn't know why, but I had a thin veil of instinct that swore Emma was hiding something. We need to turn Gabby in, I said immediately. She has to pay for this. You already know no one is going to believe us, Emma said in exasperation. Kiara made that potion, and we have no proof Gabby poisoned it. The teachers will just think Kiara messed it up. I knew she was right, but still, I was so tired of Gabby getting away with everything. She knew how to avoid being caught. Emma didn't seem so willing to let Gabby go free. We have to stop her, Ethan, she said. If she's doing this now, what's she going to do as queen? We're doing all we can. Yet it wasn't enough. Gabby was willing to play dirty, and we weren't. It was something we had to rectify. Fast. We waited in the hallway for what seemed like hours. Three more figures came through the door. Delmare, Stefan, and Theo. We heard what happened, Stefan said in a winded voice. 
What the fuck, dude? It was Gabby, Emma said viciously. She did this. Delmare's face darkened. That whore. I swear, when I get my hands on her... Let's make sure Kiara and Alexi are all right, I told the group. Then we can work on getting revenge. We lingered in the waiting room for some time more. By noon, Kiara wandered in with bleary eyes. We stood anxiously on the precipice of receiving bad news. He'll survive, Kiara said, and we all relaxed. He needs a few days to recover. He'll wake up sometime tomorrow. Thank the gods, Theo mumbled. Kiara rubbed her arms. It was a close call. The Mithridate bought him time. He almost didn't. She trailed off and shivered once. How did you know how to make that antidote? Emma asked in wonder. It was amazing. I've learned a lot of things in my alchemy class, Kiara said. It's a requirement for my major. I knew Kiara wanted to be a priest for Vesna, the goddess of wisdom, and had picked religious studies for her major. Priestesses spent their days serving the gods, but they were also great healers among our kind. Good thing learning about various poisons and potions was a requirement for becoming a priestess. Otherwise, Alexei might be dead. Her voice trembled. I turned my back on that potion for two seconds, Kiara sniffed. Gabby must have assumed I was making it for myself. I wish I had been. Don't say that, Emma said, and she took Kiara into a hug. If you had, you would have died, because none of us knew how to save you. You saved Alexi's life. Tear streaks lined Kiara's face as she drew away from Emma. Her face had gone from incredible pain to absolutely enraged. I want in, she said. I want to take Gabby and Elijah down. Stefan's eyebrows shot up. I thought you wanted nothing to do with it, that it went against your morals. I've changed my mind. Kiara snapped. We need to deal with her. I don't care how. If we do it, we have to eliminate them before the coronation, I said slowly. Once they're king and queen, they'll practically be untouchable. Fine. I'll do whatever it takes, Kiara said thickly. I'll break the law. I'll use dark magic. So long as that bitch goes down and takes him with her. I looked around. We probably shouldn't be talking about this out in the open. Good, because I was going to search her room, Kiara said. Who's with me? I'm in, Delmare said without pause. Emma nodded firmly. Theo became the voice of reason. You want to search her dorm? Now? Gabby is doing something. She's using something to make herself so powerful, Kiara raged. Why do we keep waiting around to find out what it is? Let's investigate before she hurts anyone else. It was in the middle of the day, which made it risky, but most students weren't in the dorms. They were messing around elsewhere in Dolinska, enjoying the weekend. Kiara was right. We had to investigate just what made Gabby so powerful, and we wouldn't stop until we figured out what she was hiding. All right, I confirmed. Let's go. We hustled to the dorms. Thankfully, the halls were vacant once we got there. I lockpicked Gabby's dorm when we arrived, hoping to the gods she wasn't there. How'd you learn to do that? Theo asked. I shrugged casually, and the look Stefan gave me was burning. Emma peeked inside. It's clear. She's gone. I figured as much. People didn't linger around the scene once they'd committed a crime. Gabby had probably headed into Delinska once she'd poisoned Alexei so she could play the innocent if she became a suspect. Stefan and Theo stood watch, while the rest of us ducked inside. The girls and I rummaged for Gabby's things, searching for anything incriminatory she might be using. Find anything? I asked the girls. I'd searched Gabby's dresser and found nothing but clothes. Emma and Delmare were both going through her closet. Uh, besides the bitch's vibrator? No, Delmare spat. The closet's clean. Kiara pulled open drawers on Gabby's desk. She grew more and more frantic, her fingers moving at a delirious pace as her eyes begged to find a clue. We looked under the rug, through the bed, and in the bathroom, but nothing incriminatory could be discovered. We turned her room upside down and didn't find a single clue. Kiara was still running around, tossing pillows which Delmare had to replace to their original spots. There has to be something, she said, 
her eyes frantic. Kiara, there's nothing in here. Come on. Emma forcibly hauled her away from Gabby's bed. After putting everything back in place, we slipped out of there as quickly as we could and left the dormitories behind us. Stefan and Theo followed us to the outer lawn of the university, where the gardens were. It was empty, save for a couple of girls gossiping around twenty feet away. We took a spot near one of the fountains and turned our backs to the school, keeping our voices low. I don't get it, Stefan said. To find nothing doesn't make any sense. What if the object is on her? I said. I don't think so. The dark necklace nearly killed me to wear for a few hours. It was draining, Emma said. Even if Gabby has unseelie blood, she'd have to be wearing a pretty powerful piece to wield the magic she's been using, and I don't see how she could 24-7 without killing herself. Maybe she really is that powerful, Delmare said glumly. In which case, we're screwed. Not possible. Not for her age. She has to be getting her power from somewhere, I said. If it's not an object, it has to be something else. A potion, maybe? Delmare said. Kiara's face was like stone. Potions don't give you this kind of power. The only thing I know that can enable the magic she's using comes from the gods. There was a ringing silence. Do you think she's performing some unseelie ritual to Droga? Delmare asked. Possibly, Kiara said. If she has unseely blood. Emma bit her lip. During the tournament, Malona came to me and blessed me. I think the reason I'm so strong is that she gives me some of her power. What if it works the same way with Gabby and Droga, except he expects something in return? How do you know about this stuff? Stefan crossed his arms, looking suspicious. Kiara and I have been deciphering this grimoire that I bought from her sister's shop. It's unseely. Emma explained. She reached into her bag and pulled out a black book, holding it up. We just read a page yesterday where unseely spells are most powerful when used under the light of a full moon. Maybe Gabby is only performing the ritual once a month. Are you thinking of something specific? I asked. Kiara and Emma shared a glance. There was a ceremony we translated in the grimoire, Emma said, but it's brutal. It requires animal sacrifice. In return, Droga promises to give you some of his abilities. It would explain how Gabby's able to pull off such incredible illusions. We barely considered it because we didn't think even Gabby would go that far. But after what happened with Alexi, it shows she's willing to do anything. There was a twisting in my gut. Gabby's not opposed to getting her hands dirty. She killed Christina during the tournament joust, I reminded her. That was during the contest. Death was expected. This is different, Emma insisted. It's cold-blooded murder to do what she did to Alexi. It's not like Gabby to be generous unless she's getting something in return. Why doesn't Eli do the ritual? Stefan asked, disgust in his tone. He'd love getting his hands on that kind of magic. Kiara shook her head. Companions aren't as magically talented as marked are. The ceremony probably doesn't work on him. I ran a hand through my hair. This might be our ticket out of this mess. You're right. If we can get proof of her using dark magic, we can present it to the circle. They'll kick Gabby and Elijah off the throne, Emma said quickly. The next full moon is on April 7th, Kiara said. The only question is, who's going to follow her? One thing's for sure. We can't go as a group, Emma spoke up. Gabby's too clever. She'll catch us at it. The more people we have the easier it'll be for her to spot us. I'll follow her. Alone, I volunteered. It'll give us a better chance of not getting caught. Stefan gave me a look. He knew what that meant. The Phantom was coming out to play. Are you sure? Kiara asked. Positive, I said. I'll tail her and report back to you guys on what I found. Then we'll finally have an answer to this mystery. Time seemed to pass at a crawl. The night of the next full moon, I stood on the rooftop of Arcania University, dressed as the Phantom. It was near midnight, and I was surveying the entrances, scouting to see which one Gabby would emerge from. She's leaving her dorm, I heard Emma say to me from afar. Her telepathy magic echoed to me from down below. She knew I was looking for Gabby. 
but she didn't know it was the phantom who was on the hunt. I see her, I said. Gabby was walking down the main pathway, toward the exit that led to the forest. I scaled down from the tallest tower and went to follow her, leaping from balustrade to balcony as quickly as I could. Just as I was about to jump off the roof and follow Gabby into the woods, I felt something grab my ankle and yank me backward. I fell forward onto my face. Tiles smashed underneath me as the roof cracked. I turned on my back and saw none other than the white rose above me. She'd lassoed an illusion spell around my ankle and knocked me down. I gritted my teeth. You're not getting in the way this time. I'd forged a fun new toy to add to my arsenal. Throwing knives. I tossed the knives one by one, aiming them at the white rose. She rolled to the side, avoiding each awl, and they clattered against the shingles. You'll have to be quicker than that, she said. The white rose shot out a blast of telepathy that blew me backward, nearly knocking me off the roof. I staggered and only kept my balance by grabbing onto a railing and swinging myself upward. The white rose approached, her hands burning with magic. So she was a woven. Interesting. I pulled my body forward, and the white rose circled around me slowly. Hmm. <laughs> Too bad you didn't fall. I think I like you underneath me. Her words were spoken sultry and slow, and I felt a stirring in my pants. By the gods, I felt attracted to her. What kind of trickery was this? Emma was my mate, for the gods' sake. How could I betray her like this, having feelings for a woman who was my arch-nemesis? It was sickening that the white rose could get inside my head in such a vile way. I went to attack, but the white rose ducked to the side. She shot balls of illusion magic at me, blue in color. I avoided their strikes, but the spells were cast so quickly I couldn't touch her without getting hit. I glanced backward. I'd already wasted so much precious time. If I didn't catch up with Gabby now, I'd lose her. I don't have time for this. I'd deal with the White Rose later. I had to know what Gabby was planning. I darted for the edge of the roof. I withdrew my grappling hook so I could use it to swing down and get the hell away from the White Rose. Ethan, don't! I heard the White Rose cry, and she flung out her fingers. I turned at the last second and didn't have time to throw up a shield to block her casting. As her spell wrapped around me, I immediately knew it was a binding hex. My limbs froze up, becoming paralyzed. I fell backward like a statue, collapsing onto the roof. My eyes were the only part of me unfrozen as I glanced around, looking for a way out of this. The white rose stood over me. Her lips were dispassionate as she uttered, I'm sorry. This was the only way. She fled. I wrestled with her magic, but I couldn't move. By the time thirty minutes had passed, I gave up. Gabby was long gone by now, and even if I got out of this, I had no way to tail her without getting caught. I lay on my back for hours, frozen by the binding spell. While I was there, I had time to think. Why was I so useless at fighting this woman? It was like my body rebelled at the thought of hurting her. And that was the problem. The idea had crossed my mind before, but I'd thrown it out and ceased to consider it because I knew how ridiculous it was. But now, there was no denying it. At this point, I was certain that Emma was the White Rose. The White Rose shot blue balls of magic at me, the same kind Emma had used in the duel during the King's contest. Not to mention... The White Rose and I shared an attraction. She knew how to fight me. She knew how to beat me. She anticipated my every move without fail. She knew wherever I was at most times, and she also knew my name. How else could she have all that information and be a stranger to me? No, it wasn't possible. She'd shown up in seconds once I went after Gabby. What other alternative was there? But if Emma was the White Rose... Why was she protecting Gabby and the Black Claw? This went against everything we'd been working for. Was she playing both sides? Either way, if Emma was behind all this, she knew I was the Phantom and that we were fated mates. She knew I'd been lying to her for months. Was this her way of getting back at me? And if that was true, what was the deal with all the fooling around we'd been doing? 
How could we share such intimate moments in the carriage one minute, then try to kill each other the next? I had no answers, but I intended to get them. To do so, I needed to confront Emma. Chapter 16 Emma I had been planning to come clean and tell Ethan about the White Rose. Then Gabby had poisoned Alexi. That had changed everything. I wanted to find out what Gabby was doing as badly as the rest of us did, but I knew if I let Ethan get too close, Gabby's warnings would cease and she'd take action. She'd turn him in if she didn't kill him outright. Alexi's near death was proof she wasn't fucking around. I'd left Ethan on the rooftop and planned to follow Gabby myself into the woods, but I'd lost the trail early on. Our fight had taken enough time for her to escape. We still had another opportunity at the next full moon. We had to wait a month, but that would give me time to work on a plan, so we could spy on Gabby without her working out I was betraying her. It felt like I was playing both sides of the chessboard and it was maddening. I couldn't do this for much longer. It was driving me insane. Gabby cornered me in the hall after I left protection against dark magic. She put up an arm, blocking me from going forward. I sneered. What do you want? Good job on stopping Ethan the other night, she said. I knew you had it handled. I stepped back violently. Not like I wanted to. It was a good thing you did. I had several cultists waiting for him. If you hadn't prevented him from following me, he would have run right into a trap and gotten a couple of crossbow bolts right through the torso. Gabby purred. He wouldn't be getting up from that. My heart stuttered in fear. Gabby was serious. She'd planned to kill Ethan that night if I hadn't stopped him. I no longer regretted my decision to prevent him from following her. Want to go after him like you did Alexi? I threw at her. He nearly died due to that yarrow you slipped him. Gabby raised an eyebrow. And? It was a pity he didn't. I despise weak griffins. You're a monster. Thank you, Gabby purred. I'll make sure to finish the job next time. You try to hurt my friends again, there will be hell to pay. I threatened. What are you going to do? Gabby let out a cold laugh. You can't even land your jumps lately. Why should I be afraid of a simpering little thing like you? I've beaten you before and I'll beat you again, I warned. I'd like to see you try, Gabby challenged. If we ever go head to head again, I'll call upon Droga and we'll see which of our deities is stronger. And it won't be your little goddess. My cheeks burned. She was such a bitch. What were you doing in the woods? I snapped. You're more powerful than you're letting on and it's not because you're good at magic. Gabby's tone cooled. I don't think it's your job to know, she replied. I'm running out of patience, Sosna. Ethan is becoming a nuisance. Next time he might not be so lucky. Why should I bother to continue working for you after what you did to Alexi? I hissed. What's stopping me from marching up to Ethan and telling him everything? Gabby's next words were chilling and cruel. If Ethan finds out about us working together, I will kill him, Sosna. And I'll take my time enjoying it. I might even make you watch. The Black Claw works for me and the circle is in my pocket. You have nowhere to go and no one who will help you. The only reason the two of you are still alive is because you might prove useful. Don't forget, I hold all the cards now. She swept away. I was shaking. From rage or fear, I didn't know. I couldn't keep up this charade forever. Sooner or later, I'd have to pick a side. I feared no matter what I chose, Ethan would suffer for it. He was in the cafeteria. I felt the need to be by him. I hurried there as fast as I could without drawing suspicion to myself. I felt a twinge of pain in my enlarged spleen as I walked, but I ignored it. I'd been seeing Miroslava for my CVID and had become one of her patients. She was an excellent doctor though she told me I needed to get rid of my stress if I was going to start feeling any better. Get rid of stress? Ah! Like that was going to happen. Once I got to the dining hall, I slipped onto the bench next to Ethan. Without a word, I leaned against him. 
He bristled at my touch, but softened when he felt how cold my skin was. Emma, you're shivering. Ethan put his arm around me and held me close. I closed my eyes and tried to enjoy it, but all I saw was Gabby's smug face. What I'd give to be able to punch her in the nose. Ethan brushed back my hair. Do you want me to get you something? Please. I didn't feel like I could eat right now, but I had to get some food in me. Ethan got up, and I busied myself with playing with the frayed ends of my uniform. This vigilante crap was going to make me lose it. Ethan slid a plate of gluten-free creamy ricotta in front of me, one of my favorites. He was such a hero. My appetite returned as I smelled the delicious sauce and cheese. You seem spooked, Ethan said as I dug into my food. Ran into Gabby in the hallway, I told him. She clearly has it out for me. I confronted her about poisoning Alexi and she admitted to it. Ethan scowled. There must be something we can do to get her off that throne, or at least kicked out of this school. Unless you want to ruin their coronation celebration, I don't think that's happening, I said. Ethan's eye twitched like he was actually considering it. Maybe. There was something on Ethan's mind, I could tell. He had that look on his face he always got when he was contemplating something deeply. What's bothering you? I asked. Ethan paused. He drummed his fingers on the table before he leaned in. You've heard the rumors going around about a second vigilante in Dolinska, the one following the phantom around. It's all over the papers. I froze. The White Rose had been pretty popular in the tabloids since I'd first put the costume on. I tried to ignore the articles because they gave me anxiety. But every day, there were students in the school hallways whispering rumors about the masked caper who followed the phantom around like a ghost. Ethan was giving me this deep stare, one that was stern and drilled right down to my core. It was the kind of look that said to fess up, one a dominant would give their submissive. It was as sexy as it was scary. I want to call him daddy, I thought, and I mentally smacked myself. Damn it, not now. Think, Emma, think. I thought you didn't care about the phantom, I said. To buy myself time, I took a bite, though the food had lost its taste. I don't really, Ethan said. I could hear the clear lie in his tone. But I think it's interesting that this new vigilante is a woman. Do you have any idea who she could be? Shit. Shit, shit, shit! He knew I was the White Rose. I could fucking tell by the darkness in his eyes. He just didn't want to give himself away. I knew I wasn't careful enough the last time I confronted him. How would I know? I asked. It's not like I know the girl. I don't know. You've been up pretty late most nights. I thought you might have seen something. He said flatly. I pushed my food and got up from the table. I'm not feeling well, Ethan. I have to go. I ran off. Ethan's eyes were watching me as I left the cafeteria. I needed a plan. I needed a plan now. If Gabby heard, if Gabby found out. My eyes caught Delmare. She was working on a painting in the courtyard, her cheeks smudged with paint and her eyes concentrating. She was the one person I could trust. I rushed to her. Mayor, I need to talk to you. She turned on her stool and looked me up and down. What's wrong with you? You look like you've been ridden hard and put away wet. I made a skeptical noise. I fucking wish. She began to pack up her painting. I'll drop this off at Professor Jacosta's class. Where do you want me to meet you? My dorm, I said. It's an emergency. My white rose costume was spread out on my bed when Delmare walked in. Her jaw dropped open and she whispered, Holy shit. Lock the door, I said quietly. Delmere did, then ran to the bed. She gasped in amazement as her hand trailed over the dagger. Are you fucking shitting me? You're the White Rose? Delmere said. A huge grin spread across her face. She was impressed. Yes, and Ethan's the Phantom, I said. No use concealing it. I needed her help. Delmare's mouth bobbed open for a second, then she shut it. You know what? That's not really surprising. I should have guessed. Yeah, well, he's dramatic enough to be a superhero. I ran a hand through my hair. I hoped my plan worked. 
But I don't get it. The tabloids make you guys sound like bitter rivals, Delmare protested. Why are you trying to stop Ethan from doing his thing, which is saving the city? Because Gabby, that's why, I snarled. I've been working for her. She knows Ethan is the Phantom, and she'll turn him in if I don't do what she asks. He's been on to her, but I've stopped him from making any progress. Delmare's face turned red. I'm going to shove a battle spell straight down her throat and watch her explode. Have you guys found anything on her? I asked. After Ethan had failed to follow her, the group had gotten together and decided to keep tabs on Gabby. Stefan and Delmare had volunteered, as they were the ones who had the most classes with her and Elijah. Stefan and I have been tailing her everywhere and I swear, she doesn't do anything but go to the nail salon, get her hair done, then sneak into Eli's room to fuck him, Delmare said viciously. I mean, like seriously, how many blowouts and manicures can you get in a week? I don't know what she's doing. I let out a breath. It has to be tied to the full moon, the ritual. There's no other explanation. We have to stop her. This can't go on, Em, Delmare protested. We can't stop her, because if we do, she'll kill Ethan, I pleaded. She's already tried to murder Alexi. She won't stop until he's no longer a threat, and that means he'll have to give up being the Phantom. So just tell him, Delmare argued. He'll quit playing superhero if you ask. I can't do that either. If I do, Gabby can't use me as her puppet anymore, and she'll take it out on him anyway. I sat on the bed in frustration. She's got me boxed in. I sighed. Except I think Ethan's figured it out. He knows I'm the White Rose, and if I don't convince him otherwise, Gabby will know, then he's done for. Does anyone else know about this? Delmare asked. Stefan does, I said. Delmare's eyes widened in disbelief. He put it together. He's only keeping quiet because I begged him to. Delmare raised an eyebrow. So, how are you planning to fool Ethan into thinking you're not the White Rose? She asked. I took a deep breath and stood. I grabbed the dagger off my bedside and held it out to Delmare. With an assassination attempt. Fake, of course. You're going to dress up as the White Rose and pretend to kill me. You have to make it look real, otherwise Ethan won't fall for it. Fucking hell, Emma, Delmare said. What do I look like, a sociopath? You're the only one of my friends who's got the balls to stab me, I said, and I closed her fingers over the dagger's hilt. Please do this. It's to save Ethan's life. She stared at me, as if contemplating if I really meant it. She caught onto my desperation, and Delmare took the dagger slowly. Where? Here, I pointed to my right shoulder. Make it look like you're aiming for the heart. You don't have to cut deep. When should I do it? Delmare asked, her hands skimming over the cloak. Tonight, I said. I'll get Ethan and set it up. Just be ready. I waited until the sun had set to find Ethan. He was lounging in the rec room with his legs thrown up on a coffee table, reading some sort of book for class. He felt me standing there before he saw me. Ethan put the book down and looked up. Are you ready to talk now? I felt like a child owning up to something bad I had done. Was he mad at me? I didn't have a clue. His fingers drummed on the top of the book. I wondered if he was going to spank me with it. My panties immediately got wet. Gods, Emma, focus. I swallowed down my nervousness and said, take a walk with me. We strolled outside together to the main lawn in front of the school. A few students were out and about, but not many. Ethan held his hands behind his back while I hugged myself. The clock tower was on our right. It was the easiest place to jump down from and the quickest way of escape. Gods, I hoped Delmare didn't get caught. I wanted to say something, I began. Ethan glanced down at me, seemingly unsurprised. Finally coming clean? I opened my mouth to answer. But I didn't get a chance to respond because there was a swooping sound overhead. A body came crashing down, landing on both Ethan and I. We crashed into the dirt. It was Delmare, her face covered by the mask and hood, body shrouded in the cloak. 
She looked all the part of the white rose. She raised a dagger in the moonlight. People screamed, and Ethan's face turned white. No! Ethan shouted. Delmare plunged the dagger down. I cried out when it nicked my shoulder, cutting through my sweater and drawing blood. Fuck that hurt! Ethan pushed her off of me. Delmare went flying. He'd used his shifter strength, and it sent her sailing several feet. After a moment of recovery, Delmare staggered to her feet and ran. Students pointed and yelled as she headed inside the clock tower and into the depths of the school. Ethan started as if to go after her, but I let out a groan of pain and his attention diverted to me. Emma? He exclaimed. He put a hand on my shoulder to hold the blood in. Did she get you anywhere else? No, I gasped. The pressure he put on the wound was excruciating. The tears rising to my eyes were no act. What the hell was that? Assassination attempt, he breathed. He tore the edge of his shirt and pressed it onto my wound. He put my hand on top of it and said, Hold it there. Why would someone try to kill me? I asked as Ethan slid his arms underneath me and I cried out in pain. I'm the prince, aren't I? You're my mate. Ethan floundered out as he cradled me close. We have to get you to the hospital wing. You're losing so much blood. Ethan carried me into the school, but I passed out as we headed through the double doors. So many eyes were on us as I faded into blackness, and my final thought was a prayer to Milana that the ruse had worked. I didn't wake up again until some time later. My uniform had been removed, and I was wearing a thin hospital gown. I could feel my shoulder had been bandaged, and it was too sore to move. Ethan was at my bedside, holding my hand. As I stirred, he brought my hand up to his mouth, kissing it lightly. My gods, Emma, you scared me. There were tears beating his eyes. I regretted causing him so much hurt, but it was to save him from Gabby. I'd do anything to protect him from that wicked witch. I didn't stab myself, you know, I groaned. Ethan's eyes darkened. He squeezed my hand and said, The white rose works for the black claw. They must consider me one of their enemies. That blade was meant for me, and I gladly would have taken it. Don't say that. I winced and tried to sit up. Ethan helped me, lifting me upward and placing me on top of the pillows carefully. I felt like such a tiny doll in his arms. What was that earlier about coming clean? I asked. I couldn't help it. I wanted to be sure. Ethan shook his head. It's stupid, Emma. Don't bother. My body relaxed. I'd convinced him. He thought the white rose was someone else. My plan had worked. You wanted to tell me something? Ethan began. What was it? My mouth was dry. I cleared my throat, and Ethan noticed. He had a cup of water waiting for me on the bedside table. He tilted it upward when it got to my dry lips, and I took a grateful sip. As he drew the cup away, I said, I'm worried about you, Ethan. He frowned. Don't worry about me. You're the one who got attacked. I shook my head. No. You have enemies, a lot of them, and I'm terrified one day you'll mess with the wrong person and permanently get hurt. He glanced away guiltily. My throat burned as I choked out the next words. And I don't want to live without my mate. I'm not going anywhere. He rubbed my arm affectionately, honesty in his gaze. I'll be careful, Emma, I promise. It's not enough, I insisted. You've changed since Eli won the throne, and the closer you get to him, the more danger you're in. You have to vow you won't keep messing with things that could get you hurt. I couldn't stand it if... Ethan shushed me. All right. He agreed. I won't do anything to put myself in danger. I swear to you. I settled then, though I didn't know how honest Ethan was being. I just wanted him to be safe even if Malovia would be at risk because of it. The fact of the matter was, I couldn't lose him. I loved Ethan, and if anything happened to him, I'd be lost. Though perhaps he'd keep his promise. If the White Rose couldn't stop Ethan from playing vigilante, maybe Emma could. Delmer had done a good job. The cut was thin, so it only required a few stitches. It'd heal up pretty quickly. 
I was back on my feet the next day and given the week off practice by Lady Magdalena. An alert had been put out on campus to keep an eye out for the White Rose, and extra security had been placed around the school. Delmer got away with it, and my secret identity was safe. Besides the articles in the paper about the White Rose attempting to assassinate the mate of the prince, there was no harm done. Ethan, though, acted like I'd been gutted. He hardly spoke except to reassure me that I wouldn't be attacked again. He never left my side, stalking around as a wolven to warn people off with a growl if they got too close. His eyes had a burning smolder in them which longed to find the person who'd hurt me and chew them to pieces. The next time he saw me as the White Rose, he'd tried to kill me. I was certain of it. I didn't know if I'd solved a problem or made everything worse. Unless Ethan kept his word and didn't put himself in danger by becoming the Phantom again. He'd promised, right? Delmer and I were working on a project in the library late one evening when Stefan came striding in. It was around nine or so. I'd only managed to get rid of Ethan because he had hockey practice. I'd reassured him nothing would happen to me in the bowels of the school here in the library, and he'd relented, but it hadn't been without a lot of cajoling. Stefan, apparently, had skipped practice. He took a chair and turned it around, sitting on it backwards as he leaned in to whisper to us. At this hour, we were the only people in the library, but he still kept his voice down. Okay, I know you can't duplicate yourself, Stefan said to me. You aren't that far along in your education. Spill. I sighed and rolled my eyes. Delmer dressed up as the White Rose to attack me. Gabby said if I didn't fool Ethan, she was going to hurt him. But he thinks the White Rose is someone else now, so no harm done. Stefan leveled me with a flat stare. Do you really think that's going to work long term? I don't know, I said. It's working for now. I'm making it up as I go. Look, the only way we're going to deal with Gabby and Elijah is if we work as a team, Stefan said. We can't take them down with all these secrets, all these lies. Their coronation is coming up. You should confess to Ethan before then, so we can have a solid plan to stop them. I can't, Stefan, I argued. We still don't know what makes Gabby so powerful. Until we do, revealing myself to Ethan is a risk. Stefan scowled, while Delmer gave me a sad frown. I feel so guilty, Delmer admitted. I stabbed you, bitch. You did, and you should be proud of it. I told her, I think Ethan might be considering stopping his phantom work. Stefan let out a scoffing noise. You don't know your mate very well. Ethan's got a thick head. He doesn't give up. My stomach wiggled in anxiety. He promised me. Did he promise you to stay out of trouble or to stop being a vigilante? Stefan asked. Because in his mind, those are two very different promises. My heart fell. Ethan wouldn't look for a loophole in his promise to me, would he? Look, Stefan started, you're Ethan's mate. You have an obligation to tell him everything. He owns your heart and you own his. So sorceresses are owned by shifters? Are they property? I questioned. Delmer shook her head. It's not like that. Ownership wouldn't be the right word. The term belong to would be more appropriate. A companion is his mate's, and she is his. And they have a responsibility to each other to protect that bond and sanctify the union. It's a complete surrender of yourself in love, nothing else. Delmer sighed. Or at least it's supposed to be. We all know it doesn't always work out that way. It still sounds creepy. I wrinkled my nose. Well, think of it like this. If Gabby was to come up and grab Ethan's junk, what are you gonna do about it? Stefan drolled. My ears started fuming. It was almost like I could feel steam gushing out of them. I'd tear the bitch's head from her shoulders. Precisely, Stefan said, like that explained everything. Delmer rolled her eyes. It's hardly like that. Dragons have useless and violent allegories. It got the point across, didn't it? Stefan asked. I mused over their words, thinking of how strange this world was. It was nothing like the one I'd come from. The Arcania could be backwards sometimes, even sexist. 
but there was a certain beauty to the mating laws that were truly captivating. The idea of true and undying love, regardless of circumstance or fate, was more than breathtakingly romantic. It was an incredibly risky thing to do, to place yourself fully in someone else's hands like that and trust that they wouldn't break you, would remain loyal only to you until their last breath was beautiful. I hoped that was what bloomed between Ethan and I, true love. Yet how could that kind of love grow with all these secrets? Well, you two are bickering, Delmere said, and she gathered up her things. I need to talk to Professor Jacosta. I'll see you later, Em. Delmere wandered away. Stefan's eyes were glued to her ass as she left the library. I watched him. So how are you two doing? I teased, leaning forward and giving a wink. Like shit, thank you, but we're not talking about me and her right now, Stefan said. Nice try. I frowned. I don't know what you want me to do. I'm backed into a corner here. You can't keep being scared of Gabby, Stefan hissed. She's going to do whatever she wants regardless of whether you obey her or not. She's got Ethan marked for death. She's just holding off because you're willing to play her games. Any promise she can make to you isn't one she's gonna keep, Em. I knew Stefan was right. I threw my pencil down in frustration and said, What would you do then? You need to tell Ethan you know he's the Phantom and that you're the White Rose, Stefan said. If you don't, I will. You can't, I moaned. It's too dangerous. What's dangerous is to have a wedge between you and your mate. Stefan's tone was so certain. He grabbed my arm and squeezed it as he said, I know you haven't been in this society long, so it's hard for you to understand. But there shouldn't be secrets between mates. It kills relationships. I'm bonded. I know how that feels. But you don't know the rules. Stefan frowned sadly. Ethan does. And to be honest, that he's keeping this from you for so long is kind of pissing me off. I want to see you guys happy. You both deserve it, and you can't be as long as you're hiding things from each other. Warmth ran throughout my chest. Stefan really did care about us. I wanted to say something back, thank him for his kindness. But before I could, a scream erupted from outside the library. It was coming from the hall. That sounded like Dalmer. Stefan was on his feet before I was. He raced out of the library. I left my stuff behind and followed him, running at top speed. My stomach plummeted when I saw what was happening. Andrik had Dalmer pinned against the wall. He'd wrenched an arm behind her back and was pulling up the back of her skirt uniform. He had ripped open her shirt, exposing her down the front. When she cried again for help, Andrik fisted a hand in her hair and yanked it hard. Delmer struggled as much as she could to get away, but Andrik was too strong. Tears flowed down her cheeks as Andrik forced himself against her. Magic grew in my palms and swelled out of me as I lost control. Andrik was a dead man. I was going to make him wish he was never born. I didn't get a chance because Stefan lost his shit. He ran toward Andrik and pulled him off Delmer, sending him flying twelve feet. Andrik smashed against the stone wall with so much force, bits of rubble came crumbling off. Stefan pounced before Andrik could rise and began beating the crap out of him. I heard bones in Andrik's face crack as Stefan pummeled Andrik until his face was bloody. Okay, so he had that handled. I rushed to Delmer. She was still crying. The front of her shirt was so badly ripped I couldn't fix it. Here. I yanked my sweater off my head. I had a button up underneath it, but I would have exposed my tits for the whole world to see. I just didn't care. I wanted Delmere to stop crying. She put the sweater on and wrapped her arms around herself, her mouth dropping open in horror as she watched Stefan destroy Andrik. There was blood all over the floor. Literal puddles had formed around Stefan's feet. Andrik was unrecognizable, his face a bloody mess. Stefan's hands were stained with red, a color that matched his eyes as he thirsted for Andrik's death. 
I always knew shifters were protective of their marked, but I'd never seen such violence this close up. A shiver ran over my body as Stefan leaned in and seethed. I'm going to kill you. And he would. He'd do it. That I had no doubt of. Stefan put his hands around Andrik's neck to strangle him. Miracle upon miracles, that's when Ethan happened to walk by. Stefan, Ethan cried. He ran forward and tried to yank Stefan off of Andrik. Stefan was so murderous, he threw Ethan off with one arm and continued his rampage. He was so enraged, not even Ethan could pull him back. Andrik was one of Elijah's inner circle. If Stefan killed him, there'd be hell to pay. I wanted the bastard to die, but not at the expense of Stefan's life. Someone had to stop this before there were permanent consequences. Stop! Delmer shouted. She stepped forward and cast a binding spell. Stefan halted in place, his one fist still in the air. Andrik hung limply, held up by his shirt that was bunched in Stefan's hand. Delmer forced Stefan to drop him, and Andrik landed with a thud. What is the meaning of this? A sinister voice made my skin crawl. Lady Corva had arrived along with Professor Lunesta. Corva stared with vile hatred at us, while Lunesta took in the scene with disbelief. Corva's eyes looked at Andrik, then at me. Dalmer lifted the freezing spell on Stefan. He relaxed. Though he looked like he longed to, he didn't attack Andrik again. This prickhead was trying to rape my best friend! I yelled and pointed at Andrik, who moaned on the ground. We walked in on it moments ago. Stefan was just defending her. Lunesta looked to Delmer. Is this true, Miss Delmer? Delmer nodded. Her face was pale. She was still in shock. Excuse me, but where is the evidence for this? Lady Corva questioned. If you ask me, this looks like a staged attack on an innocent student by these four ruffians. Gods, if I could slap her, her head would come flying off. She was the worst teacher ever. Think Milano, though, Lunesta wasn't tolerating Corva's bullshit. I believe Miss Delmer has reported for weeks now that Mr. Anton has been harassing her, and the school has failed thus far to follow up on it. Written reports have been made. Isn't that right, Miss Delmer? Stefan's eyes widened in shock. He looked to Delmer, who again nodded feebly. Good job, Delmer, for getting a written record. At least people couldn't deny her as easily. Corva, who couldn't have her way, merely wrinkled her nose and sneered. So is the school going to do something now? I asked. I wasn't going to let Andrik get away with this. One beating wasn't enough. An investigation will be opened, Professor Lunesta said kindly. Though this goes for Mr. Slasky as well, for assaulting a student on campus. We'll deal with both of them. An investigation? Corva scoffed. This is ridiculous. That boy is a monster. She pointed to Stefan. He deserves to be thrown out of this institution. Excuse me, Lady Corva, but Stefan Slasky and Andrik Anton are both dragons of my own faction. Lunesta said coolly. It is I who will set their punishment. Lady Corva visibly clenched her teeth. Her eyes searched for someone she could boss around, and that happened to be Ethan and I. And what are you two doing here? She snapped. Was this a planned attack, three on one? My mouth dropped open. Was she serious? This fuckhead had tried to rape Delmere, and she turned it around on us? I was just returning from hockey practice. You may ask Lord Lucian if you do not believe me, Ethan replied. And if you look at the evidence, Emma had nothing to do with this. This was not the work of a sorceress. Watch your tongue, boy. Your station means nothing anymore. Corva snarled. I felt magic blooming in my palms again. Teacher or not, Corva was going to get it for me one of these days. That just might be today. I suggest you all return to your dorms, Professor Lunesta said to us before Corva could provoke us further. We shall take Mr. Anton to the hospital wing, where, 
After he is treated, he will be questioned. Mr. Slasky, you are also to come with me. Miss Delmare, is there anything we can do for you? I suggest you come with us to the hospital wing as well. Delmare sniffed and shook her head, wiping at her nose. Lunesta frowned. Very well. Miss Sosna, will you stay with her a while? I will, I promised. It was only then Lunesta relented. Stefan kept his head down as he followed Professor Lunesta, still fuming. Lady Corva levitated Andrick behind them and sent me a cursed glance before she rounded the corner. Once the teachers were gone, Dalmer fell to pieces. She put her head in her hands and cried. It was tough to watch. Dalmer was so hardcore that it was a weird thing to see her sob, but anyone would fall apart after something like that. Mare, I said, and I put my hands on her shoulders. She didn't pull away, though she visibly cringed. Let's get her to the dormitories, Ethan said kindly. Ethan guided us back. He stood guard at the door while Delmare and I entered her dorm. She looked so upset. I didn't know what to do. I'm here for you. What can I do to help? I asked as she dashed tears away from her cheeks. I just... need a shower, Delmare said shakily. Give me a moment. I sat on Delmare's bed and waited as she washed up. Each second that passed made more anxiety grow in my stomach. Would she be okay? And what about Stefan? Would they kick him out of the university for what he'd done? A half an hour later, Delmare emerged from the shower wearing a fluffy black robe, face washed clean. It was weird to see her without the heavy black eyeliner and black lipstick she usually wore. She looked like a different person. Delmare sighed and sat next to me. She wasn't crying anymore, but her face was knotted in worry. Is Stefan back yet? She asked. I shook my head. Not yet. This is what I was afraid of, Emma. Delmare bit her lip. I didn't want Stefan to know because I knew he'd make Andrick pay. Now he's going to get kicked out of the school because of me. You did nothing, I said firmly. Andrick got what was coming to him and Lunesta knows he's a creep. She won't throw Stefan out of school. Delmare chewed at her fingernails. Well, I hope not. She won't, I said. And besides, somebody had to teach that ass a lesson, right? She smiled. Well, it was kind of nice watching Stefan kick Andrick's teeth in. Exactly, I said. Stefan turned Andrick's face into mashed potatoes. He won't bother you again, that's for sure. Delmer ran a hand through her wet hair. I didn't know Stefan could be so brutal. It was scary. Because he loves you, Mare. He risked giving up his admission at Arcania University to defend you, I said. He didn't even have to think twice. Delmer stared at the carpet introspectively. I'm just glad you guys showed up, she whispered. If Stefan hadn't stopped him. Don't finish that sentence. Nothing happened, I said. Nothing is ever going to happen to you as long as Stefan is around. She smiled slightly. Ethan knocked, then poked his head into the room. Stefan's back, he said. If you're ready, he wants to talk to you. Ethan closed the door slowly. Delmer shot up from the bed. Shit, I can't talk to him now. My hair isn't dry and I don't have any makeup on. Mare, Stefan doesn't give a shit about your makeup or hair, I shouted. Gods, this was the girl who complained about Gabby getting her nails done. Pot calling the kettle black much? He's never seen me like this, she gestured to herself. I look like a mess. You look fine. Except I suggest changing out of that robe, because if he walks in here with you wearing that, I'm sure it's gonna come off tonight, I choked. Ugh, you're right. Damer started rummaging through her clothes. What do I say to him, Emma? I don't know. Do you want to talk to him? I asked. She paused. Yes, I think I should. Then you should be honest with him about your feelings, I said, even if it's scary. She bunched a shirt into her hands and did not answer. I think she was still on the fence, and I didn't blame her. Tonight was not the time for making decisions. 
Are you okay being alone with him? I asked. She nodded. I know he's not going to hurt me. He proved that tonight. Okay, then we'll let him in. I gave her a hug. I love you, Mare. I love you too. She pushed me out the door. Now stall him so I can find something to wear. Stefan was waiting in the rec room with Ethan, standing calmly near the fireplace. Instead of rage filling his features, it was worry. How is she? He asked. His voice was strangled. She's doing better. Are you banned from school? I asked. He shook his head. Professor Lunesta knows Andrick is a piece of shit. She let me off easy with a warning. I'll be back in class next week. What he get? I asked, desiring some justice. Lunesta is going to try to get him kicked out on attempted rape charges, but it's not gonna work, Stefan said. Eli's king now, so he'll make sure his buddy doesn't face any consequences. Forget about him, Ethan said. You should talk to Delmare, work things out. Stefan's face cleared. Does she want to speak to me? Yes, she needs you right now, I said. Go. Stefan headed to Delmare's room. He opened the door with a bit of hesitation, but once he saw her face, I watched him relax. I didn't feel relief until he'd shut the door behind him. Ethan's face was stony. I knew I shouldn't have left you alone tonight. Mare was attacked, not me, I told him. Andrick's been targeting her for months. Yes, but now the White Rose is targeting you, Ethan replied. I know she's in this school somewhere. And until she's taken care of, you're not safe. I knew what taken care of meant. I also knew Ethan was serious. But I was serious about keeping him away from Gabby. And I was wondering how much longer this game could go on before it blew up in both of our faces. I wish I knew how to minimize the collateral damage. Chapter 17 Ethan how could I have assumed Emma was the White Rose? I was so foolish. Now a deranged woman was running around campus and she was targeting my mate. Not for long, though. I'd find the White Rose and make her pay for what she did to Emma. There'd be no chance of escape this time. I was hunting her down. Rain was coming down hard over the university that evening, pattering relentlessly against the roof. Emma, Kiara, Alexei, and I were in one of the private study rooms on campus. All that could be heard was the turning of yellow pages as Kiara read by candlelight. The scratching of Emma's quill echoed against the walls as she worked on translating the grimoire. Alexei slept on a large red velvet pillow near Kiara's feet as a griffin, his golden feathers rising up and down. None of us felt comfortable returning to the library after what had happened with Delmare. It would seem there were all kinds of monsters roaming around the school, waiting to kill us all. Emma stopped writing. Her furrowed brow caused Kiara to look up from her book. What? she asked. Emma handed a piece of parchment to Kiara. This spell, it seems twisted and wrong. Kiara read it. She took a long time her eyes scanning the paper before she glanced at Alexei once, then gave it to me. It is different, isn't it? I read the spell, though it was more like a curse. Take a crystal, and by light of the moon, cut your finger and press the blood onto the stone. As you do so, infuse the stone with your malice, your hatred, and recite the spell, With this intention I cause thy to feel my suffering, with this sacrifice I cause thy to feel my pain. Gift the stone to your enemy. Wait for the effects. Kiara played with the crystal around her neck as I read. Alexei slept on. Emma took the parchment back and said, I know we aren't sure what it does specifically, but whatever it is sounds awful. The spell is probably based on the caster's suffering, Kiara murmured. Its effect is harnessed through how much anger the user puts into the stone. The grimoire's only been helpful, Emma stated. I can't believe something like this is in it. Well, it is a book of unseely magic, I said. It shouldn't shock you there are curses within it. Emma shivered. I think that's enough translating for one night. 
She closed the grimoire and folded up the hex, tucking it between the pages. She rubbed her eyes and let out a yawn. It's late, Em. We should be getting off to bed, I said, feeling worn myself. It's not that late, Emma protested, giving another yawn. Only one in the morning, Kiara said fairly. What? No. Emma checked her watch and groaned. It is one in the morning, and I have practice tomorrow. Fuck. We better get off to sleep. Coming, Kiara? I asked. She shook her head and stroked Alexei's feathers. I'll be here a little longer. All right. Good night, then. Emma and I walked to the dormitory hand in hand, though I was more or less pulling her along behind me. I don't want to go to bed. I'm not tired, Emma said. Yes, you are, I gave her a knowing smile. You can barely keep your eyes open. So, that's nothing new. I can be exhausted, but that doesn't mean I'll get any rest. She gave another yawn. I can never sleep, even on the days that I turn in early. My body just doesn't let me. What do you mean? My tone was sorrowful. I don't know. I'll lie there for hours in pain, wishing I could pass out just to get a few hours of reprieve. Most nights I've been falling asleep around 4 a.m. It's an awful cycle. She sighed. I bet if I go back to my dorm now, it'll just be another restless night. How about a distraction? I offered. Something to calm your mind? Emma tilted her head inquisitively. What is it? I'll show you. I took the stairs upward. We wound them to the highest floor of the castle until we came to a door at the far end of a deserted hallway. I opened it cautiously. Emma's mouth dropped open as she looked on. I'd taken her to the rooftop of the dormitories. A large, flat area spread out before us, with pitched towers rising up to create a backdrop. The stars glistened overhead, while the waning crescent moon shone down from above. From here, you could see all of campus, as well as the glittering lights of Dolinska in the distance. A wooden bench was placed before an intricate railing for observation. Emma stepped to the railing and put her hands on it. Ethan, this is beautiful. I come up here to think. It's off limits for students, but they make an exception for me. I rummaged through a wooden trunk and pulled out a large blanket. I hung it around Emma's shoulders and said, in case you get cold. Emma sat on the bench. I sat beside her, and she offered me half of the blanket. I didn't need it, but took it anyway, just to be close to her. The blanket wrapped around us tightly, and Emma leaned into my shifter heat, looking out into the transfixing city beyond. I could stay up here forever, just watching the city, Emma said. I can see why you love it so much. My hands reached out to take hers. I'll always love Dolinska and its people. Truth be told, Malovia will always be my first love. Emma squeezed my hands. What do you want to be, now that you're no longer going to be king? The question stung, but I knew it was coming. I would be graduating next year from university with a degree in political science. She wanted to know my plans. Unfortunately, I didn't have any. I'm not sure, to be quite honest. My whole life I was raised to compete in the king's contest, raised to become a leader, become an alpha. Everything I did was based around having control over every situation. I raked a hand through my hair. And then... I lost my leg, and everything I thought I had control over completely got out of hand. My world turned upside down overnight, and I realized I was in control of nothing. Realized just how much we're all at the mercy of the gods, for better or for worse. Emma's eyebrows knitted together. That's not true. The gods give us a choice. I sighed. I feel I don't have any choice in how my destiny calls me, Honawilke. If anything... I'm a boat at the mercy of a ragged sea. She became silent and I forged on. I'll probably focus on charity work. My work as a prince will never be done. I'll always be expected to attend events and public functions. I sighed. Though, if you want my honest opinion, I'm tired of the endless parading. I just want to get out of here and travel. See the world. I've been a poor monster hunter as of late, and because of it, I just want to stretch my woven legs and run, let myself be carried far away from fey politics into the rest of the world where those things don't matter. But you love Malovia so much. 
almost too much. I've worried often that love would destroy me, so I long to do what any wolf does when they're injured, seek isolation. Emma nodded introspectively, and I nudged her. What about you? I asked. You haven't chosen a major. You have time, but I'm curious what your interests are. I don't know what to choose. I've never wanted to be anything but a skater. Emma shivered, and I brought her closer. But we all know intuitively to have a backup plan. Most girls do, just in case. But I can never bring myself to pick another career choice, though I know skating can't last forever. I fear if I decide to do something else, even as a safety net, it'll ruin my chances, jinx it somehow. And I want this so badly, I can't let my dreams go. There must be something else you want to do, I said. I love hockey, but I know it's not forever. My body will only allow me to play professionally for so long. You must know that's the truth with skating as well. Emma's expression turned uncomfortable. Yes, but I don't want to admit it. I know my body is going to make me stop, yet I can't face that reality. Skating is all I've ever loved. She shrugged. Though I don't have much of an interest in coaching once I retire. I'm looking into international relations. I love to travel, and it's been such an amazing experience coming to Malovia and experiencing an entirely different culture. I'd like to negotiate peace treaties between nations. There's so much bad in the world. Maybe I can help there to be less of it. That would have been a good major for her rule as queen, if we hadn't lost that opportunity. Perhaps once I graduate, we can find a small cottage somewhere, a place that's far away from everyone else, Emma mused. We can travel, and when we're back home, we'll just hide away so no one can find us. People will forget you're a prince. It sounded nearly perfect. I brushed her hair back and said, I'd like that. After we're married, Emma stiffened. Had I offended her? Is there something wrong? I asked, hoping that there wasn't. Well, no, Emma said, in a tone that implied there was. It's just strange to think of us in that way. You didn't officially propose, and we haven't known each other that long. I know we're engaged, but it doesn't feel that way. I want to know the darker side of you before I take that step. The darker side of me? Whatever did she mean? Do you have doubts? She shook her head. No, I know you're the person I want to marry. Then what was holding her back? I went to ask another question, but Emma cut me off before I could. When are you thinking of getting married? When you're ready. But if I had my way, it'd be within the next two years. You're my mate. I see no point in waiting. Emma pondered that. I want to wait, if only to get to know you better, she said. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. There's no rush. I brought her hands up to my face to kiss them. I will never rush you into anything, Ona Wilke. You have my heart. Whatever you ask of me, you shall have. I obey your every command. Emma took in a breath and held it. Something flashed across her gaze I couldn't read. What is it? I just... Emma paused. What's between us is mysterious, but so magical. I can't understand why some sorcerers and shifters break their bonds. Was she implying she knew we were true mates? Or just acknowledging we'd chosen one another? I rushed into my next sentence before she could question further. Rejecting a bond isn't just a decision. You have to go through a magical ceremony to break the magic that binds two parties. It's an irreversible choice. Once the magic is gone... There's no restoring it back to what it was. I didn't know there was a ceremony. Her eyes widened. Yes. The gods want you to be absolutely sure you are making the right decision, I said. It's incredibly painful and rare. But why would someone put themselves through that kind of agony? Situations like abuse, infidelity sometimes. Divorce is illegal amongst the Arcania unless you break the bond first. Most people prefer to work it out rather than go through that pain. It has to be a terrible situation for that to occur. It feels like you're tearing your soul in half. Emma bit her lip. Well, that has to be better than getting beat up all the time. I refuse to be with someone like that. I'd walk out. Shifters who abuse their sorceresses aren't worthy of life. They deserve to be taken out and hanged, I said vengefully. I could never hit you on a wilke. I would die first. 
There's no one I wouldn't harm to protect you. And I trust you on that. Her gaze was kind. You're a formidable shifter, but you're gentle with me. As a mate should be. The lights of the city were sparkling in her eyes as she asked, Ethan, will you tell me about what happened after you lost your leg? My eyes widened. Why do you want to know? Because I've heard so many things from so many people, but I want to hear it from you, she said. What matters to me is how you felt, so I can take that into account and be sensitive if something's bothering you. She didn't want to trigger me. That was very sweet of her. I hated talking about those cursed months last summer, but this was Emma. I could open up to her. I can't remember much of it if I'm being truthful. I woke up in the hospital a few days later, looked down, saw that my leg was gone. I sighed heavily. The next thing I was told was my father had died. I'm so sorry, Ethan. It must have been horrible for you. It was terribly traumatic. Admitting the words out loud, instead of endlessly repeating them in my head, made a part of myself heal. I tried to keep a straight face for my mother and for my country, but my grief was plain to see. There were so many stories from the reporters about how miserable I looked, pushing myself in that wheelchair after my father's casket as the funeral procession marched through Dolinska. I think that was the worst part of it, how I was expected to keep it together when all I wanted to do was fall apart. And that was exactly how I felt, because I'd come back with pieces of me missing. Hot tears began to well against my eyelids. I felt so bitter. Not for myself, but for my father and the years he'd lost. He still had a long life to live, and it'd been wrenched away from him. Emma laid a hand on my back. If it helps, you've always seemed whole to me. Because you can't see what's underneath. I get phantom pains in my leg daily. I know it's not really there, but sometimes I can still feel the lachane biting through the bone. I winced, as if I could feel it now. It's just my mind playing tricks on me, a fanciful illusion, though it doesn't stop my brain from thinking my leg is throbbing at the worst times. Why haven't you ever told me? Emma's eyes narrowed in concern. I'm pretty good at keeping a mask on, Ona Wilke. I don't let it slip, not even to myself, I said. I took a breath. Sometimes, if I pretend like something's not happening to me, I can convince myself it isn't. I can never forget that I'm an amputee, but I can act like it doesn't affect me. That's not true. I can tell it bothers you, Ethan. It's written in your eyes every day, Emma said softly. I hated that I couldn't hide it from her or anyone else. I realize that, Emma, and it kills me. I know at some point I'll adjust and become accustomed to it, but I'm resisting because I've had to adapt to everything since my father died. It gets old, having to change all that you knew. Nothing's the same anymore. I want to fight for a little normalcy, even if it's already gone. Then fight for a new normal, Emma said. There's no use looking back or looking ahead. The only moment that matters is now, and what's going to make you feel comfortable with your disability in this moment? That's the thing, though, Emma. I can't get comfortable, I protested. My prosthetic is top of the line, but I still get sores and discomfort from using it, especially if it's more than I should be. There are more days than not I'm walking around in pain. I scowled. I know it's because I should be resting my leg and taking time off from my prosthetic, but I hate having it off. I don't feel whole without it. I feel like less of a man. But you aren't, though. Emma moved closer. You're just a person, like the rest of us. I shouldn't be complaining. I'm the lucky one. I lost my leg. My father lost his life, I said. And I'm responsible for that. You're not responsible. You have survivor's guilt, Emma said. Don't blame yourself for that. My shoulders tensed. I hate knowing I have something that sets me apart. I never wanted to be different. I grew up as a royal. I'd never been excluded. Then that cursed Lachane changed everything, and I became an outcast in my own home. Someone who had nothing to offer. A cripple with no value. You want to know what I hate? Emma asked. When people say, if you don't have your health, what do you have? My health is shit, 
And you know what? I have a lot. I have my friends and my school and you and all the things I ever dreamed of doing. I'm still a whole person even though I'm sick. I think it's quite discriminatory to say that if someone isn't healthy, they have nothing. Because with so many disabled people in the world, that's just not the truth. I don't have to be healthy to have value. Emma looked at me. And that's true for you as well. You're whole despite what you lost, on the inside and the outside. Having a disability can be awful. It can be gut-wrenching and painful and cruel. Emma shrugged. And then sometimes, it's just another day. I'm starting to think that my body's just different from everyone else's, and not necessarily in a bad way. It functions in a way that requires more care and more creativity, but that doesn't mean my body is wrong or undeserving. Her words inspired hope in me. You think so? Why not? My medicine is a tool to help me function. You don't have a leg, so you use a tool to get around. It puts you apart from other people, but doesn't make you inferior. Like what you said once about Unseely and Seely Fay. You don't know better, you just know different. She kicked out her legs. I think Stefan was onto something when he said we needed to stop comparing ourselves. I'm sick of comparing myself to healthy, able-bodied people because I'm never going to be one and I can't judge myself by that standard. I live a completely different lifestyle. What they can do can't match up to my own barriers. When did you get so wise? I didn't. I accepted reality. She tore her eyes away from the skylines to look at me. I have to be okay knowing I'm different and become accustomed to possibly living a short life. Ona Wilke, don't talk like that. But I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of living a life that doesn't mean anything, Emma said. To live and be forgotten without making my mark on the world. I want to change people's lives while I'm here, even if the only extraordinary life I get to live is my own. I fear nothing but losing you, I confessed. Everything else has been taken from me. You're all I have in the world, Ona Wilke, which is why you're going to die a very old lady next to me in my bed, and not any time sooner. She gave a coy smile. Is that an order from my Alpha? Yes, and you'd better obey it. I squeezed her tightly to me. Gods, to think of her death. Never. I wouldn't permit myself to fantasize about such a nightmare. Emma let out another yawn. Finally getting tired, I asked. Yes, which is strange. I think I can finally rest with you by my side. I know how you feel. I've been an insomniac myself since my father died. The first few weeks I slept all day and stayed awake all night. I couldn't rest during the night. One of the reasons I became the Phantom. I was tired of lying in my bed, begging for sleep and gaining none, terrified of the terrors I'd received once I closed my eyes. My dreams were full of images of my father's death. I had to get up and do something to stop them. I was keenly aware of Emma pressing her nose into my shirt to inhale my scent. There's nothing quite like watching the sun come up after a long night with no sleep, is there? No, nothing. I pulled her up from her seat. We've been up here long enough. Come, now it's really time for bed. Emma obediently followed, and the weight of our former conversation pressed in around us. As we reached my door, she turned toward me. I don't want to sleep alone tonight, she said. I want to be with you. I cocked an eyebrow. Girls aren't permitted in boys' dormitories after dark, Ona Wilke. I've never been very good at following the rules, she cooed and batted her eyelashes. I swallowed. She was mischievous and had a plan. She was totally up to something. Well, I'm not one to refuse a lady. Emma spends the night in Ethan's room. She reveals her infusion scars to him, and he, in turn, shows her his true self without his prosthetic. She is the first one to ever see him this way. They share an intimate moment together. I wasn't one for losing control, but Emma was my weak spot. I was tough on the exterior, but when she touched me, each part of me melted. The fierce woven became meek, and even the phantom longed to remove his mask and come into the light. That's what Emma did to me, 
made me vulnerable, and that was the most dangerous part about her. When she came back, she didn't put any clothes on. She slipped underneath the covers and pressed herself against my body, nestling her head onto my chest. Ethan, Emma whispered. It was like she was on the verge of spilling secrets out of her that she'd kept inside for too long. Not tonight, Donna Wilke. I kissed the top of her head. Rest. She quieted, and for that I was grateful. I was too vulnerable at that moment. If she spoke again, all my secrets would come tumbling out, and I'd tell her I was the Phantom. I'd break my own promise not to let her in. Though I was certain I already had, for that night, Emma fell asleep in my arms. We were woken from our sleep by a horrible screeching noise. It was blood-curdling, yanking me from my dreams into a reality of a nightmare. Emma startled next to me. I sat up so fast it caused the blood to rush to my head, and I went dizzy. The wicked screaming continued. Emma scrambled out of bed, but I grabbed her wrist. Emma, wait for me. I hurried to fasten my prosthetic. Once I had it on and thrown on some pants, I rushed after her. I didn't bother to put on a shirt, though thankfully Emma had slipped on a pair of my pajamas so she didn't go running into the hall in her underwear. Many students were clustered outside, sleepy and alarmed. We hadn't been the only ones awakened by the horrible wails. People looked around, confused as to where it was coming from. It was still dark outside. Only hours had gone by since Emma and I had passed out. A door sprung open. Gabby's dorm. She came crashing out, scratching at her arms. Black spots like burns were spreading over her skin. She itched at them frantically, trying to get them to stop. My stomach turned watching her. The black spots bloomed like mold, eating away at her skin. They spread from her neck up to her cheekbones, growing over her body and morphing it into nothing but pain. Gabby's eyes turned pitch black, and she screamed even louder. Her friends, Melissa and Morgan, didn't rush to help her, only watched in horrified terror. The only one who went to aid her was Elijah. He was in nothing but his boxers as he ran to his mate. He went to touch her, but his fingers on her arm must have caused pain, because Gabby screamed even harder. She began sobbing, her fingernails bloody as she tore at her skin, trying to get the black blossoms out. Get the hell out of the way, Elijah snarled. He picked Gabby up in his arms, though she wailed in agony and carried her out of the dormitory. Even as she left, you could hear her desperate cries from the first floor, pleading for Eli to make it stop. Many students were ashen. A couple looked like they might throw up, but no one went back to sleep. My eyes were stuck on Kiara. She'd watched the whole scene with a satisfied smile on her face. Emma reacted before I did. She stomped forward. As people turned to conversation, gossiping about what could have happened, Emma yanked Kiara into her dorm. I had seconds to slip in after her. What the hell did you do? Emma hushed in a low voice. My heart thudded in fear, wishing this wasn't what I thought it was. Kiara's expression was cold. I taught Gabby a lesson. She won't lay a finger on Alexi ever again. Gods, Kiara, does she know it was you? I choked out. Kiara would be expelled. No, I cast the curse when everyone was in bed and got rid of the evidence after, Kiara hissed. I'm not stupid enough to get caught. But they're going to suspect us, I shouted. Let them, Kiara shrugged. I'm tired of being on the losing side. They've done so much, but there's never any proof to confirm it, so we can never catch them. I decided to take a page out of their book and do the same. I can't believe you did this. It isn't like you, Emma said weakly. I agreed. Kiara was so shy, sweet and soft. The person before us was ruthless. It was hard to picture her in such a way. The spell isn't going to kill her. It's just a warning, Kiara seethed. Next time, she won't be so lucky. Kiara, you can't do this again, Emma pleaded. It's wrong, even for Gabby. I will do anything to protect Alexi, Kiara snapped. She finally got a taste of her own medicine. Maybe now she'll leave us alone. Gabby would never leave us alone. This would only make her retaliate further. Hide the grimoire, I told Emma, turning on her. 
If they search your room and find it, we're fucked. Emma nodded. She hurried out of the room, and Kiara said, They're not going to search. I was smart enough to plant a decoy. I was pissed at her, so all I said was, Better safe than sorry. It wasn't an hour later that Lady Magdalena forced her way into the dormitories, fully dressed, several teachers behind her. She snapped her fingers and exclaimed, Everyone in the rec room now. That tone she used left no room for argument. Lady Magdalena stood tall as students gathered around her and she bellowed, Miss Gabriella C.R. has been a victim of an unseely hex. As you all know, such magic is forbidden at Arcania University, and we will not tolerate an assassination attempt on our future queen. We will find the culprit and expel them from this university, though I can assure you, if you are the one responsible, that is the least of your worries. If you come forward now, we will not hand you over to the Arcania Alliance. This is your only warning. No one said anything. Lady Magdalena's eyes hardened, and she said, Very well. She held up a crystal on a cord. It was the same stone I'd seen around Kiara's neck so many times before. When questioned, Miss C.R. says the hex came from this stone, though she can't remember how she got it. It has been tainted with dark magic. If anyone recalls where this stone came from, they are to come directly to me. I glanced around nervously. Kiara kept the crystal under her shirt at all times. Besides our friend group, I didn't think anyone even knew she had it. Magdalena's lips were thin. Everyone back to bed, she barked. I think there's been enough excitement for one night. Students returned to their rooms silently. Emma squeezed my hand in a wistful goodbye. My heart ached at her absence, but I knew not to play around with Lady Magdalena. Before she vanished into her dorm, I saw Kiara give a triumphant smile. She'd gotten her revenge. I just didn't know what it was going to cost us. Chapter 18 Emma Ethan Novak was a prince, all right. A prince of oral sex. He was a master with his tongue. My mind was still swooning with thoughts of the night we'd shared. Every brush from his skin felt like the touch of the gods. I never wanted the sensations to end. His intoxicating love was worse than a drug and more addicting. I understood fully why people died for their mates. I would have laid my life down for Ethan if he'd asked me to when I was on my back in his bed the other night. His affection made me that delirious. Too bad the night had been spoiled by Kiara's revenge. I couldn't comprehend she'd go that far to get back at Gabby, though in her mind I'm sure she thought of it as protecting Alexi. She hadn't gotten caught, thank the gods, but damn if the school wasn't trying. They'd opened up an investigation to figure out who had slipped Gabby the crystal. Gabby had actually been taken down a peg. The curse must have scared her. She was quiet in class and kept to herself. She didn't even sneer at me, just ignored me. No features of the curse remained on her skin, but it was obvious that the spell had been so painful it done psychological damage. Gabby had killed people. I shouldn't feel sorry for her. And yet, I did. What was worse, I was angry Kiara was turning into a monster because of what Gabby had done. The end of April arrived. Spring was finally here, and it was blooming in Dolinska. Every street corner was lined with the most beautiful and vibrant flowers. On campus, the gardens absolutely erupted. Flowers were grown in such a way they looked like flowing fountains and streaming waterfalls. I was on a stroll and enjoying the sun when I saw Delmer sitting on a concrete bench near a waterfall. She was casting an illusion spell, changing birds in a cage to bats and back again. Hey, Mare, I said in a tease, sliding up to her. What you doing? Working on transfiguration spells, Delmer replied. Her brow was knitted in concentration. She changed the birds into bats again. Not difficult by any means for me. Let me try. I set my intention on the birds in the cage, imagining bats in their place. It didn't work. Feathers exploded everywhere as the birds poofed up and became big pink puffballs with eyes, staring at me crossly. Delmer let out a laugh. They're pissed at you. 
I can see that. Let me change them back. I cast the spell. The puffballs became birds again, though their feathers were pink this time instead of blue. Dalmer sighed. I think we've tormented them enough. Fly away, little birds. She opened the cage door, and the birds came flying out of it in a flurry. The pink color bled out of their feathers and fell onto the ground like a liquid as they flew into the sky, making for the safety of the branches within the forest. She set the cage aside, and I wiggled my eyebrows. So, how'd things go between you and Stefan the other night? Delmer chewed on her lip. I told him about my dad and my mom, she said. It was hard opening up to him about my past, but after that night, he deserved to know. Did anything happen? I asked, hanging on her every word. Delmer blushed as she admitted, We might have kissed. I squealed. Mare! Did you do anything else? No, it was a moment of weakness, she said. We're not in a relationship. I let out a groan of frustration. You should be, I said. Why didn't you say yes? You know why? I can't let a man get in the way of my career, she said. I huffed. Mayor, you're impossible. It's not like I'm making him my boyfriend. If I say yes, he'll become my mate. We'll be bound for life. It's like accepting a proposal. We'll have to get married, Delmer pointed out. And I don't know if I want to be a wife. It's a big responsibility, committing yourself to someone else like that forever. I can't play with Stefan's feelings. I have to be serious about us before I commit. She had a good point. Dating was one thing, but marriage was another entirely. I know you jumped in feet first with Ethan because you didn't have a choice. But I do, Delmer said. I need a little more time. I could respect that. A familiar humming noise could be heard from not so far away. I turned on my seat, and a huge smile spread on my face when I saw Odette skipping up the pathway, Theo behind her. Odette! I cried. I leapt from my seat and ran toward her. I flung my arms around her and squeezed her tight as she let out a delighted, cute sound. I didn't know you were back! I said. I noticed she'd gained a little weight in the time she'd been gone. Not much, but better than she was. I came to take exams, she said. I'm out of rehab so long as I stay on track with my recovery program. Theo's eyes glittered proudly. He'd been miserable since she'd been gone. Now that she was back at school, he was relaxed. Being out of her presence had to be agonizing for him. Are you doing well? I asked. I've been so worried about you. Her smile fell. Well, I've been kicked out of the company, as I'm sure you've heard. Nobody wants me to dance for them anymore. Then Odette brightened. But Igor says I'll make up for it. The company will take me back eventually, he's certain. He didn't visit me in rehab, but he's been ever so sweet since I got out. Ugh, she was still with that creep? Count that as a loss. Odette hugged Theo's arm. But Theo saw me every day. He was the kindest friend, weren't you? I'll always be there for you, Odette, Theo said. When she gave a fond look to Theo, I relaxed. Okay, she was still dating Igor, but it looked like she and Theo had made up and were friends again. Her relationship with Igor wouldn't last long. Theo would find a way to win her over. I heard the padding of griffin footsteps on the path. I looked behind me. Alexei was in his griffin form, Kiara next to him. He changed into a man as he came near and offered cheerfully, Hey guys, what's up? Ethan and I hadn't told Alexi what Kiara had done. In fact, we hadn't told anyone. The only ones who knew were the three of us. Not much, I said. What's going on with you guys? Just a stroll. It's a lovely day, Kiara said. Kiara was acting like everything was normal and it was driving me nuts. She pretended like she hadn't done anything at all. It's good to see you, Odette, Kiara said with a nod. We've missed you. Yeah, things aren't the same without your sparkly ass around, Delmer said. Well, it is good to be back home, Odette gushed. And look, here come Ethan and Stefan, more dear friends. This is looking to be quite the party. 
Ethan wrapped his arms around me and squeezed. Hello, Onawilka. He cooed and my heart skipped a beat. Fancy seeing you here. Were we meeting up today or something? Stefan looked confused as he entered the circle. I seriously can't remember shit. No, just a coincidence, Kiara replied. Though it's so nice out, it shouldn't be unusual that we've met up. Everyone's got cabin fever from being cooped up all winter. Delmer and Stefan were totally giving each other sex eyes. Whatever she said about wanting to focus on her career, Delmer acted like she wanted to focus on something else. Like, uh, Stefan's dick. I got an idea. Since you're all here, I wanted to try something out, I said. I pulled away from Ethan's arms and ruffled through my bag. I've never attempted an orgy before, so forgive me if I don't know how it goes, Stefan began. Delmer smacked his stomach and he bent over, wheezing. Alexi choked. Ethan shook his head. I ignored him. Actually, it's a spell, I confessed. I pulled out the grimoire from my bag and opened it, showing the page of a beautifully illustrated portal to the group. It's a transportation spell harnessed by an unseelie incantation. It says it can carry multiple people at a time without using a lot of magical energy. I want to see if it works. Ethan frowned. Oh, no, Wilka, that's dangerous. We know that grimoire isn't always helpful. It's filled with dark magic. He sent a harsh glance to Kiara, who remained passive. Unsealy magic? Ooh, that sounds exciting. Odette swooned. I very much would like to see what it does. Odette, Theo moaned, but she bounced on the spot. Portals are dangerous, Ethan said. They're only meant to transport one person at a time. What if they're not, though? I'm good at them. And what if we get into trouble again? I asked him. Wouldn't this be helpful if all of us needed a way out? Ethan huffed, but Kiara said, Let's try it. What else do we have to do? Ethan scowled. He hadn't approved of what Kiara had done to Gabby, and I knew he didn't like the thought of us tampering with dark magic further, even if it was for a good reason. If we're going to practice this, we should go to the woods, Stefan thumbed behind him. You know, so nobody can see what we're doing. He had a good point. We left the school grounds and entered the Sanctuary of the Trees. Ethan kept looking around for monsters, while I read the spell over and over. Like most unseelie magic, this one required an incantation. Theo was acting like a skittish horse. Are you sure you know what you're doing, Emma? No, I responded. That's half the fun, right? Theo mumbled something incoherent under his breath. When we were far enough into the woods, I found a clearing that was big enough for the portal to grow. Where are you transporting us? Ethan asked as I shuffled through the pages. Just a few feet to start, I said, and I raised my hand. Stand back, everyone. I took a deep breath. All eyes were on me as I began to recite the incantation. Fey world present, future, friar, take me to my heart's desire. Nothing happened. I scowled and tried again, but no portal opened up. Everyone stared at me like they expected magic to happen. Well, that's dumb, I said. The spell doesn't work. Disappointing, Ethan said, though he didn't sound disappointed at all. He strode forward and grabbed me by the arm. Come on, Emma, let's go. We started on the way back to campus. I felt pretty sour about the whole thing. The grimoire spells always worked before. Why had this one failed? Suddenly, Odette halted in place. Theo slammed into her behind her, which caused Stefan to stagger and fall on his face. Odette tilted her head strangely, while Stefan got up from the ground, cursing. Do you hear that? Odette said lightly. It's a ringing sound, like bells. None of us heard anything. I tried straining my ears, but there was no noise. There's nothing there, Odette. Of course there is! She spun in place. I can hear singing now. Come on, follow me. Odette ran into the trees. My mouth dropped open. Now where was she off to? Odette, Theo cried. He changed into an alley corn and ran after her. The rest of us hurried to follow. I raced through the trees, jumping over logs and stones. Had Odette lost her mind? Where was she taking us? Finally, the trees parted. I caught my breath as a familiar sight came into view. Odette had led us to the fairy fort, underneath the shade of the Willow Maiden. 
The ruins from the abandoned castle seemed to glisten in the sun as the monumental tree towered over the area. Circling the clearing was a line of mushrooms, a face circle. They'd been commonly used as portals to admire a long time ago, but I didn't think they held any magic now. As I came close to the willow, that's when I heard it. Tinkling bells and the sound of women harmonizing. It hadn't been here before the last time I visited. This was so strange. By the mystified faces of my friends, they heard it now too. Odette, wait up, Delmere called. But Odette didn't listen. She giggled as she came to the base of the Willow Maiden. She looked up at the great tree and let the strands brush against her face before she put her hands against the tree bark and walked straight through. In moments, Odette vanished. Odette! Theo screamed in a panic. He didn't pause to think. Theo charged right after her. Just like she did, he became encompassed by the tree's bark, vanishing into its trunk. My heart pounded. The bells were louder than ever in my ears. Theo and Odette had disappeared, but I knew where they had gone. Ethan saw the curious expression on my face. Emma, don't try it, he warned. Too late. I ran full speed toward the tree, which in retrospect was a stupid thing to do, considering I had no idea where it would take me. But I trusted the Willow Maiden, and I had to know where my friends were. My body pressed into the trunk, and I felt the warm safety of the Willow Maiden envelop me like a mother, her heartbeat pounding against me as I melded into the tree and came out to the other side. Sunlight beamed on my face. The sound of bells and singing was gone, replaced by the chirping of birds and the whistling of wind through long grass. I opened my eyes. Tears blossomed in them when I took in the incredible view. I was in a large valley. The grass here was golden and up to my knees. The sky above us was a mixture of pink and purple, orange clouds passing by. Flowers as big as my hand bloomed amongst the grass, scattering like red droplets against the span of gold. In the distance, I saw great mountains, blue like sapphire with diamond tops. There was no one around for miles. I didn't see a single building. Behind me was a perfect replica of the Willow Maiden, her fronds weaving in the breeze. This was a beautiful new world, one so delicate, nearly made of glass. The sight of it made me want to cry. I didn't know where we'd been taken, but it felt right. More than that, it felt safe, like coming home after a tiring journey, finding a place to stay after being gone for far too long. Odette clapped while Theo bobbed his head, looking a little sick. You made it, Emma, Odette cheered. I hope the others follow. Except Odette didn't really look like Odette anymore. She had a long pink horn like one of an alicorn, growing out the center of her forehead. Pink butterfly wings sparkled in the sunlight upon her back, and her clothes had changed into a flowing pink dress. Something on top of my head itched. I reached up to scratch it and cried aloud when I felt something very furry. I looked behind. My wings were out, but more than that, I'd grown a fluffy white wolf's tail after running through the tree. My clothes had been replaced by a navy blue dress with a light blue corset that laced up my middle. Though it was comfortable, it was something you'd wear to a renaissance fair, not the modern clothes I'd left behind me. I reached for my phone to check my reflection, but I didn't have it. The only thing I still carried with me in my bag was my grimoire. Weary nodded in my gut. What the hell had just happened? Don't worry, Emma, you look very cute with wolf ears, Odette gushed. It suits your style. There was a crashing sound behind me. I watched as the rest of my friends came flooding through. Delmer and Kiara were first. Their features were similarly changed to resemble that of a griffin and a dragon's. As Kiara got off the ground... Her expression widened when she saw Odette and I. She reached to the top of her head, feeling her feathery yellow griffin ears like those of an owl's and a long lion's tail. Her wings were similar to a dragonfly's, golden and shimmering. The yellow dress she was wearing was nearly identical to mine, except the sleeves were so long they draped onto the ground, reminding me of the robes priestesses wore. Okay, I'm totally keeping these horns. 
Delmere said as she felt them. She'd sprouted large black horns and a scaly tail that resembled Stefan's. Black, leathery wings like that of a dragon beat at her side. Her dress exposed her shoulders and clung to her body like spider webs, the black lace embracing her curves as a red corset held everything in place. Alexei was next to follow. He easily walked through the willow's portal, coming to Kiara and nudging her with his beak. You all right? I'm fine, Kiara said. She was taking in the scenery with an odd expression, unable to believe where we were. Ethan slid on through. He was a wolven, and he tumbled head over heels as he pulled through the willow maiden. It looked like the tree had spat him out, which was quite funny. He staggered to his feet, flashing his fangs as he whirled on me. Damn it, Emma. I thought I told you to wait. He growled. I've never been very good at listening, I said. Ethan lifted his lip in a growl until he saw the wolven ears on top of my head. He tilted his gaze and took in the sight of us girls, curiosity gleaming in his eyes. Stefan was the last. The willow maiden groaned as he passed through like it was giving birth to a monster. The tree expanded, growing outward. Stefan clawed his way to land as a black dragon, giving low growls. The tree finally released her hold and he yanked free with considerable effort. The dragon shook his head and snorted out embers as he said, Big dragon, little tree, physics didn't work out well. Alexei sniffed the air and ruffled his feathers. Where are we? I don't know, I said slowly. I've never seen this land before. Had my spell done this? It was insane. What magic is this? I can't <sighs> change back, Theo said like he was trying and failing. Me either. Stefan complained. I'm stuck in my scales. Looks like we're unable to shift until we get out of here, boys, Ethan said. Let's turn around. Ethan ran at the tree. He jumped, planning to pass through the willow's portal, but slammed into it headfirst and went crashing down. Ethan! I ran to his side. I knelt by his head as he groaned, rubbing it with his paw. Brilliant plan, genius, Delmere said. No need to test it first. Kiara stepped forward. She braced her hands against the Willow Maiden and pushed, but the portal didn't give way. Her face paled as shock shone in her features. The portal's closed. We can't go back, Kiara said, a slight edge of panic in her voice. Does that mean we're stuck here? A lump grew in my throat as Ethan climbed to his feet. I don't know. Maybe we should look for help? Try the spell again, Theo insisted. I did. I recited the incantation that had gotten us here, but it didn't work to open up the tree's portal. Stefan stomped his foot. Great, we're trapped. Why would you want to leave here? This place is amazing, Odette sang, twirling on the spot. Her butterfly wings fluttered, and she rose a few inches off the ground. Not to ruin your fun, dear Odette, but we do have exams on Monday, and I would very much like to take them, Theo quipped. I rolled my eyes. It was like Theo to think of class when we were in a new environment and didn't know how to get back home. Odette stuck out her lip. I guess you're right, she admitted in a sad voice. But we simply must stay for dinner. If we can find it, I said. Odette was acting like we'd come across a fast food joint. I grabbed Ethan's scruff and pulled myself onto his back. Come on, guys, let's head into that forest. I pointed to a line of trees a mile or so away. Perhaps there's someone who can help us. There were no other options, so we forged ahead. Though Odette happily rode Theo like a princess, and Kiara didn't object to Alexei carrying her, Delmer was bitching all the way. I'm not climbing on your back, Delmer grumbled for the millionth time. I had to resist snapping at her. She was slowing us up. Yes, you are! Stefan reached down and picked Delmer up by the back of her dress. She yelped as he swung his head around and deposited her behind his wings. She crossed her arms and pouted. I supposed all of us, save for Ethan, could fly there, but we didn't know this land, so we figured it safer to stay close to the ground. As we reached the forest, the trees were spaced far enough apart for the shifters to walk through it, even Stefan. The woodland was full of cherry trees blossoming with spring flowers, pink petals floating down in an intricate dance. The grass was blue and purple here, 
pink and green mushrooms growing along the path and giving off a white glow. Each of the trees grew in a twisted fashion, carvings in their bark just like the Willow Maiden. There were veins in these trees, and they changed colors as they pulsed, like they too had heartbeats. Butterflies and moths at least a foot wide, of every color, perched on the trunks, wings slowly beating in time with the change of colors. Ethan's body stiffened, like he was suspicious of them, but I stroked the area between his shoulder blades and he relaxed. We came to a stream, where the water was white and sparkled as if it had dazzling diamonds within its bed. We followed the small river, and it soon led to a waterfall hundreds of feet high, glistening against the light of the sun. There were so many deer within these woods. There were fawns with black faces, and deer with tawny bodies whose eyes glowed white. Deer that had antlers that bloomed into flowers at the top of their heads, and deer that appeared to be made of pure light. Some deer were created purely of fire, their antlers burning hot, while other deer played in the stream, composed of nothing but the shimmering water that was all around us. There were deer with the tails of griffins and cats, deer with feathery bodies and scales, some that had crystals growing out of their backs, and others that contained balls of glowing magic between their antlers that never faded. I thought I might go crazy from looking at them all, and they were all sizes, came in every shape and color. Some were the size of bugs, and hopped from the petals of one flower to another, leaving fairy dust in their wake that sparkled in the atmosphere. One stag was bigger than Stefan, with thick antlers that could collapse a building. The shifters bristled as it passed, waiting for an attack, but the stag paid us no mind, only dipped his head down to take a drink from the sparkling water before moving on. I slipped off of Ethan. The girls followed my lead, dismounting their own shifters. As I ran a hand down the stream of the waterfall and drew it away, I saw that my fingers were covered in a glitter-like substance. This land was truly magical. It's impossible, Kiara breathed. This has to be... Eden Meyer, I said. There was no doubt in my mind. This was the home of our ancestral fae, the world they'd abandoned for Malovia long ago. But how could they have left such a breathtaking place, and why? Your incantation must have opened up a portal to Edenmire, Kiara mused, putting a finger to her lips. But how? Ethan growled. The portal to Edenmire has been closed for many years. Our high priestesses couldn't get it to open up. Well, Emma just did, Stefan replied, in a voice that indicated Ethan was stupid. I thought about the incantation. The words beckoned for the fae of the past, present, and future to take me to my heart's desire. Adenmire was the home of all fae, the desire that laid deep within their hearts. The incantation was meant to bring fae back to the land where they really belonged. We must be the first fae to venture here in at least a hundred years, Kiara said. Maybe even more. You're saying Emma just opened up a portal to a different universe. No marked has that kind of power, Ethan argued. But his debate fell flat, for another deer was in the forest. But she was different from all the rest. My lungs froze as I took in the sight of the white doe in front of us, her golden mane appearing like a halo around her small face. Her root-like antlers had grown leaves that were larger than the first time I had seen her, budding with spring flowers. The same beautiful light I loved shone around her as birds nestled within her antlers. Milana, my goddess. She was resting by the waterfall, as if she'd been waiting for us to arrive the whole time. Goddess. Ethan gasped, and he sank into a low bow. The other shifters followed his lead, while Chiara, Delmere, and Odette curtsied, nearly touching the ground. Milana's black eyes fell upon me. Come, my champion, Milana said softly. Sit close and bring your friends near. It is time I sent you onward toward your destiny. My friends approached cautiously, though I more or less ran to her, flinging myself at her feet. I collapsed at her silver hoofs and said, I have missed you, goddess. I have missed you, my champion. I have heard your prayers and received your offerings. You are ready to begin your journey. Milana spoke. 
It was then that Milana changed before my very eyes. She became a woman. Small velvet antlers sprouted out of her head, white spots like that of a fawn painted across her wild eyes and over her cheekbones. The dress she wore was thin and white. Roots grew around her arms and over her skin, and her blonde hair was adorned with feathers and small braids. She was middle-aged in appearance, kindly and motherly, lines at the corners of her mouth. Milana waved a hand. Come, my children, it is safe here for you. Ethan carefully laid down, wrapping himself around me. Delmer, Chiara, and Odette spread out their skirts as they sat on the grass. The other shifters copied Ethan's lead, tucking their bodies close to the girls as they observed Milana with reverence. Why have you brought us here, goddess? I asked. I desired for you to come here, though you brought yourself, Milana replied. You are the world weaver. You are the only one who can open and close portals to Edenmire. I sent out a call for you to join me, and your friend heard it. Odette squealed in joy, but Theo hushed her. I drew closer to Milana. Why are we all changed like this? I waved my hands over my new wolf ears. This is how the Fey sorceresses used to look. We took on the features of our shifters here in Edenmire. In the old times, our companions could only change into men to make love to us and give us the gift of a new child, Milana explained. And what do you ask of me? I said. I know I'm asking so many questions, but I'll do whatever you desire. I have brought you here to save the Fey, for their time is running short. Milana responded. I braced myself, threading my hands through Ethan's coat. What do you mean? Nothing deteriorates in Edemire. If the flower grows, it will not die, save for if someone kills it. Milana began. Edemire is an endless land, a world of perfect magic. The Fae were meant to be immortal here but the war between the Seely and Unseely Fae could not exist in such a perfect world. I and my fellow gods banished the Fae from this land so they could continue their battles on Earth, a flawed landscape with much sorrow. Milana continued her story. The Fae were banished nearly a thousand years ago, but all Fae magic comes from Edenmire and our connection to this land. Every supernatural on Earth draws their magic from a sustenance called life energy. Shifters and sorceresses gain their life energy from Edenmire. I am here to tell you that this connection is dying, champion. Dying? My voice was weak in my throat. Ethan stiffened beside me. After the portal was closed, Neva, the goddess of time, put a loop on this world. Milana replied, Time does not pass here, but after hundreds of years, that loop is about to end. The Fae can only remain unconnected from Edemire for so long. Soon, Neva's magic will cease, and time will return to Edemire again. Once it does, a thousand years will pass in the blink of an eye, and the portal shall close permanently, never to be opened again. All Fae in Malovia will lose their connection to this world, turn to dust, and die. I felt myself growing cold. So I'll stop it. I'll keep the portal to Edenmire open and the Fae won't die. It's not so simple, Milana said. If the Fae are to survive, the portal to Edenmire must stay open forever. How do I do that? I asked. This already felt like an impossible task. A long time ago, the Fae were in possession of six stones. Milana said. They were called the Crystals of Harmony. These stones are the only source of magic in the Arcanian world that can produce the magic of healing. The crystals kept the portal between the two worlds open and allowed the Fae to journey back and forth. If you find these stones and reunite them, the portal will heal and the connection between both lands will continue. All my other champions have failed to unite the stones. You are my last hope. You're a goddess. Can't you find them and bring them back together? I pleaded. Milana shook her head. 
When the gods banished the Fae from Edenmire, we all agreed not to allow them to return unless they proved themselves, she said. My husband Tomir scattered the stones purposefully in a test to see if the Fae had changed. If I interfere and gather the stones myself, it will be considered cheating by the gods. Drogar is the only god who has the audacity to meddle himself with the stones. What does Droga have to do with it? I was getting impatient. This was a bitch of a task already, and now the Dark God was involved? Droga wants the stones for himself. If he has control of the portal, he has control of all the Fae, Milana responded. He is not truly dead, Emma, just waiting to be resurrected. His spirit still haunts these lands. You must prevent the stones from falling into his possession at any cost. He will send his champions to search for them as well. The thought of Gabby and Elijah gaining control over the Edenmire portal made me feel sick. We had to get our hands on these stones before they did. Can you tell me more about these stones? I asked. Something that might help me find them? Each stone represents a different quality that embodies the heart of a true Arcania. To find them, you must display the trait that represents each crystal, Milana said. The woven stone signifies undying loyalty. The next stone, the dragon stone, represents bravery. What about the rest? I asked. The alicorn stone signifies faith. The griffin stone, compassion. The last two stones, the Seely stone and the unseely stone, represent the light and the dark. Both are needed for a fae to become everything they're meant to be. Only once all the stones are reunited can the portal be reopened and the fae can return to Edenmire. I don't even know where to begin looking, I said in a depressed voice. You already have one, Milana said kindly. The blue stone that is forged into your sword is the woven stone, passed down in the monarchy for centuries. There are only five left to go. I gaped while Ethan's ears perked up. The woven stone was in Lord Pazan, the blade he'd gifted me at the king's contest. That was incredible. Where are the others? I asked. One crystal, the dragon stone, is very close, Milana said. It is here in Edenmire. If you find it, you can use it to return to Earth and search for the rest. I cannot give you any more hints. Milana changed back into a doe. She reached out her velvet nose to me and pressed it against my forehead. You are my last hope, champion. Do not lose courage. How much time do we have before the time loop ends? I asked, voice quivering. Three years, Milana replied. Before the first of the snow melts away at the end of your fourth winter. I let out a choked noise, and my friends gasped behind me as Milana repeated the words of the prophecy the hag had spoken to me. The time I would die. Milana blinked, and in moments she was gone. I jumped to my feet. I turned on the spot and called for her, voice echoing throughout the forest, but she wasn't there. She'd already faded. I dropped my head. Ethan got to his feet. I shivered as I said pitifully, I feel so alone. He pushed his head up against me, and I clung to him. You are never alone. There was a beat of heavy silence, one Stefan decided to lighten with a joke. Okay, so if one of you dudes changes back, I know it's because you're horny, he cracked. Delmare face palmed. Alexi let out a nervous laugh. Ethan was thoughtful. I didn't know the stone I set into your blade was of such power. My father passed it down to me, said it was a royal heirloom, but never could I have imagined it was a crystal of harmony. Have you heard of them before? I asked. Very few times in court gossip, Ethan replied. They're considered relics, almost like the Holy Grail. I scoffed. That wasn't very helpful. Nobody had found that in the centuries they'd been searching for it, and we had a matter of three years to find all these stones. Milana wouldn't have brought us here if she didn't want us to help Emma, Alexi said. 
She appeared to all of us. This is our responsibility. Indeed, Kiara said before she frowned. Though this does seem like a tall order, Edenmire is as big as Earth is. The Dragonstone could be anywhere. It doesn't matter. We have to find the Dragonstone. Otherwise, we're stuck here, Delmere said. Alexei flattened his feathery ears against his head. So, Milana only appears to those who are destined for an early death. Doesn't that mean we're all going to die young? Don't think so. She only spoke to me, I said quietly. I'm her champion. That's the only way the death rule applies. You aren't going to die, Emma, Ethan said, but I didn't pay attention to him. He didn't know. In the time we'd been listening to Milana, Odette had woven a flower crown. She put it on Theo's head, over his horn and around his ears, and said, Well, we better get a move on. Time's a-wastin'. She fluttered her wings and did a pirouette. She seemed the only one not dampered by the burden Milana had placed on us all. The entire Fey world would end if we didn't find these stones. Melovia would cease to exist, and so would the Fey, if we didn't get the portal to Edenmire open in time. The responsibility of all Fey kind weighed me down, dragging my feet like they were trapped in iron. I was being poisoned by all of it, choking on the fear I wouldn't find the stones in time and doom the Arcania forever. Every other champion of Milana's had failed to unite the crystals. How could I possibly believe I'd be successful? I knew I couldn't give in. My race was depending on me, and I had my friends to help me. Our society would become extinct if we didn't reunite to those stones, changed to literal dust. And we had to start with the Dragonstone, because we had no other choice. Finding that crystal was our only way home. Chapter 19 Ethan We traveled through the woods with absolutely no idea where we were going. Malona said the Dragonstone would be somewhere nearby, but as to where, none of us had a clue. That I had witnessed a goddess in true form had me in complete awe. We were in Edenmire, the land of our fey ancestors, and we had received a mission from one of the seven gods. I'd never considered such a thing would happen to me. But as I was learning, if you were close to Emma, unusual situations happened every day. You know, you could lighten up, Emma offered from upon my back. We're in a magical world. At least enjoy it a little before we have to go home. Her voice relaxed me. Okay. Emma's wolf ears and tail were adorably cute. And kind of sexy. My skin itched to change so we could run off and fool around somewhere though I remained in my woven form despite the urge. I bared my teeth. We are on a mission. We must find this stone. No one said it had to be an unbearable mission, Stefan commented. We don't even know where it is, I complained. I bet it's in that creepy forest, Odette said, and we all turned. Her finger was pointed in the direction of a twisting, winding road that ran alongside a section of dead trees. No grass grew there, and only dust remained. It was a stark contrast to the colorful forest around us. The road wound ahead into a dark tunnel of trees that was definitely foreboding. Yeah, bet anything the Dragonstone was in there. We all knew this quest wasn't going to be easy. Theo licked his lips nervously. He was still wearing the flower crown. I'm not sure that's such a good idea... The Dragonstone is for bravery, right? Stop being a chicken shit, Delmare urged Stefan ahead. They led the way through the tunnel, while Emma and I brought up the rear. The sunlight faded as clouds overcast the sky. The dead trees with spindly branches created shadows upon our faces as we walked, and the farther we ventured into the dark woods, the eerier it became. I heard no birds chirping, nor the sound of other animals. I could only smell dust. Are you sure this is the right way? Theo asked, snorting a few times. Of course it is. Look, the trees break up ahead, Delmare said. The trees did indeed break, but the sight before us was anything but pleasant. The woods expanded into a meadow, filled with dry yellow grass that was darkened by the gray clouds up above. There were deer in the meadow, 
but they were made of nothing but bone. They raised their heads to look at us, skeleton bodies clicking. I feared they'd attack, but they simply ran off, jumping into the sanctuary of the hollow trees. Look up there. Ruins, Emma said. A short distance away were a collection of large black stones. Looked like a castle had been here at one point, and it deteriorated over time. We approached the ruins on high alert. I heard the sound of stamping feet and gave a growl to let the other companions know to be cautious. The girls dismounted, and we crept around the corner, keeping low to see what was hiding within the middle of the ruins. An owl-like creature at least thirty feet long was skulking around the room. The creature had the body and face of an owl with bat-like wings that ended in claws and the back legs of a bird with vicious talons to match. The monster walked on all fours and had deer antlers that twisted out of its head. It had a long, plumed tail with feathers that would cut skin if one got too close. It was guarding a small silver box placed on a stone tablet on the other side of the room. I bet anything the dragon stone was inside. What is that thing? Kiara asked in fear, and Alexei shivered beside her. It's an alia, I said, a type of forest demon. What does your dad say about alias? Stefan asked. Don't fuck with them, I sighed. I suppose we have to fight it to get this stone. It shouldn't be hard. There are eight of us here, Emma said. We should surround it before it sees us, I said. Let's move. We did. Or at least, we tried. Delmer and Stefan were the only ones who were able to cross further into the ruins. The remainder of the group was stuck, unable to venture through. The girls placed their hands against something invisible, as if held back by glass, while myself and the other companions found our feet glued to the spot. We couldn't advance. Stop messing around. What the hell's the matter with you? Stefan demanded. It's not us. We can't cross through, Emma hissed. Delmer's eyes cleared. Stefan and I can walk through the barrier, Delmer said. The rest of you can't. That doesn't make any sense, I growled in frustration. This is a test by the gods, Stefan said in realization. A test for dragons. It is the dragon stone, Delmer said. It makes sense if dragons are the only ones that can obtain it. But Alias are dangerous. We can't allow you to fight it on your own. Theo objected. You don't have a choice, Stefan said. Just sit back and relax. We can handle it. Stefan, I growled, don't do this without us. He didn't listen. Stefan proceeded forward, Delmer at his side. She summoned a red orb of battle magic in both hands as she walked toward the Alia. The rest of us could do nothing, so we crouched beside the ruins and waited for this to play out. The monster saw them coming. It paused as they advanced, observing Stefan with blinking eyes. It made no move to hurt them. Delmer was holding her breath as she crossed the room. She proceeded toward the silver box while the Alia was distracted. She reached out a hand, placing it on the lid. It was then that the Alia attacked. The owl creature let out a cry and dived toward Delmer with an open beak. Delmer rolled out of the way, and the silver box went flying, as the monster's head collided with the stone tablet, breaking it in two. Stefan moved. He charged forward with his horns down, aiming for the Alia. The birds slid out of the way. Stefan crashed into a wall instead, sending what remained of it crumbling to the ground in a great crash. The monster was still after Delmer. It hissed as it ran after her, lowering its antlers. Delmer sent a ball of battle magic flying toward the creature. It hit and exploded on impact, singeing the monster's feathers. The monster gave a screech and swiped its claws at Delmer, who rolled to the ground to avoid them. Irina, stay down, Stefan cried. Delmer remained glued to the floor as Stefan opened his mouth. Flames came billowing out of the dragon's belly, igniting the monster in flames. The Alia rose up on its hind legs and batted at the flames, hissing and clicking its beak. The body of the monster became submerged in shadow as Stefan's flames turned it into a fiery pyre. Stefan kept the flames going for a full minute until his magic finally fizzled out and he had to stop to take a breath. 
I gaped in surprise as the monster shook itself, appearing bothered but not hurt. There wasn't a burn on the creature. It was completely fine. Kiara put it together before the rest of us did. Its feathers must be fire-resistant, Kiara called. Fire won't harm it. That would have been nice to know a minute ago, Stefan yelled. He bared his fangs and lunged for the Alia's throat, but the creature sprang into the sky with a screeching battle cry. As it did so, Delmare climbed back onto her feet. The Alia's sharp tail feathers swung to the side, cutting into her corset and causing a bloody wound. Irina! Stefan said in panic as he smelled the blood. Delmare gritted her teeth through the pain. I'll be fine. Just work on getting that thing out of the air. Stefan spread his wings and took off, giving chase after the Alia. They twirled around in circles in the sky while Delmare ignited another ball of battle magic. She cried out as she pressed the ball into her side, smoke rising from the wound as she cauterized the slit shut. In the sky, Stefan was battling the Alia with all his might. The monster was just as big as he was, and as deadly. Their talons locked together as the two dragons dove their heads toward each other in a furious battle. The monster latched its beak onto Stefan's wing and bit down hard, causing the dragon to roar in pain. Stefan brought his tail up and bashed it into the monster's head, forcing it to let the wing go. Stefan clawed at the Alia with his front talons, ripping open wounds in the monster's front. Stefan, get out of the way, Delmare shouted. She was holding an orb of battle magic in both hands that was steadily growing. The ball crackled and smoked as she strained her arms to try to control it. Stefan yanked his claws out of the body of the Alia. Before he could dive away, the monster shoved its beak downward and sunk it into Stefan's chest. Blood spurted everywhere, and Stefan gave a cry of agony. He kicked the monster away with his feet back, though he sagged in the air, spiraling until he crash-landed against the stony ruins. No! Delmare screamed. She reared her arm back and released her battle magic orb at the Alia with all the rage she could muster. The orb sailed through the air and connected with the monster, where it immediately exploded on impact. Feathers went flying everywhere. There was a soft screech, and we watched as the monster fell from the sky, still smoking. The Alia landed on its back, feet curled and wings lying in a disjointed position. In the middle of its stomach was a large hole Delmare had blown with her powers. Once the creature was dead, I could feel the barrier on the ruins lift. We ran to where Delmare had collapsed by Stefan's side. The dragon was breathing heavily, taking in long gasps as Delmare observed his wound. The skin on his chest was ripped open, exposing his beating heart through his visible ribs. I winced as I saw the wound, and a few of the girls gasped. We had to fix it. Stefan wouldn't make it home like this. Stefan, are you? Delmare's words trailed off as she saw the blood seeping from the gash the Alia had made. Her dark eyes showed terror, as if she feared Stefan wouldn't survive. The dragon stone, Irina, Stefan gasped. Retrieve it. Delmare staggered to her feet and rushed to the silver box. She tried to open it, but the lid wouldn't budge. I can't, Delmare said. It won't open. She passed the box around. I figured it had a key or something, but no such lock existed on the box. Emma tried to force the box open to no avail. When she passed it off to Kiara, she observed it carefully before Alexei spoke. It's got an enchantment on it. You guys didn't pass the test. What? Delmare yelped. But we defeated the Alia. We showed we were brave. Alexei's right. Something's wrong, Kiara said with a frown. Whatever the task was, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Delmare's lip trembled. Stefan coughed and said, Oh, well, we gave it a good run. Don't say things like that, Delmare snapped. She pushed at Stefan's side. Get up! Stefan moaned. The blood was still rushing out causing a metallic smell to fill my nostrils. We have to stop the bleeding, I said. If we don't, things aren't looking good. Delmare's eyes flashed. I'll close his wound, like I closed mine. Battle magic bloomed in her hand. She kneeled by Stefan's side, not caring about the blood. 
letting it soak into her dress. She moved her hand forward to cauterize the wound. Stop, Stefan said, and Delmare halted. Don't. What are you talking about, you stupid prat? Delmare asked. I'm trying to save your life. Stefan's eyes darkened as his breathing became shallow. If I'm not the one for you, Irina, let me die, because I swear a life without you is one hardly worth living. Don't say things like that. Her voice cracked as her lip trembled. You'll be fine. I want to hear you say the words, he begged, just in case this doesn't work. It's going to work. It has to, Delmare said. Without hesitating, she moved her magic over the cut. Stefan let out a deep bellow as her magic sealed the wound, burning the edges together. After Delmare closed the wound, Stefan took a shallow breath. His body relaxed, sinking into the earth. His eyes shut and a death rattle formed in his throat, causing a bolt of fear to shoot through me. No! Delmare pushed at his shoulder again, though Stefan didn't rise. Get up! You have to get up! Stefan didn't respond. Delmare's eyes filled with tears. She threw herself against Stefan, wrapping her arms around his neck. Come back, she whispered. Please. I was too shocked to speak. This couldn't be real. Could my best friend have... really? Alexei and Kiara were both weeping, overwhelmed by the emotions of the situation. Odette had her hands over her mouth in shock, while Theo observed the scene in disbelief. Emma had fallen to her knees. An expression of grief for her friend shadowed across her face. Don't leave me, Delmare cried. Stefan didn't respond. In a low whisper, she added, I love you. I heard a click. The box at Delmare's feet opened. Her eyes widened. She reached for the box and pulled it onto her lap. She withdrew a thin silver dagger, a red ruby glistening at the end of the hilt. Delmare held it up in awe, turning it in her hand to observe it with shock. Delmare glanced at the dagger, then at Stefan. She took a deep breath, then plunged the dagger into Stefan's heart. Chapter 20 Emma I gasped and staggered backward. What the hell? Had Delmere just done that? Had she really stabbed Stefan in the heart? Around me, my friends gave similar notes of shock, disbelief radiating from all of our faces. This couldn't be real. Delmere wouldn't end Stefan's life out of mercy. She'd beg him to keep fighting. Stefan's eyes immediately opened wide. He lifted his head as he gave a roar of agony and betrayal. Delmere just gritted her teeth and kept the dagger in Stefan's chest, focusing with all her might. I was about to drag her off him, but Ethan grabbed me by the back of my dress with his fangs and held me there. Before our very eyes, the dagger glowed. It gave off a red sheen, the surrounding area swirling with a ruby vortex. The wound that Delmare had cauterized disappeared, replacing the scar with new scales, mending the tear that the monster had given the dragon. Slowly, Stefan began to come to. Delmare withdrew the dagger inch by inch, biting her lip in anticipation until the blade was free and Stefan was back on his feet. Stefan opened his wings and admired his new skin in complete shock. He couldn't believe he was alive. Alexei's beak was hanging open. Delmer, how did you do that? Milana said the crystals have healing powers, Delmer said in a shaky voice. I don't know where it came from, but I heard a voice inside. I always prayed to Neva, the goddess of time, and worshipped her. I knew I'd pick her as my goddess for my choosing someday. I'd never heard her before, but at that moment, it was like I could hear her talking to me, telling me to use the blade. I knew it was crazy, but it was my only shot. You love me! Stefan bounced on the spot, shaking the ground. In moments, he transformed into a man. He picked Delmare up and kissed her in front of the gods and everybody. Delmare blushed when he put her down, but she didn't pull away. She placed her hands on his chest and said, You only had to die to get me to admit it. It was worth it, he replied. Stefan sank to one knee, taking Delmare's hand in his. Irina, my beauty, 
would you do me the honor of becoming my mate? He proclaimed the words wholeheartedly, though the whole performance was a bit over the top. Delmere rolled her eyes and yanked on his arm, letting out a laugh. Gods, get off the ground. Of course I will. Don't have much of a choice now, do I? Stefan beamed and kissed Delmere again. Odette let out a whistle while Theo nickered in amusement and Ethan laughed under his breath. It was only now Stefan realized he was in his human form. He looked at the other three companions and said, Shit, I might have gotten carried away. Now who's horny? Alexei teased. Stefan sent him the finger. Delmere giggled and mouthed at me that Stefan was rocking a hard on. I wiggled my eyebrows and made a hand gesture. She put a hand over her mouth to keep from bursting out laughing. This is all so wonderful, Odette sighed in a romantic way. Delmere and Stefan finally mates! We should throw a party! Excellent idea, but the party should be back home, Kiara suggested. Delmere, do you have any ideas? You used the blade. Delmere frowned. I don't know. Ask Emma. She's the portalist. Delmere handed me the dagger. I turned it in my hands and observed it, noticing how the ruby sparked in the light. I think the crystals of harmony are illusion magic, and illusion magic is intention, I said. So, if I ask the crystal to take us home and use it to create a portal, the magic should work. There should be an incantation for it, Kiara said. We had to cast one to get here. If there is, we don't have the book to translate it, I said. I'm not sure what to do. Write your own, Emma, Ethan said. You're the world weaver, the bridge between this universe and our own. As long as the intention is true, the crystal should be able to harness enough power. Ethan was right, but I'd had no experience writing my own spells before. I was worried it wouldn't work. Well, first time for everything. I chewed on my lip, trying to conceive the proper incantation. It had to be clear. If it wasn't, the Dragonstone could deposit us who knows where. Possibly a universe without oxygen. It'd be something I would do. Yet the spell also had to be similar to the one that got us here. This was complicated magic. It took me a few moments, but I think I got the words right. I closed my eyes as I grasped the dagger in my hand, putting all my might into the intention of the spell. Fay of old and Fay of new, take me back to what I once knew. I opened my eyes as the ruby began burning against my hand. Flowing from the stone was a wispy whirlwind, which expanded in front of us to create a spinning portal, one large enough for all of us to walk through at once. My gut nodded nervously. The portal was red, like the ruby. We couldn't see what lied beyond. Theo stomped his hoofs. You sure about this, Emma? No, I said as I placed the dagger in my bag. But what choice do we have? I pulled myself onto Ethan's back and threaded my hands into his soft fur, holding on tight. Ethan crouched. He shook his tail as he said, I trust you, Onawilka. Hang on. Ethan bounded toward the portal. I closed my eyes as the portal enveloped us completely, hoping to the gods it didn't spit us out on another planet we didn't know. I smelled the meadow around the Willow Maiden before I saw it. I opened my eyes and felt spring sunlight encompass me as Ethan sailed through the portal and back to Melovia. He landed on his feet and stumbled. I went flying off, rolling into the base of the Willow Maiden with my head still spinning. I looked around. We'd spent hours in Edenmire, but by the sun's position, it didn't look like any time had passed here at all. Milana was right. Time moved differently there. You all right? I felt Ethan's hands lift me up. He was a man again and set me upright. I leaned against the base of the Willow Maiden. I was back in my normal clothes, and as far as I could tell, my wings, tail, and wolf ears were gone. I shook my head to clear it. Yeah, I think so. Whee! There was a happy cheer as Odette and Theo jumped through the portal with all the grace of a horse and his rider. They landed gracefully and Odette slid off Theo's back before he changed into a man. Alexei flew through the portal with Kiara on his back. He helped her off, though he looked a little dizzy as he became a man again. Are you okay? Kiara asked in concern. Alexei rubbed his temple. I'm fine. 
the headaches get bad when there's a lot of emotion, you know? I was about to ask who was getting emotional until Stefan and Delmer emerged through the portal, making out the whole way. Fucking really? Okay, you two, get a room, I teased. Now that the floodgates were open and Delmer no longer felt the need to hide her feelings, they were being totally gross. Stefan pried his mouth away from Delmer's and pointed at me. In a moment, what are we doing with that thing? He gestured to my bag. I withdrew the dagger. It looked even more splendid here than it did on Edenmire. The silver had an exceptional glisten to it, and the ruby's red color was so vibrant, it appeared to not be of this world. I think it needs to go to Delmer, I said, handing it to her. It feels right. Me? Delmer balked as she took the dagger in hand. Why? You're the world weaver. I think each crystal should go to its main faction, I said. Not to mention I don't feel safe holding on to them all. If the crystals are in one place, it makes it easier for Gabby and Elijah to find them. If we keep them separate, there's a better chance of keeping them in our possession. Dalmer nodded. I agree. I'll keep this safe for you, Emma, until the time is right to use it again. Are we using it again? Alexi asked aloud. I mean, Ademaya is cool, but it's kind of dangerous. I shrugged. If we figure out there's more stones in Edemire than on Earth, we'll have to. Kiara tapped her chin. I can do some research about it. I don't know much about the Crystals of Harmony, but there have to be some clues out there on where they are. The way that dagger healed Stefan was amazing, Ethan said. His voice was filled with excitement as he said, Maybe we can use it to heal Emma. There was a long, dramatic pause that was full of tension. Panic crossed the faces of my friends. In a small voice, Odette uttered, Heal Emma? Ethan's face fell flat when he realized what he'd let slip. He glanced at me in a panic, but I shook my head to let him know it was all right. It was time. My friends needed to know. I gestured toward the tree. I should probably talk to you guys about something. Oh my gosh. Emma, are you sick? Are you dying? Odette gushed. Her eyes welled with tears. I shouldn't have been so mean to you. I'm so sorry. It's not like that. Please sit down, I said. The eight of us sat at the base of the Willow Maiden. The companions took their place next to the marked as they watched me expectantly, waiting anxiously. Ethan was at my side. His cheeks were tinged with embarrassment. I'm sorry, Emma. I didn't mean to tell them. Tell us what, Delmer said. Her tone was pissed, but she looked more upset than anything. I took a deep breath. Ethan extended his hand, and I took it, squeezing it tight. This was so hard to tell people about. I almost lost the courage. Ethan's warm hand in mine was the only thing that made me feel strong enough to forge on. I'd kept my condition a secret for so long, but now I was bringing it into the light. The truth is, I am sick. I've been sick since I was born, before I came to Arcania University, I said. I just didn't tell anyone. What do you have? Out of everyone, Kiara was remaining calm, her eyes wide with curiosity instead of fear. It's called Common Variable Immune Deficiency Disorder. It's a genetic disease and very rare part of a group of primary immune conditions, I explained. Basically, my immune system doesn't make antibodies the way it should, so I have a hard time fighting off illnesses. My eyes went to Stefan. I've been seeing your mom about it. She's been helpful. Stefan nodded thoughtfully. Odette's eyes watered with tears. Does that mean you're going to die? She peeped. I sighed. Well, not really. It's not like cancer. It's chronic. People with CVID can have short lives, but they can have long ones, too. I'm working hard to take care of myself. I take treatments every Friday, I put plasma into a medicine pump, and that pump delivers me antibodies through needles in my stomach. That way, I can have a normal life. Well, kind of normal, anyway. It's why you've been sick all semester, Delmer said, and her eyes narrowed. I knew there was something going on with you. And why you're so tired all the time, Kiara added. Yes, I told Ethan, but only because he's my mate. I've been afraid to tell the rest of you. I dropped my head. I didn't want you to treat me differently, or think I was weak. 
I know the Arcania world is all about strength, and this disease makes me more fragile than a lot of people. Theo made a shh sound. None of us have mistaken you for weak, Emma. We don't want to get punched in the nose. A couple of people laughed, including me. It relieved some of the tension. So what are some of the complications? Kiara asked. It helped that she was asking questions instead of freaking out or being weird about it. Mmm, for starters, I get a lot of viruses and infections because I can't fight them off as easily. And I'm more susceptible with problems in my lungs. People with CVID have a lot of gastrointestinal issues too, I said. So that's the reason for you going gluten-free. I thought it was some fad thing you were doing for skating, down there said. I scoffed. I wish. I've had to cut out a lot of my diet because of this thing. Not chocolate, though, Odette peeped. You love chocolate. Chocolate is very good. Ethan nudged me. We all know Emma's not giving up her sweets. I giggled. Well, not yet. Alexi raised a hand. All of us looked at him. Stefan said, Dude, you don't gotta do that. This isn't class. He blushed. I was just trying to be polite. No, it's okay, I said. What did you want to ask? Alexi paused. Well, I can always feel your emotions changing, but I never knew why. Your mood must fluctuate depending on the strength and weakness of your immune system. That's exactly it, I said, marveling at Alexi's empathy powers. A weak immune system can influence the chemicals in your brain. One of the ways I can tell I'm getting a cold is if I get depressed for no reason and can't figure out why. That makes sense, Alexi said. Is there a cure for it? Odette asked innocently. There must be, right? My stomach dropped. This was one of my least favorite questions. Well, not yet. But there's new research coming out every day. There might be a cure, Ethan said in a rush. We can use one of the crystals of harmony. You don't have to be sick, Em. My heart twisted inside my chest. I didn't want Ethan to get my hopes up. Besides, I was stuck with this, and as much as I hated my illness sometimes, it was a part of me and had become a piece of who I was. Couldn't he accept me like this for how I was, like how I accepted him with this missing leg? I knew he didn't want me to suffer, but even with my illness, I wanted to be enough for him. I don't know if it works like that, Dalmere said. What if the dragon stone only works to heal dragons? We have a woven stone, Ethan pointed out. We can use that. It might work. Sorry, but I'm not willing to let you stab me with a sword to find out, I grumbled. Ethan opened his mouth to object, but Kiara cut in. If we don't know how the healing magic of the crystals work, we shouldn't be messing around with it, she said. We can't be experimenting with Emma's health until we're absolutely sure. Ethan frowned, but he didn't say anything more. I was relieved. I didn't want to talk about the subject further. I'd become accustomed to my illness and was working it out on my own. Ethan helping me without asking me what I really wanted would only hurt me in the long run. Of course, I wanted to be cured, wanted to be healed. But I'd been so sick in the past year that I couldn't picture a life without this disease anymore. I'd had symptoms long before I was ever diagnosed. It'd taken me over and changed everything about my life. I'd do anything for a cure, but I didn't want to get tangled in delusions and fantasies. I could be happy without chasing after something I might never have. As much as my disease sucked, I'd grown content with it. For now, anyway. So you're going to be okay, Delmer stated, her voice hanging on the precipice I might not be. I'm going to be fine, I told her. This disease isn't easy, but I can handle it as long as you guys support me. The hardest part of it all is dealing with how other people treat me. I don't want to be discriminated against or made to feel like I'm less because I have a condition I can't control. Kiara got up and gave me a hug. We're going to be with you, Emma. Screw everybody else who looks down on you because of this. Yeah. Delmer flung her arms around me. Screw other people. If they think you're weak, I'll kick their ass. Odette ran to me to join the group hug. I embraced my girls. They knew how to make everything better. Fuck CVID. So long as I had my friends, it didn't stand a chance. Odette pulled away from the hug and straightened up, putting her hands on her hips. Well, since we're all getting secrets out in the open, you boys should probably know that Eli killed Professor Waldron. Odette! 
Kiara and Delmere exclaimed while I face-palmed. Alexei, Theo, and Stefan's mouths all dropped open in surprise, eyes widening. Ethan put on a shocked face, but I wasn't fooled. He already knew this due to his work as the Phantom. What? Odette cried. I thought we were coming clean about everything. Well, I guess we are now, Kiara said, rubbing her eyes. Hey, I was surprised Odette had kept the secret this long, so go her. Stefan leaned forward and said, What do you mean Eli killed Waldron? How do you know? We overheard him talking to Gabby at the King's Ball last semester, I explained. He admitted to doing it and said the Black Claw had proclaimed him the Hidden King, their leader. Gabby also confessed to attacking Morgan too, though she thought it was me. Both of them are killers, but we don't have any proof, so we can't turn them in. Gabby was trying to hurt you last semester? Ethan burst. This was a piece of information he didn't know. His expression was obviously murderous. Calm down. You can't lose your shit with her or she'll hurt you, I said. This is why we didn't say anything. Ethan remained silent, but still, he was close to erupting again. It's not fair you guys kept this from us. For the first time, Alexei looked angry. His expression became stony as he said, We had a right to know. At first, we were worried about the contest. We didn't want Ethan distracted, I said. And then, I don't know, I fucking hate Gabby with a passion, but that bitch scares me. We were afraid if we told you, you guys would be in danger. Or Ethan would lose his shit and hunt Gabby down for trying to hurt Emma, Delmere added. I'm not ruling the idea out. Ethan growled through clenched teeth. I rolled my eyes. Stop. You don't know what you're dealing with. If Gabby and Eli could kill Waldron in such a cruel manner, there's no telling what they could do to us. Right. Which is why there can be no more secrets in this group, Stefan said firmly. We're working together now to get the stones and save the country. We have to be open and honest with each other about everything. Stefan's eyes landed on Ethan and I. His heavy stare made me feel guilty, but I knew it wasn't just for me. It was for Ethan, too. My mate shifted uncomfortably as he said, I agree. No more secrets. Not from this point on. I waited for a confession from him that he was the Phantom, but he said nothing more. My spirit cried. He was such a liar. But I was one, too. And if he couldn't come clean about the Phantom, I wasn't saying a word about the White Rose. There was only one secret left, the one that separated Ethan and I. And by the dark look in his eyes, I don't think Stefan was willing to keep it any longer. Very soon, the truth would come out. I feared the chaos that would reign when it did. What if Ethan thought I betrayed him once he discovered I was the White Rose? What if he hated me for it? What if he broke up with me? He wouldn't do that, would he? He couldn't. Mates didn't break up. But they could reject each other. And that's what I feared, being abandoned by my companion. I wasn't ready to deal with that reality. Though I longed to be honest, I didn't want to lose Ethan. I loved him. Weren't pretty lies better than harsh truths if those lies kept my shifter by my side? Once Ethan knew I was his arch nemesis, he wouldn't want me anymore. I was almost certain of it. So I had to put a mask on and keep pretending for as long as I could. Though I knew this couldn't go on forever, the clock would eventually strike midnight, and I'd lose my Prince Charming as the fantasy came to a bitter end. Chapter 21 Ethan Is this really necessary? Emma asked. I had Emma by the hand and was pulling her down the hallway. Excitement brewed in my stomach as we wandered the halls of Arcania University on May 7th, eager to surprise her. I told you I wanted to give you a birthday present, I teased. We just have to get there. Emma frowned. If this is some kind of... We climbed the stairs to the rec room. As we rounded the corner, there was a loud chorus of, Happy birthday! Emma's mouth dropped open. Delmare, Stefan, Odette... Theo, Kiara, and Alexi were standing around a table that was holding a massive blue and white birthday cake. Blue streamers hung from the walls. Odette flung a handful of blue glitter up into the air, while Alexi blew on a noisemaker. 
presence floated in midair, suspended by a spell. You guys really didn't have to do this, Emma said as she approached the table with a smile. The glitter Odette had thrown shimmered in the air. She'd used her illusion magic to morph it into a bird, and it flew in circles over our heads. Of course we did. Now shut up and blow out your candles, Delmare said. Emma knelt by the cake. She closed her eyes and made a wish before blowing the candles out in one go. People clapped, and Kiara began cutting the cake. She handed out a slice to Emma, and she took a bite eagerly, her eyes lighting up. I know it's your favorite. Carrot cake, I laughed. The grossest cake of all, Odette said, bunching up her nose. She'd made it clear when we'd ordered it that she did not like carrot cake. She was going to skip on eating a piece, but when Theo gave her a stern look, she took a small one. We'd all been on Odette about eating enough to nourish herself since she'd gotten back. Her portion sizes weren't quite back up to what they should be, but at least she wasn't skipping meals anymore, though I wasn't sure if she was truly recovered. She ate because the rest of us made sure to attend her every meal. I didn't know what she would do if she was alone. Emma took another bite and rolled her eyes in bliss. It's heavenly. Thanks, Ethan. She gave me a kiss on the cheek, and my heart glowed. We should go get drinks tonight, Stefan suggested, as he dove into a giant piece. Toast to Emma making it another year. A long-ass year, Emma added. Theo's eyes sparked. Drinks do sound like quite the treat, he said. Count me in. I frowned. I apologize. I wish I could go. There's a masquerade party I'm obligated to attend. Emma's face fell. Tonight? Do you have to? Unfortunately, the coronation is tomorrow. The masquerade is a party to celebrate before tomorrow's ceremonies. I'm required to make an appearance. I said. Talking about Elijah and Gabby's coronation left a bad taste in my mouth. There was still a chance to stop it, but only if I went to the masquerade. Just don't show up, Delmare said. Stick it to the assholes at the top. You're forgetting it's a full moon, I said. Gabby will be at the party, but at some point she'll have to leave in order to perform her ceremony. I plan to follow her properly this time and get it on tape. If I can obtain the evidence she's using unseely magic, I can stop the coronation tomorrow. If our theories are right, and that is what she's doing. The last time you did this alone, you screwed it up, Stefan pointed out. Some of us should go with you. I'd agree, but the masquerade is invitation only, I quipped in an annoyed voice. None of you will be let in. Doesn't that mean I'm invited as well? Emma asked. I frowned. I'm sorry, Emma. Due to your affiliation with black magic during the contest, you've been prohibited from attending all royal events, including the masquerade and the coronation tomorrow. The only reason I'm going is because my mother bullied Stuart Solomon into giving me a ticket. The circle didn't want me there. She scowled. She knew that was a smack in the face to exile the mate of the prince regent. We'll be outside the castle anyway, Kiara offered. If any of us see Gabby head into the woods, we'll follow her as well. And this time, we'll get a recording. Theo waved his cell phone in the air. We can celebrate my birthday tomorrow, Emma said. This is our last chance to get them off the throne. If we fail, it'll be near impossible to discredit them once they become king and queen. Exactly, I confirmed. This is our final shot. Let's make it count. As the full moon rose, I donned my white tuxedo and headed down the stairs of the palace to the main ballroom, where the masquerade was already in full swing. Gabby had picked out the theme for this party, and it looked nothing like the king's ball. That had been a party full of light and decoration. The lights were dim at the masquerade, with only candlelight to show the way. Everything had been swathed in colors of black and red, from the drapes hanging from the ceiling to the red tablecloths coating the round tables. The china had been replaced with gold plates, and the string band played a low and ominous song that sounded like some music out of hell. Some party. I had chosen a simple white and gold mask to cover the upper portion of my face. I looked very out of place here. 
The guests had dressed in dark colors. I was certain I had to know some of these people, but it was hard to tell who was who when everyone was wearing a mask. I could tell who Gabby and Elijah were, though, simply because they sat at the head of the room on two golden thrones, lording over the people. They'd chosen matching black outfits with red masks, Gabby's a luxurious ball gown, and Eli's a velvet tuxedo. Servants constantly brought them wine and hors d'oeuvres, waiting on them hand and foot while both barked orders. I was keeping an eye on them. My friends were stationed around the palace at all entrances, hiding in the woods and waiting for Gabby to leave the party in order to partake in her ceremony. I worried our theory was wrong, and we wouldn't catch her doing anything tonight, sealing their coronation tomorrow. But I couldn't afford to think like that. Everything was on the line. Gabby had to slip up. An hour passed, and Gabby didn't do anything but dance with Elijah and fawn with her ladies-in-waiting. As the eleventh hour drew near, I began to get nervous. If Kiara's suspicions were correct, Gabby had to perform the ceremony at midnight for it to work. We still had a few hours before then, but the fact that Gabby hadn't left yet to prepare had me very concerned. I heard gasps of surprise, and the music in the ballroom ceased. I turned. My jaw dropped open when I saw a woman standing in the entryway of the ballroom. Her brown hair was fashioned into a low chignon at her neck. Her face was covered by a diamond eye mask that dazzled and sparkled. She had on red lipstick and heavy makeup that shrouded her eyes in black. She was wearing an expensive white dress that was made of lace, with a halter neckline that had dozens of pearls sewn around the collar. Long white gloves ended at her elbows, and she walked in flats. The white rose. I was certain it had to be her. Everyone at the party stared. She'd certainly made an entrance. Elijah smiled. He got off his throne and walked across the room to the woman. He lifted her hand in a way that was supposed to be regally polite, but looked more predatory. May I introduce you to my special guest of the night? Many of you know her as the White Rose. Whispers ran throughout the ballroom, and my blood boiled. She had a lot of nerve coming here on this night. You've all heard of Delinska's menace, the Phantom, Elijah said. That vigilante has caused quite a lot of trouble for the Arcania Alliance and for me. I'm proud to say that the White Rose has prevented the Phantom thus far from continuing to plague the city and harm our people. As my thanks, she is here as my guest of honor. Polite applause rang out, but I couldn't bring myself to clap. Elijah and Gabby had hired her for security. Somehow, they'd caught on to what we were doing. The White Rose was here to stop me from following Gabby tonight, by any means necessary. The White Rose's stare was blank, and her lips were thin. She didn't show any emotion whatsoever. She didn't even flinch when Eli raised her hand to kiss it, before allowing it to drop slowly at her side like a dancer. Elijah caught my smoldering gaze and grinned. "'Cousin, why don't you dance with my little Rose?' he crooned. The two of you would make a fine date, seeing as how your mate is absent. I couldn't refuse, not with an audience. I bowed stiffly to the white rose and said darkly, My lady. I held out an arm. Elijah's devious smile was on me as the white rose reached out and took it. Her touch sent lightning bolts ricocheting across my skin, and I hated it. The band struck up again, that same somber tune. Gods, it was like a funeral march. Who could manage to dance to this dull monotone? Apparently, the White Rose could, because she took my hand in hers and placed the other on my shoulder. I took her waist, and we began to turn alongside the other couples in the middle of the dance floor. I was keenly aware of Gabby and Elijah on the outside of the circle, watching us like cats watch mice. But their gaze could burn into me all they wanted, and I wouldn't feel it. I only had eyes for the White Rose. Since she'd arrived, she'd captured my attention, making me forget about even the mission. The way she danced was eerie. It was like experiencing deja vu, as if repeating some kind of dream or nightmare. 
I was caught between the two. I can't quite figure you out, I muttered lowly under my breath. No one could hear us, but even so, my heartbeat picked up in anticipation when I spoke. There's nothing for you to understand. I'm no riddle, she replied in that cold, sultry voice of hers. My chest stirred, but lust was replaced by rage as I remembered what she'd done to Emma. You tried to kill my mate. So I did, she said. You should feel lucky my hand slipped. I nearly lost my temper and exploded into a wolf, but instead I yanked her closer to me. I heard her let out a gasp of pain as my hand tightened on hers. If we weren't in a crowded ballroom right now, I'd kill you. But we are, she breathed, and you can do nothing about it. The anger inside me simmered. Who are you? How do you know who I am? I hissed. You're easy to figure out. She looked up at me through long lashes. You aren't as clever as you think, or as secretive. This is what Stefan had warned me about. No matter how careful I was, people would always find out. You have to be a student at the school, I insisted. Why are you working for Gabby? Do you want to see her on the throne? We do what we must, for the people we love, she snapped. My mind worked. Was this woman being manipulated or blackmailed? Was she not as evil as I had previously assumed? No, I couldn't believe that. She'd stabbed Emma. That was unforgivable. But still, if she needed my aid, I had to offer it, if only to get her out of the way. If they're threatening you, I can help, I said lowly. You don't have to work for them. Yes, I do. She sent a nervous glance over her shoulder before adding, There's more at stake here than you understand. If you would inform me, perhaps I could lend a hand. The white rose bit her lip, and her eyes darted frantically. It was the most emotion I'd seen her have all night. She was definitely making a decision whether or not to let me in. Finally, she uttered, If you want to stay alive, you need to keep away from Elijah and Gabby. That's the best advice I can give you. Leave them up to me. To you? You're defending them. For now. Whose side are you on? I demanded. We could work together and end this tyranny. I don't need a partner. I work alone, she argued. When people are around me, they tend to get hurt. Trust me. Ugh. She had a vigilante complex, like me. I never got how annoying it was until I was on the other side of it. Look, if we don't stop them, tonight, there's going to be real consequences for the people of Malovia. You don't want that to happen. Anything personal that's getting in your way has to be sacrificed. You don't know what I want, her voice blazed then, and she pushed me away. I took a surprised step back. No one with any diplomacy would do that in a social situation. She was a commoner. Another clue. A few were staring, but most kept their eyes averted. The white rose clearly made everyone nervous. Her hands balled into fists. Stay out of my way, Ethan. Don't get involved with Gabby tonight. If you try, there are going to be consequences. She swept away and out of the ballroom. My heart pounded. I was furious and embarrassingly aroused at the same time. I despised myself for being attracted to the woman who tried to kill my mate. I was a worthless adulterer. I waited, but the white rose did not return to the ballroom. She must have run off someplace else. A curious thing to do, since she was supposed to be Gabby and Elijah's security. But maybe this was her plan, to keep playing games, to lure me away from Gabby when this was my last chance to stop her. I couldn't watch the White Rose and Gabby at once, but if I did nothing, when the time came to follow Gabby into the woods, the White Rose would find me again and prevent me from catching her in the act. My friends might be able to stop Gabby, but I didn't want to depend on other people. It wasn't that I didn't trust them. It was Gabby I didn't trust, and she'd slipped by us one too many times already. I checked the massive clock hanging overhead, wherever the White Rose had gone. I still had time to find her, 
and take care of her before I had to be back here. The White Rose had her reasons for protecting Gabby and Elijah. Whether they were pure or motivated by hate, I wasn't sure. But they didn't matter. I had to end the White Rose. Before midnight came and I lost my chance to follow Gabby for good, and I knew I couldn't be merciful. If the White Rose was permitted to live, she'd stop me somehow. The good of Malovia, the good of my people, depended on me taking her life. I had no other choice. It was time to change into a suit of another kind. Chapter 22 Emma I had a choice to make, and it had to be tonight. If I stopped Ethan from following Gabby, Malovia would be doomed. Elijah and Gabby would be crowned tomorrow, and they'd take over everything. I'd be forcing the Fae into a life of servitude. And if I didn't, Malovia would be saved, but Ethan would not. Gabby would know it was him who followed her. She'd turn him in. The Arcania Alliance would arrest him, or worse, kill him. Ethan would gladly make that sacrifice for his country. He'd die or go to prison to save the Fae. As much as I knew what the right thing to do was, I just couldn't stomach it. Because I was selfish. I couldn't believe I was willing to sacrifice an entire nation just to keep Ethan at my side, but I was seriously considering the idea. Malovia or Ethan? The two swirled in my mind and mixed together to become one. I couldn't rescue one without damning the other. I had to save them both. I had one plan tonight. I would get the footage on Gabby and use it against her to put us in a stalemate so I no longer had to do her dirty work. I couldn't share the information about her using dark magic even if I wanted to, for if I did, she'd expose Ethan and I'd lose my mate. To protect him, I had to get on even footing with Gabby. I'd figure out a way to explain it to my friends later. Once I could blackmail her, the playing field would be even. Perhaps afterward, we could find a way to stop her and Eli without putting Ethan in jail. But as for this night, my only goal was to get her on tape using black magic so I'd no longer be her puppet. I needed help. I couldn't do this by myself. After my dance with Ethan, I wandered the empty halls of the palace, searching until I found the chapel near the northeast tower. Stained glass windows lined the stone walls, and the wooden pews were desolate and empty. Statues portraying each of the gods lined both sides, with Tomir at the front near the altar. It wasn't as beautiful as the Cathedra da Dubuina, but it was still pretty. That wicked music coming from the ballroom had long faded. I headed to the right side of the room and fell to my knees in front of the Milana statue. She seemed so fake like this now that I had seen her with my own eyes. Her face was stone cold and void of passion. I didn't know how people could pray to idols like this, but here I was, begging for help. I lit a candle at the altar and conjured the illusion of a white rose before I laid it across the feet of the statue as an offering. Goddess, help me, I pleaded. Show me the right path. Tell me what the right decision is. Milana only responded with a quiet voice inside that whispered, The choice is in your hands. It felt like she was telling me whatever road I chose would be the right one, which was wholly frustrating. I wanted a clear answer, not a vague philosophy that every decision I made would be led by fate. I'd been forced to come here tonight by Gabby. She wanted to taunt Ethan, and I wasn't brave enough to say no. Dalmer and Stefan were covering for me. They made up excuses to tell the others, but both of them had told me this was the last time they would. They insisted I needed to tell Ethan the truth. As badly as I wanted to, I'd seen the look in Elijah's eye when he had taken my hand and guided me to the middle of the ballroom, parading me around like a prize. I was his puppet, and he wanted me to know it. He had me under his control. If I did anything, anything that was out of line, he'd make my mate pay for it. And I refused to put Ethan in pain. No matter what it cost me, not even my dignity was worth it. 
So when he showed me off to his court and demanded that I toy with Ethan like he was my doll, I wasn't in a position to tell him to go fuck himself. That could all change tonight if I could give a singular confession. Ethan might leave me for it. He might not want to be my mate anymore. But at this point, losing him wasn't as painful as lying to him. It was tearing me up inside. I'd sold so many pieces of my soul to keep this lie, I wasn't sure if there was anything left to give. I heard footsteps on the stone floor. I jumped to my feet immediately, heartbeat quickening. At first, I thought it might have been Elijah or Gabby, but my guts twisted when I recognized the mask. Shadows fell across the phantom's face as he remained in the darkest part of the cathedral. I didn't think a witch like you had any loyalty to the seven gods. It was a terrible insult to call a fae a witch, but I hadn't grown up in this society, so I let the comment roll off my shoulders. I let him call me a heretic. He wasn't going to goad me into attacking him. Not here. I claim sanctuary, I said. You can't touch me in the chapel. It's against the law of the gods to fight on sacred ground. The phantom sneered. No, but you have to come out at some point, because if you don't, you won't be able to stop me from following Gabby. The silence between us was so loud I thought it might break my ears. I wasn't about to sit here and have a staring contest with Ethan until midnight, but neither could I stop him from going after Gabby. Though I'd thought the decision had been in my hands all along, I was wrong. I had no power over this only destiny in it. I fled. I ran in the other direction, searching for a way out. There was a small door in the corner meant for priestesses. I took it and ran. The phantom was on my tail. I hurtled down the hallway as fast as I could bear to run. Thank the gods I'd worn flats and not heels. I heard the phantom's heavy footsteps as he pursued behind me, and panic grew in my chest. The sound of the string quartet returned, and it grew louder and louder in my pounding ears as the phantom gave chase. I had to get away from him. I turned down several hallways trying to misdirect him, but he didn't slow. It was useless trying to outrun a prince in his own palace. He knew every twisting hallway in this place, and I could barely get around. Our running shadows flew along the walls against the casting of candlelight, the phantom and I, a beast running to take down his prey. I heard the swishing of a blade and ducked to the side. A knife sliced into my shoulder before it embedded itself in the wall, drawing blood and taking a lock of my hair. I gasped, holding my shoulder and looking at the throwing knife in the tapestry beside me, shocked. Had he really done that? He'd been aiming for my head. I got my answer seconds later when Ethan threw another knife at me. I had to twist to the side to avoid it. I watched as it flew past my eyes. Okay, he was really trying to kill me. This wasn't a game. Ethan, stop! He wasn't giving me any time to explain. The phantom lunged forward. He grabbed my arm and twisted it behind my back sharply, causing it to sprain. I cried out in pain, and the phantom gave a satisfied hiss. Tears sprang to my eyes. If he wrenched any harder, he'd break it. And he was going to. I knew he would. I'd seen him do worse to cultists without hesitation. To get away, I stuck my leg out and swept his own out from under him, so he fell backwards. He let me go, and I was able to scramble out of the hold, my arms still throbbing. I kept going. I had a head start as he clambered to his feet. I was quickly running out of breath. I couldn't run much longer. I had to find a place to hide. Except this palace was more like a maze. There was no hiding places to be found. I tried several doors, but all of them were locked. Not a soul wandered these hollowed chambers, all of them preoccupied with the masquerade. I heard the phantom again. He was catching up. There was a stairwell that wound to another floor. There was no place to go but skyward. I took the stairs, lifting my skirt to flee as I heard the phantom slam the door against the wall of floor below. Up and up we wound. My breath was labored now. The phantom was catching up. At any moment, he'd get his hands on me. I could almost feel him breathing down my neck. The roof. 
If I could get to the roof, I could fly away. Ethan didn't have wings. He couldn't pursue me. I pushed myself onward, past the knives stabbing my lungs, ignoring the blood from my shoulder that was staining my dress, running down my twisted arm. I got to the final floor, which had a doorway to one of the tower's rooftops. I busted it open. I flung myself against the door so hard I ended up falling on my face. I scrabbled upward. My shoes slipped on the blood dripping from my wound and I almost tripped again, but I miraculously kept my balance. As I rose upward, the phantom burst through the doors and I turned to face him with a pounding heart. The wind howled, whipping my dress around my legs and tearing my hair free of its updo as the full moon shone down from above. If I brought my wings out in front of him now, he'd know who I was. My identity would be revealed. But did that matter when he was literally trying to murder me? I tried to fly, tried to do something, but my wings wouldn't come. A horrified expression crossed my face, and the phantom smirked when he noticed. I threw out my hands, tried to call a spell, but sparks flickered uselessly in the air and failed. Illusion magic didn't work when you were this terrified. Fey magic didn't manifest when there was fear. You had to believe to get the spell to work. And I didn't believe I could defend myself from the phantom. Not like this. I'd beaten him before because he hadn't been serious about taking me down. He was serious now, and it was deadly. I hadn't been so fucking stupid as to not have a weapon on me. My dagger was holstered to my leg underneath my dress. I lifted my skirt and wrenched it free, pointing it at the phantom to defend myself. Ethan, if you do this, there's no going back, I warned. My voice was so scared. You'll be past the point of no return. The phantom wrenched a dagger out of the sheath belted to his side. I've already made up my mind. This is what I must do. For my country. Ethan swung his dagger downward. I parried away his blow with my own, though it was a weak attempt. It wasn't seconds later before his blade was stabbing forward again. I was so frantic I couldn't do much but jump out of the way and avoid his dramatic advances. He was pressing in on me, making me lose ground. His blade moved so fast I could hardly keep up. The edge of the dagger nicked at my face and once upon my thigh. I'd never been so scared in my life. I didn't want to hurt Ethan, but at this point, it was almost kill or be killed. He wasn't giving me enough time for an explanation. Would I have to decide between his life and mine? I'd nearly made the choice before he knocked my dagger out of my hand. It flew away from my fingers and sailed over the wall surrounding the roof, leaving me defenseless. I backed to the very edge of the rooftop and nervously peered over to the ground far below. If I jumped from here, would my wings save me? A pit in my stomach said, probably not. You tried to kill my mate, he growled. Now I'm going to kill you. Ethan, it's me, I shouted. Am ah! Before I had time to finish my name, my own damn name, he had lunged forward and stabbed me. He ran his blade across my middle, cutting my dress and slicing open my tender torso. I spun and dropped to my knees as blood poured out of the wound, screaming in utter agony. The cut stung, driving me mad with suffering. I put a shaking hand to the skin and found that it was cleaved in two. This was bad. This was really, really bad. The phantom towered over me, his dark cloak rippling in the fierce wind. There was a hungriness in his eyes that was more demonic than the gaze of Droga himself. It was then I realized there was a dark part of Ethan I couldn't handle, a killer inside of him I couldn't control. I was appalled by it, sickened and horrified. For as much as I loved him, I knew then Ethan wasn't all good. He was a monster. He'd only kept that monster hidden carefully behind a cage. Now that I was faced with it, it was disgusting to see. His lip lifted in a snarl as he stooped down in front of me. Let's see who it is behind the mask. The phantom yanked off my mask. As he did so, the illusion broke. My brown hair turned back to red, my eyes from blue to green. 
My voice changed, and the white fabric of my dress turned red as hot liquid spewed across its center. As my mask clattered to the ground, Ethan physically staggered backward. His mouth dropped open in a combination of utter horror and complete shock, terror flashing in his eyes as the dagger fell from his hand. Emma? Tears ran down my face. I held my side, gritting my teeth to speak through the pain as blood poured from my side. You can take the mask off now, Ethan. <laughs> it's all over. Chapter 23 Ethan No thought permeated my mind except the notion that this was a terrible betrayal. My heart was racing and breaking at the same time. Emma was the White Rose? She was the one who had tried to stop me from ending the Black Claw? The one who tried to prevent me from ending Elijah and Gabby's reign of terror? This wasn't right. It didn't add up. You can't be the White Rose, I said in a rush. You, you were attacked by her. How does that make any sense? This has to be some kind of illusion. Answer me. I was bellowing, on the verge of losing control. Emma winced and forced out. Delmare took my place. It was a setup. She and Stefan knew. No one else. Delmare and Stefan were in on this ridiculous charade? Who else had stabbed me in the back? Ethan, I'm going to bleed to death. Emma's face was turning white, voice faint as she began to slump to the side. A sick horror infected me when I realized then what I'd done. It's like I transformed from one person to the other in seconds. Gods, Emma, I hurt you. You fucking stabbed me, she hissed, blood leaking from her fingers. I knelt by her side, observing the injury. My insides twisted with guilt as I saw the gnarled wound. I'd done this to my mate. I didn't deserve to live. My self-hatred wasn't going to save Emma's life. She had to get care. I couldn't take her to the hospital. I'd reveal her as the White Rose. I had the instinct that would be a bad idea. Put your mask back on. I lifted Emma into my arms. She sloppily fitted the mask over her face as I began carrying her down the stairs. I didn't know whether Emma was my enemy or my friend, but it didn't matter. I needed to protect my mate. She bunched the skirt of her dress around the wound to hold the blood in as I carried her, though I wasn't sure if she was trying to mend the cut or prevent droplets from scattering across the floor. I stuck to the walls and shadows, feeling nauseated as Emma's limp form settled in my arms. I had to get her to my room. There were supplies in there I could use to stop the bleeding. Both of us bristled when we heard voices. There were guards up ahead. Their armor scraped as they moved. Prince Ethan is missing from the party, I heard one speak. Find him, another ordered. The future king wants him in eyesight. I pressed against a wall as the guards marched by. Emma put a hand over her mouth, tears streaming down her face from the pain of the wound. I'm sorry, Emma. It won't hurt for long, I promised. She didn't answer. I took the winding staircase up and didn't settle until we were safely inside my bedroom. I laid her down on the bed, then locked the door before I rummaged through my trunk, throwing things everywhere. I tossed the hated phantom mask off my face, and it fell to the floor. I refused to wear that wretched thing. It was a reminder of everything reckless I'd become, a dismal memory that I couldn't control my darkest impulses. You don't have anything that can help, Emma protested weakly. Yes, I do. I grabbed a pain relief potion from the trunk and crossed over to Emma. I lifted her neck and dribbled it past her lips. She sipped it slowly and the pupils in her eyes dilated. You have to move your hands, I said briskly. She did, and I ripped the ruined dress in half. She was all but naked underneath, with only a thin pair of panties beneath the dress. When I lifted the fabric away from the wound, blood spilled onto my sheets. I pressed the fabric back down. I didn't puncture any organs, merely sliced the skin on your side, I explained. Merely? Her voice was incredulous. You need stitches. I returned to my trunk. I found a curved medical needle with thread to make sutures, gauze, and alcoholic wipes. I'd stitched myself up from battles with monsters and cultists quite a few times, 
but this would be more painful. I'd be hurting someone I loved, fixing an injury that I caused. But it couldn't be helped, not if I wanted to save her life. I knelt by the bed and showed her the needle. This is going to hurt, even with the potion. I don't fucking care. Do it. She hissed in pain as I used the alcohol to clean the wound before I pushed the needle in, but didn't make another complaint. I nearly stopped there, but knew I couldn't, so I pretended like I was working on someone else instead to stop the agony that was crying out inside. Emma tried not to writhe as I stitched the wound shut. I took the bloody pieces of gauze and put them into a bucket I'd placed nearby as I worked. When I'd finished and the wound was closed, I began wrapping her middle with gauze. She tried to get up, but I put a hand on her shoulder and forced her to stay down. You need rest, I said gently. Her face twisted into a visage of rage that shined past the pain. I need to know what got a hold of you back there, she seethed. You tried to kill me. The color drained from my face. If I had known, I wouldn't have... Does it matter? She snapped. Would you do that to someone defenseless? To a cultist? Anyone? It was inhumane. I was trying to protect you. I thought killing the White Rose was the only way to save your life. Her voice was full of condemnation. You didn't even stop to listen. You just wanted to be a butcher. The cold words hit me like a stark look in the mirror, and there was no bearing my reflection. She was right. I was a butcher, and my madness had almost cost Emma her life. If I was a king and could judge myself for such a crime, I'd hang. And gods, I wanted to. I deserved a noose around my neck. My stomach churned with nausea. I couldn't help it. I retched into the bucket. What I'd done to my mate was too overpowering to comprehend. I vomited into the bucket until there was nothing left in me. I grasped for a cup of water on the bedside. As I drank weakly, Emma swallowed. We don't have time to talk about this now, Emma said. I need clothes. For what? Delirium was overtaking my mind, making it hard to concentrate. It's almost midnight, Emma said. We're going after Gabby. I'd completely forgotten about it. She might have left by now, to perform her sixth ceremony to give her more power. The ceremony that would seal her as queen and confirm their coronation tomorrow. Let them. Let her and Eli turn all of Malovia into a burning hell. I no longer cared if it meant I could stay here and serve my mate. Emma could read my mind. We're not giving up, she said fiercely. People are depending on us. You can't fight with that wound. I don't have to. We just have to get that ceremony on tape. No, Emma. Stay, I pleaded. Her emerald eyes narrowed. You don't have any right to argue with me. We're not throwing our last chance away because you fucked up. The coldness in her tone made me shiver. I could not object, merely do as she said. I crossed to my wardrobe. I took out a loose-fitting camisole and a baggy shirt that wouldn't ail her new injury, along with a light jacket, a pair of jeans, and sneakers. I placed them lightly on the bed beside her and bowed, falling to my knees and dropping my head. I felt like a dog that had done wrong and was begging for forgiveness. I sure was walking around here with my tail between my legs. I deserved every second of the guilt. Why do you have those? The edge of fear in her voice made me despise myself all over again. It was like she considered me some kind of creep and not her boyfriend, not her mate. I had new clothes purchased for you and stored in my room, I confessed, in case you ever spent the night. This was not how I'd imagined our first night in my room at the palace would go. Not at all. Emma winced as she began separating the clothes. Do you need my help to get dressed? I asked. I don't want help from you. Emma moved slowly as she slipped the clothes on. I wanted to aid her so badly, but I was afraid of angering her more, so I kept my distance. I changed as well, throwing the phantom rags into the trunk and donning a less conspicuous jacket and jeans instead. After fifteen minutes, Emma was fully clothed. She stood shakily to her feet before she walked to the door and said, Let's go. We walked in silence. People were still looking for us. I grabbed Emma's arm to hold her back before she walked into a hall full of guards. She flinched as I caught her. 
Her reaction wounded me. She didn't want me to touch her. I let her go and said, Not this way. We leave out the back. I turned and led Emma into the servants' hallway, a bare tunnel of stone that the help used to get around the palace faster. The labyrinth was dark and somewhat damp. I kept my eyes peeled for any servants we might come across in case I had to pay them off to keep quiet, but there were none around. They were all at the party. Emma moved at a crawl, putting her hand to her side and wincing every so often. Gods, I felt like my insides were being pummeled. I couldn't look at her without wanting to die. The hallway led to the servants' quarters. They were a variety of rooms packed into a singular dormitory. No one was here, so we used the door to exit the palace and the gardens. No one was guarding the gate that sectioned this part of the wall surrounding the castle. Gabby had made sure the guards were busy, so she could slip by. We made it past the wall and into the forest beyond. I saw the outline of a man in the woods. Stefan was there waiting for us. Where have you guys been? Stefan asked. Gabby went this way ten minutes ago. And you didn't follow her? I asked. I was waiting for your ass to show up. The rest went on ahead, Stefan said. Show us the way. Emma's tone was demanding. Stefan stared at her for a moment before continuing on. My breathing became shallow with every haunting footstep I took. Stefan led us down a winding, dark path that was only big enough for one person to fit through at a time. A path I was certain couldn't end in anything good. Emma stayed close to Stefan. It hurt she relied on him to protect her more than I, but as I reminded myself, she couldn't trust me anymore. I caught a mixture of scents ahead. My friends. They were crouched in the bushes. Stefan didn't utter a greeting, just sank down to the ground next to Delmare. Emma sat between Kiara and Odette. I took the hint and placed myself by Theo and Alexei on the other side. They hardly noticed us come in. Their eyes were focused forward on the hideous sight before us. Gabby was kneeling on the ground, her hands in the dirt as she muttered an Arcanian spell. She was speaking in the unseely language and had drawn a circle around herself with chalk in the dirt. The circle was crossed with several other shapes to form a design that wasn't quite a pentagram, but something more sinister. She'd placed candles around the edge of the circle, and their flames danced beneath the light of the full moon above. Nearby was a singular flask, like one you'd use for potions. Within the center of the circle was an oak tree. Tied to that tree was a newborn fawn, its eyes alight with fear as it kicked out its hooves in a vain attempt to rest free. What the hell is she doing? I thought. I'd never seen anything like this. As Gabby worked, several of my friends held their phones up. Kiara, Theo, and Delmare were all taping the scene, making sure we got the evidence. Gabby pulled out a small knife from inside her dress. She walked toward the deer, face vacant of mercy. The fawn squealed, but Gabby grabbed it by the ears and wrenched back its head, exposing the neck. Disgust flared within me as Gabby slit the deer's throat. The fawn's legs pawed at the dirt as Gabby reached for the flask. She put it underneath the fawn's wound and collected the blood until she had a full glass. The deer finally died, its life fading as Gabby returned to the center of the circle, kneeling again. Emma had tears in her eyes at the brutal scene. She quickly wiped them away. I longed to reach out and comfort her, but my touch would only appall her. At her side, Odette held a singular hand over her mouth, too shocked to move. When the deer had stilled for good, Gabby reached into her dress again. She took out berries and a vial of unknown powder. She sprinkled powder into the potion and crushed the berries inside before she shook it violently. Then she did something shocking. Gabby poured the potion over her head. The blood ran down her hair, face, and dress, making her appear like some pagan monster that had wandered out of the woods and into the nightmares of men. When the glass was half empty, Gabby lifted the warm blood to her lips and drank the rest down, chugging the glass like it was wine. My stomach churned, and I had to suppress the urge to vomit again. Fucking disgusting, I heard Stefan whisper until Delmare told him to shut it. Gabby began to retreat, as Gabby backed out of the circle, still muttering the chant, a hole in the ground began to open up at the place where she'd knelt. 
It was a monstrous black pit, hungry and ebbing. I tried to look down, but there seemed to be no end, a darkness that could swallow up the very world. The pit grew larger and larger. Eventually, the dead deer fell in, before the oak tree toppled into the endless void. She was feeding the underworld, feeding Droga. I thought that horrible pit would keep growing until it consumed the entire world, but it got to the chalk boundary of the circle and stopped. It began shrinking to a smaller size, becoming minuscule. The hole disappeared and there was no sign a ceremony had been done. Both the tree and the deer were gone. Gabby stepped into the middle of the circle. She threw her arms wide and lifted her face to the light of the moon as the chalk circle began to glow, creating an eerie illumination upon her bloody form. The glowing stopped. Gabby wiped the blood from her eyes and kicked the dirt around, erasing the chalk circle before she left the area, continuing on into madness. None of us spoke for long minutes. Not until we were all sure that Gabby was gone and she wasn't coming back. Kiara was the first person to speak. That was definitely unseely magic, Kiara said firmly. There's no doubt about it. Well, duh, Delmare said. Black magic isn't pretty, it's evil. I've seen unseely magic before. It's not all bad. This, this was a monstrosity, meant only for the servants of Droga, Emma said. Kiara sent a worried glance at Alexei. You okay, Lex? Alexei was green. He shook his head as he whimpered. That poor deer. I could feel its terror as it was dying. Felt its pain and sorrow. It was begging her not to kill it. Gabby felt no mercy, only power. That deer was a tool to her, as we all are. Several of us dropped our heads. We hadn't interceded. It felt awful to sit there and do nothing, but we needed to prove she was guilty to the circle. Well, her reign of terror is about to end, Theo said, and he waved his phone in the air. We've got the proof. Emma tried to stand. She let out a cry of pain and she faltered. Odette had to catch her. Delmare moved forward, a concerned expression on her face. I began to sweat as everyone's attention turned toward Emma. Delmare lifted the edge of Emma's shirt and gasped. The fabric fell as she revealed to everyone the massive cut on Emma's side. Holy shit, Emma, Stefan belted. What the fuck happened? Ethan stabbed me, Emma said flatly. That was it. She didn't give any explanation, didn't give a warning, just said it. What? The girls gasped at the same time. Horror shone in their eyes, while dark expressions hooded the faces of Alexi, Stefan, and Theo. The guys moved in front of Emma, like they were trying to protect her from me. Maybe they had to. I didn't know it was her. I thought she was someone else, I said. Like that makes a difference? Emma snarled. What's going on? You need to tell us, Kiara demanded. Her voice rose in rage as she said, Why on earth would Ethan hurt you? Because, Emma stated heavily, I'm the White Rose and Ethan is the Phantom. Delmare's expression fell and Stefan facepalmed. Terror mounted within me as recognition shone on the faces of my friends. Emma had totally blown my secret identity out of the water, and by the smoldering look she sent me, she didn't give a damn. Are you going to tell everyone now? I yelled. Tell the whole world, huh? No. This stays between us. But we promise not to lie to each other in this group, and I'm not playing around anymore, Emma shouted. She gave a frustrated sigh before she stated, I'm tired of lying to my friends. But weren't you attacked by the White Rose? Odette questioned. That was me, Delmare said. Ethan was close to finding out, so I dressed up as the White Rose and attacked Emma as a ruse. Stefan and I have known about both of them for months. We didn't say anything because Emma begged us to keep quiet. Just how much have we been keeping from one another? Theo asked incredulously. Emma let out a hissing noise. This wasn't my choice. Ethan didn't know I was the White Rose. Gabby took me aside at the start of the semester. She had proof Ethan was the Phantom. She threatened me, told me if I didn't stop Ethan from being the Phantom, she'd turn him in and he'd go to jail. 
She made it clear if I told Ethan the truth, she'd kill him. I didn't think I had any other way to stop the Phantom, but to become a vigilante myself. Yet no matter how hard I tried to prevent the Phantom from doing his work, he never got the message. He confronted me tonight on the rooftop of the castle. I tried to tell him it was me, but by the time I did, he'd already hurt me. Guilt knotted my intestines and made my blood run cold. Emma had never betrayed me at all. She'd become the White Rose to try and save me. And I'd failed miserably to save her. From myself. But if Ethan's the Phantom and Gabby knows, then we can't turn her in, Odette said. Prison time is a trade I'm willing to make to get them off the throne, I growled. That's the least of it. You'll be lucky to get by with a prison sentence, Alexei argued. Vigilantism is considered treason in Malovia. They'll cut your head off. Execution is a possibility, Theo said, crossing his arms. Emma's eyes contracted. Delmer chewed at her lips nervously. So what do we do? We can't turn Gabby in if Ethan will be killed. I will walk to the execution block with pride if it means saving my country, I vowed. Like hell we're going to let you do that. Stefan's eyes burned with disgust. I can't believe you, man. I warned you. You took this too far. There was no response I could give that was adequate, because he was right. My actions were uncalled for. Worse, they were that of a monster. I hadn't only failed my mate, I'd failed my friends, too. Yet there were no more words left to utter. An explosion set off nearby rocking the earth beneath our feet. The explosion was loud. It wasn't enough to make my ears ring or create loss of hearing, yet it was close enough to drown out all other sound. I fell to the ground while others grabbed onto trees to steady themselves. I smelled smoke from fire and the residue of gunpowder nearby, the fragments of a spell on the wind, and blood. So much blood. As I looked up, I saw red-hot embers drifting through the air. Emma's face drained of blood, becoming pale white under the light of the moon. Screams began to penetrate the dark night, mingled with the chants of cultists beginning their sacred march. There was no time to argue about what had been done. The palace was under attack. Chapter 24 Emma Come on! I raced toward the palace as fast as my wound would allow. The rest of the group followed me without question. We broke out of the trees, and as the wall surrounding the palace came into view, my guts twisted in horror. Someone had set off explosives, probably dynamite, in the defensive wall. Bodies were strewn everywhere, especially those of guards. Servants ran in a panic while shifters stood in their animal forms, crying out for their mates. Shadows flickered as flames scattered across the rooftop of the palace, sending smoke into the sky. The wall wasn't the only thing that had collapsed. One of the palace's towers had toppled over, leaving nothing but strewn rubble behind. Most of the building was otherwise unharmed, but it wouldn't stay that way for long. Hooded figures with contorted masks marched through the hole in the wall, carrying staffs and wands. They fired magic into the crowd of servants, and a line of people went down. Before I could gather my bearings, illusion spells were flying everywhere. Portals opened near the castle gates, and cultists stepped through. A shifter that had come through one of the portals morphed into a dragon and began ramming himself against the palace doors in an attempt to break through. The palace is under attack, Ethan shouted. We have to stop them. Ethan changed into a wolven. He ran toward the nearest cultist with his fangs bared. As he jumped, the cultist morphed into a wolven himself, and the two wolves snarled at each other as they drew blood. Stefan roared as he shifted into a dragon. He charged at the dragon, trying to ram down the gate, and grabbed onto him with his claws, pushing him back. The opposing dragon gave a vicious cry and swiped his tail at Stefan's face. Stefan avoided the blow and ducked down before he retaliated by breathing fire. Plumes of flame raced by overhead, warming the area until sweat ran down my brow. The ground shook as two dragons warred, causing what was left of the broken tower to crash to the earth. Theo and Alexei followed his lead. 
Theo became an alley coin and ran with his horn down at the cultists, trying to charge them off. A few tripped, and Theo trampled them under his hoofs, letting out a triumphant whinny. Alexei flew through the air as a griffin, grabbing heavy pieces of stone from the rubble and dropping them from overhead. The large bricks hit the cultists that were too slow to dodge out of the way. I didn't have my sword, and I couldn't fight hand-to-hand -hand combat like this. Not when I was so badly injured. The cut on my side still stung so horribly I couldn't move but stiffly. My magic was my only defense. Girls, we have to work together, I cried. Kiara, Odette, and Delmer came to my side, and we formed a circle facing outward. Delmer called battle magic to her hands. She threw bomb after bomb of red illusion magic at the cultists, which exploded on impact and sent bodies flying. Kiara's mouth moved in a whisper as she focused her empathy magic on the nearest cultists. They grabbed at their heads and sank to their knees as they cried out, as if experiencing crippling emotional pain that made it too difficult to move. Odette waved her arms and her eyes sparked as a glowing pink shield settled over our bodies like a halo. The shields engulfed us and outlined our forms, protecting us from any harm. For as much as she goofed off in her faction abilities class, Odette must have been paying attention to Theo because her alicorn shield magic wrapped around each of us and didn't break. Several cultists sent spells our way, but they simply bounced off the shields and ricocheted in all directions. I busied myself with shutting down those portals so no more cultists could get through. I focused my magic on them and ordered them to close, warring with the power of whoever had made the portal on the other side. Some of them closed easily, but others were more difficult, made by Arcania whose magic was equal to my own. I had to pull all my concentration on stopping them until my knees began to quiver and I felt like I was going to faint. I don't know if I can do this, I thought. I felt so weak. There was hardly anything left in me after my fight with Ethan. I didn't know how much more my body had to give. Take heart, young champion, I heard Milana whisper. Magic cannot be performed if you lose faith. I put forth a final burst of effort and several portals shut down all at once, leaving only one left. As I was closing the last portal, an arm slipped through. There was a horrible cry of pain. The portal snapped closed, slicing off the arm of whatever cultist had tried to arrive. My stomach churned as I looked at the dismembered limb on the ground, which was bleeding at the stump. I wondered what cultist had lost it, and where. We'd bought enough time for the guards to reconfigure. The palace's armed forces stormed out from the exits of the castle, their swords held aloft. Shifters began cutting down the main line of cultists, while sorceresses wearing long robes fired off spells behind them. Several cultists pawed at their eyes as the sorceresses gave them the illusion of going blind while others frantically patted at their skin as if they believed they were on fire, screaming in agony at the thought of imaginary flames. Stefan was winning the duel against the other dragon. He had his creature's head in his jaws and was going to bite down. The dragon scrambled to get away, his claws scraping the dirt as he let out low, pleading notes for Stefan to let go. Stefan's eyes glinted like he was considering ending the dragon's life, but instead... Stefan opened his mouth and let the other shifter go, baying his victory and demanding the loser retreat. The dragon gave a yelp and spread his wings, taking off into the night sky. Stefan let out a satisfied snort, smoke emitting from his nostrils. I can't hold on to these shields much longer, Odette whimpered. Her strength was failing. Odette could suspend a singular shield for hours but dividing her attention and shielding all of us at the same time was sucking her magic dry. Theo must have heard Odette's cry, because he galloped over and put his horn to her heart. As he did so, I watched a soft glow emit from his horn, and I felt Odette's shield around me strengthen. They're retreating, Delmer said, and she pointed. I watched as a large group of cultists began running out the hole in the wall, leaving the battle behind them. My heart skipped a beat. Could this be real? This had been an easy battle. The cultists had hardly put up an effort to fight back. Had their attack been so unplanned? Ethan's white fur was stained with blood. Several dead wolvens laid around him, their life force dripping from his muzzle. 
He prowled around the area, looking for more to hunt. I felt sickened as I watched him. He'd been so guilty about stabbing me moments ago, and now he was back for blood again. He jumped into this bloodshed without hesitation, and I became distinctly aware of how murderous he could be. A female cultist who had lost her mask gave a terrified cry as Ethan set his sights on her. He growled, and she ran. She sent a few spells backward, but they bounced off of Odette's shield. She fell upon the ground and backed up, her hood falling back to expose her messy hair. Please, she pleaded, have mercy. There is no mercy for cultists, Ethan growled. You get what you deserve. I opened my mouth to stop him, but before I got a word past my lips, Ethan had taken her life. Her glassy eyes stared out vacantly as Ethan crushed her neck between his jaws. Unlike Stefan, he hadn't let his prey go free. Icy cold disbelief ran through me as Ethan let the body drop to the ground. He looked back at me with unfeeling wolfish eyes. And there was something else inside me at that moment. Absolute loathing. He'd slaughtered that woman without mercy. We'd all hurt people tonight, but in self-defense, in war. That cultist wasn't going to hurt him. She begged for forgiveness. And Ethan hadn't seen reason to give her any. Which was the most horrifying thing I'd seen him do all night. He thought himself fit to be judge, jury, and executioner. I knew then I couldn't love a man like that. It'd be loving a monster. For the majority that had retreated, a few cultists still stood around the palace. There had been hundreds, but for now, it was dozens. Perhaps they were reconvening elsewhere for a second attack? This had to be a trick. Then the palace doors opened. Gabby and Elijah both emerged from their gates. Gabby's dress, skin, and hair were untouched and perfect, leaving no trace of the blood she'd dumped all over herself moments before. She had to be using an illusion spell to disguise her appearance. As the guards kept fighting the cultists, Elijah shouted over the noise, Cultists, this is your last warning. In the name of the gods, stand down now or face the consequences. The cultists drew back from the guards and focused their attention on Elijah. They ran toward him full speed, letting out a unanimous battle cry. It was then Gabby stepped forward. She flung out her hands, casting a spell. Magic flew from her fingertips. As her magic connected with the bodies of the cultists, they froze in place. Their eyes grew wide as marble began to spread from the tips of their boots and up their forms, turning them to stone. As she moved her hand again, the statues toppled over, and the stones shattered into pieces on the ground, making dust rise over the kingdom. In seconds, all the charging cultists had been reduced to were pebbles. I let out a choked gasp, and several others around me did the same. I'd never seen such power in my life. Droga was making Gabby stronger by the day. There was a massive bout of silence that seemed like it was being strangled out of the surrounding crowd. Then a guard shouted, The king and queen have saved us! His colleagues cried out in response, and all at once, soldiers raised their blades to cheer Gabby and Elijah on. Servants fell to their knees, weeping in relief, while others bowed in awe before them as if kneeling before a god. We owe them everything, I heard a servant say. We would have been dead if those cultists kept attacking. The new king and queen have been sent by the gods. More voices rushed around us in the crowd. Such power can only be gifted by Tomir. They were meant to sit on the throne. They will lead the Arcania into a new age. Hurry, tell the annual Arcania to send reporters. All must know of what the king and queen have done, a taskmaster yelled, pushing a servant down the path. The servant broke into a run, heading toward the town. Elijah sent us a smirking smile. Amongst the grand magic performed by Gabby, no one remembered that Prince Ethan and his friends had jumped into the heat of battle to help. As the crowd cheered and applauded, I realized Gabby and Elijah had planned this. 
They staged the attack on the palace from the Black Claw so they would look good. And the cultists they'd killed had been willing sacrifices, eager to give themselves up in hope of being rewarded by Droga in the afterlife. This had all been a setup, and the people were falling for it. Now that they were seen as noble heroes defending the palace, no one would challenge them. Anyone who did would be disregarded by Elijah's subjects. The faces of my friends were shadowed and murderous. Even Odette looked pissed as all hell. I could practically hear Ethan's teeth grinding from here. All the shifters turned back into men as we turned away from the crowd. Stefan let out a low growl as he said, What do we do now? It looked like Abby and Elijah had won, but I wasn't done yet. As Elijah gloated to the audience and accepted their praise, I noticed Gabby slip silently into the palace behind him. I bunched my hands into fists and headed forward. Where are you going? Ethan asked. To make this right, don't follow me, I snapped. I'll meet you all in the inner courtyard at the university, the one with the round pool. Don't do anything else until I get there. I didn't leave any of them time to argue, especially not Ethan. I stomped out of there and wove my way through the crowd that was forcing its way into the palace. Inside, many of the masquerade guests were also singing Gabby and Elijah's praises. She was in here somewhere. I wouldn't be able to corner her for long. No doubt she'd be looking to talk to the press the moment they showed up if she wasn't surrounded by a group of giggling fans. I followed my intuition and entered the first bathroom I came to, where I saw Gabby standing in front of a mirror. Her illusion spell had dropped, her dress and skin were once again covered in the blood of the dead deer, which was dry now. She was bent over the sink and taking deep breaths, obviously trying to recover some stamina. She'd had to rush in here to hide before her magic failed, and she dropped the ruse. Pathetic. Had to take a break after throwing unseelie spells around, I accused. Or is it because you're tired of living the lie? Gabby snorted. Everything in the fey world is about falsity, Sosna. It all depends just how good of a liar you are. You can pull off anything you like, as long as you can make others believe the pretty story. Gabby was right. For as beautiful as this world was, it was totally fake. And I was tired of never experiencing anything that was real. That included Ethan and I. I'm not working for you anymore, Gabby, I said. It's over. Excuse me? Gabby whirled toward me. You're not in a position to bargain. Oh, yes, I am. I yanked the phone out of my pocket. I pressed play and showed Gabby the video of her performing the unseelie ceremony. I'd gotten the whole thing on tape, from her murdering the fawn to her drinking the blood and the hole that had opened up in the earth afterward, sealing her guilt. She didn't react, not at first but her eyes narrowed and I could tell she was being careful as she said, I can get rid of that phone. I have other copies. I was sure to get witnesses, I hissed. Remember, human technology can't be manipulated by magic. Gods, it felt so good to be on the other side of this now after she'd done this to me last semester. Gabby watched the video again. When she said nothing, I added, Everyone thinks you're some kind of powerful sorceress, that you've been blessed by the gods. But what are the people of Malovia going to say once they find out your powers come from dark magic instead of Seely? People won't believe you, Gabby sneered. Videos can't be edited by illusion magic after the fact, but illusions can be caught on tape. If you release that recording now, everyone will think you fabricated an illusion to get me off the throne. It would be easy to say you faked the whole thing to set me up. My stomach dropped. Gabby grinned, sensing she was gaining the upper hand. It's not like that with the video I have on Ethan. People might think it's fake at first, but he has too much circumstantial evidence against him. All I have to do is plant some seeds of doubt in people's minds, and all the little things about him that don't make sense will start adding up. Just the question of if he's the Phantom will be enough to expose him for good. What makes you think I can't do the same to you, huh? I asked. We all know you're too powerful for a first year, and not everyone's so gullible to think you're some saint blessed by the gods. 
Gabby's eyes darted up to mine. It was like she was trying to calculate the risk of telling people she was using unseely magic just to keep me under her thumb. Do you really think people will believe you over me after I saved everyone tonight? I'm a hero to them, and you've been shunned. They won't believe me at first, I responded. But Faye are going to wonder why a 19-year-old sorceress is throwing around spells like a high priestess, and sooner or later, people will start having doubts, even if everyone thinks you're some kind of savior. What do you want? Her nose wrinkled. I paused as I mulled over the question. I could force Gabby to abdicate, but I wasn't sure if it would work. She'd throw me to the circle, and those bastards would get me locked away on some baloney charge, even if I had the video. She was right when she said no one would believe me. I'd cheated in the contest and lost my honor because of it. But this video was enough proof to create questions. Maybe even a rebellion from the people who really hated Unseelie Magic. No matter what Gabby wanted me to believe, this evidence posed a threat to her rule. Yet, there was something more at stake. My mate's freedom. If I showed this video to the world, Gabby would let it be known that Ethan was the Phantom. I wanted to get Gabby and Elijah off the throne so badly, but I needed my mate more. Even if it felt like I was aiding and abetting a murderer and sacrificing my country in the process, we had to obtain the Crystals of Harmony at any cost. And I didn't think I could get them without my mate. Ethan couldn't help us locate the rest of the stones if he was in jail or dead. We had so little time left to find the remaining crystals and repair the portal to Edenmire before all the fade turned to dust. Without him, I didn't think we'd ever find the crystals. Ethan had connections and could go places the rest of us couldn't through his title. We needed him to spy on the Circle and remain in the Royal Society to obtain information. The Wolven Stone had been passed down through the monarchy. What if the other stones were in possession of the other highborn factions? We'd never get our hands on them without Ethan's help. Swear you won't turn Ethan in and agree that the White Rose no longer works for you. Otherwise, I'll blast this thing all over Dolinska, I snarled. And you'll be totally fucked. Gabby's lip curled. It looked like it took all she had to spit out. Fine. I won't blow Nowak's little secret so long as you keep quiet about mine. She waved a hand casually, like she couldn't give a damn. And I release you from your contract as the White Rose. You were a shitty vigilante anyway. You never could do what I asked. Stop the Phantom for good. Seems like he cares more about that mask than he does about you. My heart sank with her words. I'd always thought Gabby could no longer hurt me, but then she dug at the parts of me that were the softest all of which included Ethan. I turned my back on her. Not a smart thing to do, because I'm sure she was always looking for an opportunity to shove a knife in, but fuck her. As I hobbled out of the room, Gabby cried out, You're looking a little stiff there, Sosna. You and your mate have an argument? Gods, I couldn't stand her. That woman always found a way to break more pieces off of me. It felt like I was a fragile little doll when it came to my mate, easily shattered. I didn't want to be like that anymore. I desired to become iron, something so dangerous all they would fear me. I took a carriage back to the university. My eyes welled with tears and my heart grew heavy because I knew what had to be done even if it killed me to do it. As much as I hated to give an ultimatum, Ethan had to make a choice. The Phantom or me. I had a horrible knot in my gut that already knew what he was going to say. Whatever he decided, I resolved I had to be okay with it. I'd been battling for us, for our relationship, for ages. Now all the dark secrets and nastiness was in the light. I knew who Ethan was now at his core, and I wasn't sure if we could fix what had been broken. I was the world weaver. My people were depending on me. As Milana's champion, I was the only one who could save the Fae from a horrible fate. Ethan would not get in the way of that. I wouldn't let him. No relationship on Earth was more important than the lives of thousands. In this chess game of royals and betrayal, I had thought myself the queen. I was wrong. I was a pawn, easily sacrificed by those who moved the pieces around the board. I should have seen that from the beginning. 
But I was wiser now, and I wouldn't make that mistake again. Since I'd arrived at Arcania University, I'd given up my life to fight for Ethan. I'd sacrificed everything to chase after him and keep us together despite all the secrets we were hiding. I barely knew who I was anymore because of it. In the fight to love him, I lost myself and who I was in the process. I would not lose myself again. From this moment on, I fought for myself. Chapter 25 Ethan It seemed, no matter what we did, Gabby and Elijah were always five steps ahead. I paced angrily in the courtyard while the others watched me. Odette sat by the water and dipped her fingertips into the pool, transfixed by the movement. Delmare and Kiara had taken a seat on the stone bench, and Theo and Alexei were talking in soft tones in the corner, sending glances at me every so often. Stefan leaned against a pillar with his arms crossed, giving me the dirtiest look he ever could. I ignored him. I knew I'd screwed up tonight. He didn't need to rub it in. Where is she? I raged. She should be here by now. Calm yourself. You're rampaging around like a beast, Stefan said. He was quite fed up with my behavior. Can you blame me? I whirled on him. This night has been a disaster. You were out of control. Stefan pushed off the pillar and got in my face. I told you this would happen, and now Emma has suffered the consequences. You hurt her. Don't you think I know that? I want to die for what I did. How do we know you're not going to hurt her again? Delmare accused. Her fingers curled like she wanted to choke me out. Why can't you understand it was a case of mistaken identity? Do any of you ever think I'd lay a finger on Emma otherwise? I hissed at Delmare. Don't go after my mate. Stefan's voice was a threatening growl, and his body quaked as he threatened to change. Theo got between us and pushed us apart. I recognize both points of view, he said. Ethan thought he was protecting Emma by attacking the White Rose. He couldn't have known it was Emma the whole time. Theo shook his head. But, on the other hand, Ethan, you have a thirst for blood. No mercy was shown on this night from you. If you had hesitated, things would have turned out differently. And Arcania doesn't hesitate. That's how you end up dead, I said. We aren't monsters, Ethan. We're your friends, Alexei yelled. He rubbed his temples, like the high emotion in the area was giving him a headache. It was then Emma entered the clearing. Relief flowed through my veins, along with a gnarled pit of agony. I sensed whatever we had to talk about, it wouldn't be good. All eyes turned to her. Odette shook her head, as if she had to snap out of it and set her attention on us. Emma went to speak, but Kiara stopped her. Wait! Kiara stepped forward. She twirled her arm in the air, and thin bands of light pulsated through the courtyard, settling around us in a circle. An illusion charm, she explained. Anyone trying to eavesdrop will hear something else instead of what we're actually saying. That was a good idea. Campus closed in a week, as exams were already finished and most students had already gone home, but we couldn't take the chance of being overheard. Emma crossed her arms. Gabby's been dealt with. I showed her the video and told her if she doesn't keep quiet about Ethan being the Phantom, we'll send it to everyone. We should show it anyway. I deserve death. I've committed crimes, I argued. Let them execute me, so long as Gabby and Elijah are taken out of power. No, Emma said. We need to work together on finding the Crystals of Harmony. Shock and anger rose through me. She didn't want those two bastards to give up the crown? What madness is this? I asked. How can you agree to let them stay in power? We don't have a choice, Ethan. It's better for the Fae to live under a dictatorship than to go completely extinct, Emma said. That's where I disagree with you. Preserving freedom is more important than saving lives, I said. That's bullshit, Stefan snapped. That's not something you would say. That's something the Phantom's put in your head. The Phantom is me, I hissed. You could never understand. Alexei's eyes darted between us before his gaze landed on me, as if he was sensing something confusing and couldn't figure my emotions out. Emma narrowed her eyes. I know it's important to the Fae to live and die free, but they won't live at all if time runs out and the portal to Edmire is closed. 
I won't let centuries of Fey history come to an end because we were too busy with personal grudges. Gabby and Eli aren't a personal grudge, I said, even though I felt a twinge of a lie as I said it. They'll destroy Malovia. They're looking for the crystals too. We can't give them an opportunity to find them, and the monarchy is a distraction. Let them have the throne for now, Emma said. We'll fix it later, once we have the stones. We don't have a later, Emma. You don't understand what the consequences are of getting the wrong people in power, I said. Listen to me, Emma fumed. Milona wouldn't have appeared to all of us if I didn't need everyone's help here to find the stones. You were there, so that includes you. That means Malona thinks I need you. If you die or are imprisoned, you can't help us find the Crystals of Harmony. Then we really are dooming the Fae, because those stones will be lost forever. It's the will of the Goddess for you to help me. I couldn't care less about the will of the gods at that moment, but Kiara spoke up. Emma's right. The choices we have are obvious. It's clear if we stop Gabby and Elijah with the knowledge we gain tonight, we lose Ethan. Either we turn Gabby in and Ethan dies, or Gabby and Eli stay in power and Ethan stays to help us find the crystals. Then let me die. Don't you guys understand I'm ready to sacrifice myself for this? I snapped. But the rest of us aren't willing to sacrifice you, Alexei said viciously. We won't kill a friend no matter what's on the line. We're in this together. Ethan, as much as you don't want to admit it, you're a prince. That title is valuable. Emma pointed out. Your status can help us spy on the Circle and the other royals, as well as the rest of the people in power. If the remaining stones are with Highborn Fae, like the Wolven Stone was, we won't find them unless we have someone on the inside. That's you. She had made an excellent point, but I wasn't giving in. Use Stefan. He's Highborn. It's going to look very odd if I start getting involved in politics, Stefan said. You've always been concerned for your country so it doesn't appear strange if you keep tabs on things. The Circle knows I've never cared. It'll seem suspicious. You're acting like we don't have a choice, I argued. Delmare came forward. There is no choice to be made. The road ahead is the only path we have to take, she said. We've tried all semester to get these people off the throne, and nothing we've done has worked. We need something stronger than Gabby and her dark magic. If we have those crystals, nothing can stand in our way. We get the stones first, then use them to take Gabby and Elijah down. Exactly. I'm glad you see my point, Emma said. Are you all really agreeing with her? I raged. Stefan shrugged. She's the world weaver. What she says goes. He was trying to bait me. Emma's jaw worked. If you guys don't agree with me, let's call a vote, Emma said. Who thinks finding the stones should be our top priority? Emma raised her hand and everyone in the courtyard followed suit. I was the only one who didn't. Clearly, I was outvoted. I sighed. Fine. I suppose we focus on the crystals. For now. Theo cut to the middle. His tone was flat as he said, If we're going to do this, we need a real pact. I no longer want to be a part of this group if we're going to keep lying to each other. We need to be completely honest. And loyal, Kiara said. What happened tonight between Ethan and Emma can never happen again, between any of us. No more secrets. Emma met my eyes, and her own darted away quickly. I felt the pressure of shame close in on me, squeezing me tight. Stefan and Delmare shared a secret glance, as if she was asking him a question. Stefan nodded swiftly. It was then Delmare rose from her seat. There is a binding spell known by the dragon faction. Dragon warriors used to make it before battle, to vow they wouldn't retreat no matter how bad it seemed. It's called the Dragon Oath, she began. We can make such an oath to find the crystals. If we take this vow, we swear to be faithful to each other until our task is done, and we'll pay whatever price in order to complete it. As dragons, Stefan and I can bind the spell. What are the consequences if we break it? Alexei asked nervously. You can't break an oath like this, Stefan said. You're honor bound to it until you die. Even if you try to betray the people involved, you'll never escape your fate. It'll always come back to haunt you until you fulfill your word. No one said anything until Odette spoke up. I think we should do it, Odette said. The fate of the Fae is more important than all of our lives. 
no matter what sacrifices we have to make. Malona appeared to all of us. She wouldn't have done that if she didn't want us to help Emma. Everyone nodded. Delmare seemed reserved. It requires a dragon scale. Stefan shifted briefly. He reached out with his claws and pulled a thin black scale from his paw and handed it to Delmare before he shifted back. Delmare faced us. Emma, could you levitate it? Emma focused her magic on the scale. It rose into the middle and we formed a circle around it. Anyone who isn't willing to commit to this, back out now, Delmare said. This is pretty powerful magic. It's not something to mess around with. We do this, we keep the oath until we find the stones or we die. Those are the only two options. No one stepped away. Delmare added, This isn't like the pact we made last semester to take Gabby and Elijah down. This is a powerful oath of magic. Once we swear it, there's no going back. Just do it, Mare, Emma said. She wouldn't look at me. Delmare took a breath. Put your right hand on the scale, she said. Everyone reached out an arm, leaving enough room for each of us to put a few fingers on the smooth surface. Repeat after me, Delmare began. I bind myself to my companions, weaving our fates as one. Upon my life, I hereby swear to unite the crystals of harmony and reopen the portal to Edenmire, be it my life or death. I vow to remain loyal to this fellowship and faithful to my cause until my last breath has been taken or until the task is done. We all echoed her words, repeating them in unison as one collective. When the recitation was finished, Stefan began whispering some sort of spell. Red wisps emitted from the scale and wrapped around our arms. The cords around our limbs tightened as they bound us all as one, uniting us in our goal. The scale glowed ruby. Delmare reached out to take it from the air, pocketing it once again in her dress. It's done, she said. The intention has been set and the spell cannot be broken. I hope we made the right choice, Kiara said. Something was different now that the oath had been taken. I felt an itching along my skin that I couldn't quite satisfy. It was like my vow was calling out to me, demanding I begin the search for the next crystal at once. I could ignore the urge, but it would be in the back of my mind all the same. Theo glanced at Emma and I. He put a hand on the small of Odette's back. Come on, guys. Let's give them some space. Everyone obviously felt the unresolved tension between Emma and I, because our friends flooded out of the courtyard as quickly as their legs could carry them. When Emma and I were alone, we faced each other, and silence festered between us. You want to talk, I said. My words sounded like an accusation. We don't have a choice, do we? she asked. We need to discuss your actions. Emma, I will do whatever it takes to make it up to you. I know my actions were uncalled for, and yes, I deserve death for it. I don't expect your forgiveness, though I'm begging for it. My words were full of grief. They caused tears to rise to my eyes. I'm not talking about how you stabbed me, though, yeah, that's pretty messed up, Emma snapped. I'm talking about how you hid your secret identity. I'm talking about the Phantom. When she brought up the Phantom, my sorrow turned to defensiveness. She wanted to say I'd been hiding things. I wasn't the only one. You have no room to talk, White Rose, I said. You lied to me. You lied to me first, Emma shouted. Every falsehood I ever played out was to keep you safe. But what were your reasons for not telling me about the Phantom, huh? You knew we were true mates from the moment we met, and you told me we weren't. You messed with my feelings. I did that because the closer you got to the Phantom, the more you were in danger, I said. Look what happened tonight. You got too close, and he lashed out. You got hurt. You're acting like he's not you. Like he's a totally different entity, Emma screamed. He is different, but he's also me. Why can't you understand that? Emma's expression accused me of insanity. Regardless, I had to make a decision on false pretenses. I entered into this mating bond agreeing to be with you while not knowing who you really were. I held myself to this contract thinking you were someone else. How can I agree to marry you if I'm still not sure of who you are? You know everything about me now. Everything has come to light, I said. There's nothing left to hide. That's not the point. You were dishonest from the beginning. If I had known you were the Phantom... You're being a hypocrite, I spat. 
You were in love with the Phantom before you were in love with me. You told me you bonded with him months ago. I bonded with him, but I fell in love with you. There's a difference, Emma cried. How so? You were obsessed with the Phantom last semester. You adored him and had no interest in me, I said. My words were full of spite. It wasn't until after the contest when you finally began to love me. Because the veil had come off. I didn't know what I was getting into with the Phantom, Emma said slowly. I thought he was a superhero. She scoffed. Turns out, he's the villain. A part of me ignited, the dark part. The Phantom stirred within my chest and I growled. The Phantom is a tool I use to protect the city of Delinska. The Phantom sliced me open. Emma yanked up her shirt and I saw with bitter agony the matted scar there. That wasn't Eli or Gabby. That was you, Ethan. Do you realize what this is going to do to me? I can't go skating until this heals. Hell, this is where my needles go in. I'll have to do my infusion in my legs now, and you know that was something I wanted to avoid doing at all costs to protect my skating career. Oh, and by the way, I have to worry about this getting infected, which it probably will because I'm immunocompromised, so there might be more complications. If this thing doesn't put me in the hospital, I'll be damn lucky. I forced down the urge to vomit again and said, I'm sorry, Emma. I'm so, so sorry. I knew no apology would ever make it up. I could be Emma's slave for a thousand years and it wouldn't account for my actions. It's not just about me. You butchered those cultists. That woman was begging for mercy and you took her life without thinking, Emma said. That wasn't self-defense. It was murder. I was defending my country. Thousands more will die if I don't take the lives of a few, I stated. The Black Claw has to be dealt with. Molovia won't survive if the cult continues to exist. You're so caught up in this black and white thinking. Things aren't always what they seem, Emma insisted. How can I love someone who can kill so senselessly? How can I feel safe when you're capable of that? After what I saw tonight, I have trouble deciding if I'm in love with a sane person or a psychopath. You know I'd never hurt you. But you did, and you hurt other people, Emma said. Ethan, I'm scared of you, and I have a right to be. The Phantom is a terrifying monster. If he can do what he did to the White Rose, what can he do to other people? It gutted me to know she was terrified when she looked at my face. I didn't know how to fix that. I'm doing the right thing. The Phantom saves lives, I said. No, it's not a traditional method of justice, but sometimes vigilante justice is the only way to solve problems. Does it always have to end in death? She whispered. You once told me kings have to kill. Do you take that back now? But you're not a king. You never will be. You don't have that kind of authority to determine who lives and who dies. That belongs in the hands of the gods. I let out a cruel laugh. The gods? The gods didn't care when I lost my leg. The gods didn't care when my father died. The gods stood by when the black cult murdered those people tonight, and they would have killed more if we hadn't stopped them. The gods will do nothing, Emma. It is up to us to make our own way. It doesn't matter what the reasons. Evil is evil, she said forcefully, and she slapped a hand into her palm for emphasis. Whatever the Black Claw has done, you're becoming just like them by turning into a madman. I'm doing what I need to do for my country. Sometimes, sacrifices must be made. Emma gave me a resentful look, and her voice was heavy as she said, You're acting just like Eli. My tone became dark. What? You heard me she said with a rasping breath. You don't want Elijah off the throne for the good of the country. You want to get him off so you can get another shot at being king. All you care about is power. You get off on deciding other people's fates. It felt like she'd taken a sword and stabbed me through the heart, slowly and with malice. I couldn't believe the words she'd said. Did she really believe them? Was she right? Terror became bitterness within me and I let the root take hold and grow. If you think so poorly of me, why are you still with me? I asked coolly. What do you want to do next? Break our bond? Reject me as your mate? I don't know, Emma tore at her hair. I don't know what to do. I love you, Ethan, but I can't be bonded to the Phantom. I have to stand my ground on this. Both of us agree Malovia needs to be protected. We're merely divided on how to do it, I burst. The Phantom isn't the right way, 
Emma pleaded. We can find the stones. Then we can worry about Gabby and Elijah. I let out a disgusted noise. We're talking about fanatical nationalists, Emma. Look at history. Look at what happened with the great supernatural war. Do you want that to happen again? Because it will with them in charge, and then countless Fay will die. The supernatural world won't survive another catastrophe like that. The Phantom is trying to prevent that war from happening. Emma's voice rose in frustration. You're becoming a fanatical nationalist yourself. You're so concerned with trying to save your country, you don't realize your actions are going to ruin it. You're turning into a fascist. I despised that word, and that she'd accused me of it. I'd fought my whole life to stop racialists from taking over my home. I wouldn't be portrayed as becoming one myself. It seems you're asking me to choose, I said, and I crossed my arms. I am. Her voice didn't waver. Emma stood tall as she said, If you want to be with me, you have to put aside the phantom. You need to choose, Ethan, the phantom or me. I gave a huff. Are you willing to give up being the white rose? For you? Absolutely, Emma said. I don't even have to give it a second thought. I have no connection to her. The white rose is just a costume. She's not a person or a part of me. Her eyes hardened. But the phantom is a part of you. A piece I'm asking you to set free. Your choices and actions become different when you're the phantom versus when you're Prince Ethan. You're willing to do things you'd normally never consider. You become someone else when you put on that mask, and I don't like it. If you still want him in your life, then I can't be with you anymore. My heart grew cold. She was asking me to pick between her and my moral code, her and my country. How could she ask for such a sacrifice? The Phantom is the only one protecting Dolinska against the Black Claw. If I give up being the Phantom, I give up Malovia. Dolinska has all of us. With our friends, we can protect the country, even save it. Emma held her breath. But if you keep working as the Phantom, your attention is going to be divided, and our chances of finding the crystals become even less than what they already are. There are eight of us. Surely you don't need my help, I said sourly. We're all in this together. We took an oath, Emma said. Unifying as one is the only way to stop what's coming, and it's never going to work if you want to keep playing your vigilante sideshow. Prince Ethan died with his father, I growled. You want me to stop being the Phantom? I can't do that. I am the Phantom now. That's not true. You're kind. You're decent and loving. Those are all things the Phantom could never be, she pleaded. I know you think what you're doing is some sort of noble sacrifice, but what's the point of saving Malovia if you have to lose your soul to do it? She was close to tears. I didn't realize how badly she wanted me to let this go until now. She was begging me to leave the Phantom behind and choose her. I'd never admit this out loud, but the Phantom is the only connection I had left to my father. I'd become a vigilante in his name and swore to continue the work he didn't get to finish. Though he died nearly a year ago, I wasn't ready to give my father up. Not even for Emma's sake. I hardened my words. If this is the way things are going to be, then I don't want any part of it. Break up with me, if you like, but I'm not going to stop being the Phantom. It was then Emma's resolve broke. Her face fell. A few tears slipped out of her eyes, and her lip quivered. She couldn't believe the choice I'd made. I could hardly believe it myself. There was a time I'd give up anything for Emma if she asked. I wouldn't think twice. Yet there were other people involved. This wasn't about us anymore. Fine. We're done. Emma wiped at her face. She gave a sniff before she added, I guess that says a lot about your mate, when you're willing to make a sacrifice for him, and he can't do the same in return. Her words stung me, surging to my core. My temper rose and my tone became nasty. And how do I know you weren't working with Gabby all along, huh? I shot the words at her, to drown out the sound of my own heart breaking. You gave Gabby that necklace to plant in our tent to get us kicked out of the contest. You've been playing their side all along. I regretted what I said the moment my words stabbed her. Emma's eyes widened in disbelief. She put a hand over her mouth to suppress a sob as she shook her head and turned away from me. You know what, Phantom? Find me when Ethan comes back. 
She ran out of the courtyard. I almost reached a hand out to grab her shoulder, to tell her to stay, to beg her forgiveness and take back everything I'd said. But I didn't. I let her go. When she'd vanished from my eyesight, I fell to my knees. I knelt on the ground on all fours, putting my head to the grassy area beside the pool to sob. I hadn't let tears fall for a very long time, but they came, pouring onto the earth as I wept in agony at the separation between me and my mate. I knew pain. I had befriended it over the years of my life, but this pain was worse than any I'd ever experienced, even worse than the death of my father. I thought this pain would be worth it, to protect my countrymen and defend Malovia, but right now, that sacrifice seemed weak in the ever-encompassing loss that was the absence of Emma's love. I knew what I'd said wasn't true. Emma had never been playing Gabby's side. I said those things out of anger because she'd chosen to leave me. I'd done so much damage tonight, and not just with my blade. There were broken pieces between Emma and I that I could never repair. My darker impulses had taken over and chased away the woman I loved. Perhaps there was still a chance. We'd broken up, but she hadn't rejected my bond. Not yet. Would she? But if she still made the same ultimatum, still held to her word she could not love the Phantom, was there even hope? If she didn't love all of me, what kind of love would that be? Emma couldn't be with the Phantom, but I could not give him up. There had to be some middle ground we could take, so neither of us would give up and walk away. Maybe the Phantom could change and become a better man. What if there was a way to tame the beast inside, a way to control the monster that beat within my heart? The Phantom stirred. My wolf growled, as if they were opposing enemies. For the first time, my soul felt torn instead of whole. What's the point of saving Malovia if you have to lose your soul to do it? This is what my country's salvation cost. It cost me my soul's desire. It cost me Emma. No. This couldn't be the end. There had to be another way. I shakily rose to stand. I couldn't be seen like this. If I had to fall apart, it needed to be in private, away from where my enemies could witness my fall. I dared not return to the dormitories. Emma was there, and to be close to her now would feel like absolute hell. The palace wasn't an option either. I had no desire to speak with those who wanted to know where I'd been and had no energy besides. A thought came to me. The cabin on campus grounds. The one where Emma and I had shared that precious moment last semester. I could remain there for the night and duck out before morning. It would be painful to stay there, as the cabin was filled with memories of the woman I loved, the woman I'd lost, had chosen to lose. But I was certain no one would bother me there, and I wanted to be alone. I changed into a woven and ran along the campus walls until I broke out into the main grounds. When I reached the cabin, it was thankfully dark. I entered in and found it empty. There was a strange smell in the air, like a shifter had been here the night before, but they were long gone now. I locked the door behind me and lit a singular log in the fireplace before I sat on the couch, my head cradled in my hands. She was gone. I couldn't believe she was gone. I didn't know if I'd ever see her again. Not in a million years did I ever think this situation would come about. I thought Emma and I would be together forever. That was a foolish notion. One made by a boy and not a man. Love sometimes didn't last forever. My insides stirred violently and turned cold as I thought of the repercussions. What if she broke our bond and ruined the magic between us by performing the separation ceremony? What would I do then? I'd be ruined. I was already ruined. Shifters were helpless without their mates. They were aimless, poor creatures, lost in a storm without any direction, vacant of a northern star to guide them on. It felt like I was a wolf on a mountain that never ceased, an endless night around me, devoid of moonlight and stars. Loneliness clawed at my gut like hunger, threatening starvation, but never actually succumbing. Emma had destroyed me, but it was I who had made the final choice, the one who delivered the blow, and by the gods, I didn't know if I could ever forgive myself for that. I got up from my seat 
and began to pace. This was all my fault. Yet I'd been backed into a corner by the ultimatum she'd given. I severely doubted I'd made the right choice. But why did there have to be a choice at all? Why couldn't she accept me for who I was? Because she doesn't understand what we have. A sinister voice hissed in my head. I jerked backward, startled. That voice had been as clear, like there was a creature speaking telepathically to me. I knew one thing. It wasn't my own. Who's here? I demanded. Show yourself. I've been here for a long time, Ethan. I thought I'd introduce myself, the voice responded. I turned around. I fell backwards as I saw my own reflection in the mirror on the wall. But that person wasn't me. He looked like me, save for the fact he had violent red eyes. Though I was on the floor, my reflection remained standing, leaning against the side of the mirror with his arms crossed. He smiled at me and revealed pointed teeth. There. It's about time we met, my reflection purred. I've been waiting for a chance to talk to you for ages. Who the fuck are you? I breathed, backing up. I wanted to attack it, but how could I? It was just a figure in the mirror. I'm you, Ethan. Or at least, I am now. My reflection chuckled. I watched my own shoulders shake as he broke down into delirious laughter. I swallowed and forced myself to my feet though it felt like the world was caving out from under me. I don't understand. I've been with you for almost a year now. Ever since your father killed my body, my spirit left my earthly form and latched onto the nearest soul that invited me in. Hated memories of that cursed day in the forest rushed by. Awful pain. The king hanging from a root torn from the forest floor. The sight of my bloody leg as it was ripped away from me. You're the Lashane, I said thickly as I pieced it together. You're the monster that killed my father and took my leg. I was once the Lashane, but now I think you call me something different. The Phantom. The Lashane flashed out his forked tongue. I like it. A chilling horror spread throughout my bloodstream. How twisted my rage and emotions had become. The bloodlust I felt every time I put on that mask. The hatred I felt pounding through me for my enemies and the needless wanting to see them dead. I'd changed since my father died, and it hadn't been in a good way. I'd mistaken it for grief. Thought it was motivated by vengeance and a sense of perverted justice. But it was so much worse. I'd been possessed by a forest demon. The Lashane let out another low chuckle. My chest rose and fell as I exclaimed, I didn't invite you in. There was no contract. Fey magic is our intention. The rules are the same for you as any other, the Lashane replied. You wanted to save your people at any cost. You invited me in as your father died, and you signed a contract when you agreed to become the Phantom. You desired a way to rescue Malovia, and I gave it to you. I own you now. I don't agree to this. I cast you out. But you did agree. You told your mate you wouldn't give me up. You chose me over your bond to her. That's binding magic. The Lashane smoothed back his, mine, our hair. Like it or not, we're stuck together now. What a sick mess I'd made of things. This was far worse than I'd ever expected. The signs were there, and I should have seen them. How could I have been so blind? Still, I wasn't going to let this demon use me like a doll. I had to fight back. What do you want from me? Patience. All will come in due time. Like hell, I ground out through clenched teeth. You made me into a monster. You made me kill people, made me get lost in my own bloodlust. You made me hurt Emma. I made you do none of those things. I only provided the opportunity, the Lashane replied. I gave suggestions, and you acted upon them. Those were all your choices, Prince of the Arcania. 
I cannot force you to do anything. I wanted to tell myself that it was a lie. The Lashane was a demon straight from the underworld. Why would he speak the truth? And yet, I'd be telling myself falsehoods if I believed that. The Phantom had whispered ideas in my ear, but I didn't have to listen to them or even respond. I could have chosen a different path. I could have ceased to act. But I didn't. I'd longed to rule Malovia at any price, and that kind of desperation had opened me up and left me vulnerable. I had never hesitated when the Phantom thought of something. I always followed whatever he offered. The Lashane might be a demon, but it was I who was the monster. You won't keep me for long, I growled. I'll find a way to get you out of my soul. Don't be getting too comfortable. The Lashane chuckled. You can try to get rid of me, but you will find I am very difficult to persuade to leave. I like this new life, and sooner or later it will be mine. Then Prince Ethan will be gone forever, and the Phantom will be all that remains. I screamed aloud and punched the mirror. It shattered into pieces, taking away my reflection. The glass scattered on the floor and my hands spurted blood, but I didn't care. The pain of glass embedded in my knuckles was nothing compared to the horror pounding through my heart. The Lashane was gone from my sight, but I knew he was still lurking around. I could feel him inside, his laughter ringing in my head as shadows reflected from the flames and onto the walls, surrounding me like the pits of hell. Blood dripped from my fingers to the floor as I thought of my options. Demon possession wasn't shit to joke about. If I didn't get this demon out of me, and soon, he'd take over. The Lashane would have full control over my body forever, and there wasn't anything I could do to stop him. Unless this spirit could be exercised or destroyed somehow, I was in a hell of a lot of trouble. This situation was very, very dire. I hated myself as I realized what I had done. I'd put my bond with Emma in jeopardy, and for what? Revenge? A way to get back at Gabby and Elijah? Now there was a wedge between us, and this demon was determined to make that canyon as wide as it could be. Our bond was the one thing that could still save me. There was magic there that resisted the demon's hold on me, probably why he hadn't made his appearance until now. Emma's love had forced him to remain at a distance. The absence of that affection gave him more than enough room now to step in and I'd carved that hole myself. What Emma and I had was secure, but I'd smashed it to pieces. We could get it back, but that decision was solely up to Emma. The magic that remained in our bond could be my last hope, unless Emma wanted nothing more to do with me. Gods, I was so fucked. Time seemed to shorten as my options became limited. There was a bigger war than the one coming, a war within my spirit. The Phantom, or Prince Ethan, at some point, one would take over, and I'd cease to be the other, becoming enveloped by whoever gained victory. Who was I? A prince of justice, or a prisoner of my own darkness? I didn't know. But whoever I was, deep down, I knew at the same time, neither could fully emerge. I couldn't go back to my righteous past, or continue on in my dark present. I had to become someone new. Prince Ethan wasn't strong enough to cast out this demon. He was the one who'd called it upon himself in the first place. If I was going to survive this, I had no choice but to be reborn and rise from the ashes of my mistakes. Whoever this new man was, I had to find him. Not just to save Malovia, but to save my soul. And by the gods... I was going to get Emma back. The End The End Emma is in a fight to save Ethan's soul in the Alicorn Court, University of Sorcery, Book 3. This has been The Dragon Oath, Hidden Legends, University of Sorcery, Book 2. Written by Megan Linsky. Narrated by Liana Walsh and Max Pinkins. Copyright 2019 by Megan Linsky. Audio copyright 2020 and 2023 by Megan Linsky.